Okay. Kelsey, are we ready to begin? Ready on my end, Alex, are you set up? Yes. Okay. I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of November 30th, 2021. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Present. Councilmember Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. Okay, I'd like to, you to join me for the second time today in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, to republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. May I have um, an approval of the agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Bruce has got his hand up, Paul. Oh, Bruce, sorry. I'm sorry. Bruce? That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I wanted to make a motion with respect to the approval of the agenda. So now that it's been moved, maybe they'll take it as a friendly amendment. Um, I'd like to put SCE after public comment and also permit members of the public to ask questions of the SCE representative. Um, right now, they go first, and there's no opportunity for anyone to present their grievances or their questions. I understand this is a very unusual request, but it's a very unusual situation. They shut the power off in our city during Thanksgiving, a holiday where more people spend the meal with their family than any other holiday. And um, a lot of people lost food in addition to losing their um, ability to celebrate the holiday. And I just think they should, the residents should have an opportunity to speak their piece before SCE responds, ask whatever questions they have. And to the extent that there's follow-up after SCE presents, I think the resident should be given an opportunity to follow up with some questions as well. So that's my request as a friendly amendment. Shouldn't um, we find out if the representative, you know, how, I, don't, I don't know if they're planning on that or, you know, their time involved. So might want to check on that. Are Rochelle and Rudy available? I see Rudy. Yes, we are. Uh, would you be, uh, would you wait or would you, uh, if you do go first, would you commit to waiting around to be able to respond to questions? Um, yes, we would be able to, um, representatives from Edison will be around to, you know, answer some questions following our remarks. It just might help if we were um, able to present some information about the event um, to help you know, probably inform some of the comments and then we can, we're happy to take questions as well. Well, if, as long as you're willing to commit to staying around to comment to the members of the public, I, I think having you go first makes sense. Yes, oh. sir. Okay, I, Paul, I have my hand up. I'm sorry, Karen, I apologize. Um, I, I think that makes more sense to hear Edison's uh, address to us first. Um, I assumed we would have uh, public comments on, on uh, items not in the agenda since this is listed as a ceremonial presentation. 
but I, I think as well, we ought to be taking public comments uh, on Edison uh, events of the last week. Okay. Bruce, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting they speak first and then they're going to stick around and respond to questions. So if that meets with your approval, so I'd like to. Was, not what I was hoping for, but I can count, as you say, from time to time. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is, is think about whether we, we want to uh, have the city council comments at the end the, at the with the meetings and attendance reports and inquiries at the end of the meeting tonight in the interest of getting through the meteor items first. Does anybody think that they want to? I'll make that a motion. Is anyone willing to second it? I'll second, second it. it. Okay, we got a second. Do I need to have a vote, Kelsey? Well, the maker and the seconder of the previous motion, I believe, just accepted your friendly amendment to hear item, I'm sorry, was it 2C at the end of the agenda? Yes. So with that, uh, you could vote on the amended motion. Okay. All right. Uh, may, will you take the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. I understand our next, our first presentation is from Jeannie O'Donnell from the County of Los Angeles. Mayor Grisanti, yes. if I could give a brief report on the posting of the agenda before that, the agenda for this meeting was properly posted on November 24th, 2021. Thank you. Thank you once again for keeping me on the straight and narrow. May, uh, and was the agenda properly posted? Yes. Yes, on November 24th, 2021. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, item 1A is a report on the NOAA radio fire alert program from uh, Ms. O'Donnell of the County of Los Angeles. Is she available? Kelsey, do you know what name she's under? I don't see her. Susan may be able to help us. Yeah, I'm wondering if she's Girl Scout leader. <laughs> Jeannie, maybe put in the comments if you're out there what's your name. We don't have chat on. Let's try a muting uh, Girl Scout leader and see if that's the right one. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> I apologize. It was my I... guess. You are a true Girl Scout leader, so it had to be you. <laughs> well, what can I say? They, they, they paid for this. Um, but uh, I'm going to apologize for that. I, I, uh, I'm using a computer and I can't turn that off right now. Okay. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Thank council members. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm here to report on our new capability for non-weather emergency messages. So this is a new capability um, that we've just added to our arsenal of alert and warning programs. It joins the EAS system, the wireless alert system, mass notification, which for Los Angeles County is Alert LA County, our various websites, social media, and field notifications. So this basically gives us access to using the NOAA National Weather Service broadcast system to send out alert messages to weather radios in Los Angeles County. This is a process that has been used other places, but it's fairly new. I think we're the only the second jurisdiction in California to enable this. And we've tested it. Uh, we haven't used it quite yet, but we have been testing it to make sure that it works. And basically what happens is we go into our normal system, which is called IPAWS, how we, this is how we access the alert and alert notification systems. We put in our system, we notify the uh, National Weather Service, and then they will broadcast it on one of the five frequencies that Los Angeles County has dedicated for this purpose. So those of you who kind of remember the old days, this is the same system that would have marine alerts, so it would have fog alerts, it would have hurricane, tornado alerts. This is the same system used nationally. 
um, all over the country. There is a system now or a technology that the system uses that's called specific area message encoding. And if you have a radio, a weather radio that has that in it, you can program certain alerts to, to go off on your, on your unit. And so that can be any, you can turn off and you can turn on any of the alerts uh, that, that are in that list and the list of alerts possible. I mean, including icebergs and avalanches um, is something like, you know, 80 different types of alerts that you can turn on and turn off so that you can get that information when you need it. The same, which is the uh, specific area message encoding technology, it makes the technology consistent from NOAA radio to your unit. So this would be a system where if you were to go out today, go on to your favorite uh, purchasing uh, location and buy one of these radios, you could then tell it which broadcast frequency you would like to receive, and you can tell it which notifications you would like to receive. Some of them you're not able to turn off, but many of them you, you do have that option. So we are also working on a number of uh, radios that we are purchasing for residents, especially in the high hazard areas and in areas where communications are compromised by the terrain. And those we do have plans to distribute as needed. We're, we're not, we can't buy one for everyone in the county, uh, but certainly if somebody were to say that they could not get one for themselves, then we will be distributing these radios. We expect at this point that the distribution will begin somewhere in January, possibly February, but the capability for the system exists right now. And should we need to use it, it could be used tonight. Press with fingers, knock wood. We don't want to use it. But nonetheless, um, that's what the system is. It does have a bit of a uh, coverage issue, and that is we only have five broadcast frequencies for Los Angeles County, and the maps on this are pretty wide. There, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, my friends in Topanga Canyon tell me that they can easily receive three of those frequencies from where they are, and when National Weather Service puts it out on their system, it would very likely go to more than just one specific area. So this isn't like the wireless emergency alert system where you can bind it by, by cell towers or the alert systems that you use for your mass notifications. And I know Malibu has a really good system. I know you use Everbridge there. So it has definitely different capabilities. This is really a, I like to call it a personal siren project. One of the problems with sirens is they're very complex. They take a lot of study. They have to be placed just right. And even having said that, if you're inside of a building with double pane windows, you could still never hear that alert. The advantage is bringing these radios into your home. You can set it up so that you can hear it. They're portable. I and mean, there's a, a lot of these radios out there. They have a lot of capability depending on what model and how fancy you want to get. So that is uh, the basic um, access issue. This is something that anyone who has the capability to use iPods can set up for their own use. Uh, obviously, we were we set it up for county authorizations, but that can also work for other jurisdictions that have smaller areas. So, having said that, I just want to let you know this is this is going on. Um, we do think that it will work. Uh, we are requesting that things like extenders, we might need some antennas to extend a few places in really hard to reach areas. You know the terrain in your area. It can be quite challenging to receive uh, broadcast and, and cell reception. Uh, so we are working on that. And we are also getting a number of adaptive devices that can allow for light strobes and pillow shaking. So this would be for somebody with disabilities who wouldn't be able to hear an audio alert. So we do have a limited number of those as well that we are going to be distributing as they become available. And that is the, my summary. If you have any questions about how this program works, I'd be happy to address them. Okay, we have two raised hands. Bruce, you're first, followed by Susan Duenas. So this is a question for you, Paul. Um, we, we all received a long list of questions from Hans who understands this stuff better than any of us do. Um, would it be okay to let him have some time to ask whatever questions he feels would be beneficial to the public to have the answers? 
I think it probably would, and I bet you Susan's hand is raised for that very purpose. But Hans, if you're in the audience, Susan, Actually, was I correct? Uh, no. What I, I wanted to point out is that um, Jeannie has provided a informational flyer to me that includes the maps for the different transmitter sites. And we'll be posting it on our website for anybody who would like to see it. So we'll try and get that posted before the end of the week. Okay. Uh, is Hans still in the meeting? We're checking, but I don't see him in the meeting yet. Okay. In the meantime, Steve, do you have a question? Yes. You know, one of the concerns that, that was raised in the prior meeting regarding using this system is that, well, let me go back and ask this question. What, if a fire starts in Malibu, okay, like the ones we've had or the fire is burning, how soon can that information get to whoever it's going to get to so they can send the message out on, on the, the NOAA system? I mean, how does that work? The people who have access to the system are anybody in our county who has access to IPAWS, which is kind of the umbrella notification system. That includes the sheriff's department and the fire department, as well as the Office of Emergency Management. Okay, and so actually, they, not that it, I mean, this is kind of outside those parameters, but also the director, the um, public health director. Okay, so they can initiate the, the, the message coming out over the radio. Yes, we, <laughs> we would come in. We do have a 24-7 duty officer that would be, watching it and making sure that it all happens. Um, but the Sheriff's Department and the Fire Department have full access to that system. Cool. Okay, thank you. All right. Has Hans returned to the air? No, Bruce? we still don't have anyone in the meeting under his name. Okay, Bruce, do you want to start the questioning? Sure. I'll, I'll, well, I just have one question, but first of all, I want to say this is a great development. I'm really pleased to hear about this. Um, hope it actually works. The the only question that Hans asked that, that that I understood in terms of not technical is he was saying that this is like a, that there's a legal problem with this system that um, the sheriff's department has exclusive jurisdiction over it and the county doesn't. And I don't know whether he's right or wrong or whether that matters, but I don't know if maybe you could address that. No, I think that can that question could be nuanced a few different ways. Uh, within the county system, we're the ones who have access to it right now, but that doesn't that, that doesn't mean that you can't that anybody who has the capability to use this system. Not everybody, not all cities have this use a, a big system. Not all cities um, use iPods. Some of them use our system, for example. But for those that do, this is now a capability that you can add into your arsenal. So it's available. Now that we have it up and working, it's available to anybody who otherwise has authorization to use these mass notification systems. Okay. And I guess one other question I have is um, you, you mentioned a couple of times cell. Uh, after when we had the power failure a couple of days ago, or not the power failure, the power shutoff, um, cell service went down. I take it this, this is something that that will work, notwithstanding the fact that the cell towers aren't working. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, and thank you for bringing that up, because I think I just kind of skipped over my note as I was uh, trying to list it out. Um, these will have battery, they have battery backups. So the idea is the batteries in there, you use your normal power ACDC for the just normal days. But now you have 72 hours worth of battery backup. And assuming you have another set of batteries or can get another set of batteries, it can extend even beyond that. So, yes, it's one of the criteria that we put in um, to the bid because we wanted to make sure that in a power outage that you didn't lose all ability to be alerted. And that's it just it takes us off of the same uh, infrastructure that we use for everything else. Everything else is dependent on telecom. This one is actually just radio dependent, and it can work on a battery. Thank you. I see Susan's hand, and then Steve's. I think one of the questions Hans had, and I think it's a good one, and I'd be curious, is the NOAA transmitter at Point Doom, <laughs> does it have battery, does it have a backup 
power system or are there plans to give it sufficient backup power? I'd have to take that question back to to uh, National Weather Service and find out. Okay. Um, I, you know, it's a fairly robust system that's kind of like been in effect for 100 years. So I, I don't know what's there, but I presume it's fairly robust. But I will make a note and we'll get back to you with an answer on that. Okay, and then just one other quick question. Is there a, a way that we could test the system? Well, we've already tested it several times. Um, the Actually, we tested it before we did the Topanga drill. And um, we did it, you know, we had the Malibu one right after that. So we've tested it several times. And the thing about this is once you put that out there, uh, for those of you who are familiar with how this works, it's a, it's a national platform. So once you put your alert out there, everybody basically in the nation who monitors can see that you put out an alert. So it's really important to make sure that you say this is a test, we're only testing capability, that type of thing. Um, but if you were to, to authorize and, and come up as an authorized user, which I don't see why you wouldn't be able to, then you could do it at that point to test your access and to make sure that your connection works to the overall uh, capability. So that leads to one more question. Are you saying that we could have direct access to this through our iPods account? I don't know what your iPods account allows. And, and I had this, I actually had this discussion with one of my colleagues in preparation for speaking to you tonight. Um, and, and the answer is for us, it's a check mark and it's a toggled on capability. Our understanding is it can be a toggled on capability for others. Um, okay. but we, you would be, if you were to move on it tomorrow, you would be the first person in LA County other than the county to, to, to fold this into your overall strategic approach to emergency communications. But as is, but right now today we would just contact County OEM to yeah, get this. Yeah, uh, honestly, we would through fire and and law. That's how that's how we would tap into it. You wouldn't. Okay. I mean, I would expect you and I would have a phone call at one point. We typically do, but okay. uh, but the it wouldn't even require me to be awake. This is going to go right from our public safety officials right to the system, and um, and we're already training and and have a guide set up for this. I see Steve Uring's hand is up, and I just saw Hans is in the in the room. Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much for doing this presentation today. This is this was very informative. Uh, I I assume you're doing this because Malibu is going to be included in whatever rollout or testing or radios you're going to try and place out there. So that it, it, just keep us involved in this. This sounds like a very useful tool for us here in Malibu. Uh, like you said, I think having radios in the house is a much more effective communication tool than, you know, hoping a siren is going to work. So uh, as you as you roll this thing out and do enhancements to it, just make sure someone from Malibu is on your radar screen and you're keeping them abreast of that. But thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're very, I mean, I'm not going to. I'm not going to even pretend to, you know, be modest. We're excited about this. This is a really great capability that we just think is really going to enhance public safety, in, especially in the Santa Monica Mountains. So, um, well, the point well taken. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bruce? Well, I can, I can defer to Hans and then say what I was going to say afterwards. Hans, would you like to ask uh, some questions? Yes, Mayor Grisanti, and I truly apologize. I've been unable to get into the Zoom session for some reason here. Um, there, I have some real concerns about this in terms of operations. Uh, the, the, the National Weather Service radio tower in Malibu has been out for two weeks this month. It was transmitting silence, and it does not, in fact, have emergency power. There is no generator. There is no battery. It, it does not have that. Further, I'm curious, the, the county doesn't know that. So I'd like to ask the county, assuming that they do put an emergency power at Point Doom for this transmitter, how are you going to get the signal from the county to that site if the internet's down because the power goes out? The the connection that that we besides using iPods, which is you know the the way that we would authorize it, we would actually be talking directly to staff. At, Na at National Weather Service, I can't speak to the outage. Um, this isn't our equipment. Um, this is this is just trying to layer on additional capability. And we, um, you know, it, it, that 
I can, we can go back and we can check on some of the answers for these, but these are really technical questions having to do with their operations. I know on right. our side of it, we have lots of ways to access um, and we have emergency communicate, I mean, protocols that we use to contact the proper people. So, right, right. But when you say they use IPAWS, IPAWS is a, a computer, an internet based communication system. If that radio tower doesn't have access to the internet, it doesn't work. So the, the question would be, if the National Weather Service gets your alert and you want to set off the tower in Malibu and the power has gone out in Malibu so that the Internet is not functioning in Malibu, how does that signal get to your tower here in Malibu? I'll have to defer to the National Weather Service to answer that question. Okay. Then the next questions I have are, I have 20 years experience running radio stations and dealing with emergency activation system plans. The, the Cal OES plan hasn't been updated in more than 20 years, despite begging from the California Broadcasters Association to update it. It's completely out of date, but it has nothing in it about you, about bypassing the sheriff's office or, or doing what you're talking about. It, it's not in the state plan. It's not in the local plan. And the FCC does not allow the use of EAS tones unless it's part of the plan. Have you talked to the FCC about this at all? We've been talking pretty extensively with the folks at, at uh, Cal OES. Um, the, a lot of this has been changing a lot. The, the fires in the last few years have motivated everyone to look for additional alert uh, notifications. I don't know if they have a temporary plan that allows it. I do know that Sonoma County is using this and Marin County is using this. And a lot of it was instigated very quickly because of the perception of high need. The state is well aware we're doing this and has participated in some of the calls that we've had and they are, they're our connection to the federal agencies. So as, as I understand it, this is not, there's no blockage to this. We've had approval from NOAA, from MWS and from Cal OES um, and everybody has endorsed the use of this. As to the updated plan, I'm, I'm going to just take a stab in the dark and say that that's a work in progress because so much of this technology has changed in the last, it, my goodness, even the last two years, even the well, how, it, yeah, even how yeah. iPods is implemented has changed um, a lot. Well, yeah, it's it's been a work in progress since the Santa Rosa fire when the EAS system failed miserably. Right. And that was, that was five years ago. And let me tell you, I'm on the California Broadcasters Association committee on this. There has been no progress from Sacramento on changing that plan whatsoever. So what, what's happening in Sonoma, in Sonoma County is that they're simply ignoring the state and the FCC regulations, which is fine. I'm all for that. Appropriate technology, yay. But here's the problem. If you guys start using EAS tones outside of the state's plan, it can have really serious consequences because if – the point doom transmitter, for example, transmits an EAS plan using Los Angeles County codes that will be picked up by radio stations in Western LA County, and they will interrupt their programming. They're required to by the FCC. I, I don't think you've talked to the FCC about this. And if you did, I think they would raise these problems. Now, I, as a federally licensed radio station at, at KBUU, we are required to follow the FCC plan. If you guys set off on your own, a bypassing the state OES office and setting off an OES plan for Malibu only, it will be picked up and retransmitted by KBUU, which puts KBUU in violation of FCC regulations. Now I'll deal with that. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that this seems to be, to this observer, a very honest and heartfelt program to try to get these alerts out, but you haven't done the homework. And the FCC and the Los Angeles County broadcasters who run the local Los Angeles EAS plan and the California Broadcasters Association who run the statewide plan are completely unaware of what you're doing. And, and I'm, I'm caught in the middle here. I'm, I'm seriously concerned that you're going to cause some real major problems. And I'm, I'm most concerned about the fact that you don't even know if the National Weather Service transmitter at Point Doom has electricity or not when the power goes out. And the fact of the matter is they do not have a generator and they don't have panels, solar panels. So the answer to that is no, they don't. 
and there's also no way you will get an internet signal into that transmitter to set it off if the power goes out in Malibu. It's not set up for that. So you're working in the right direction, and I applaud you for that. But I think this is way, way, way premature to say that you're ready to, to roll this out. When, when a PSPS comes up and a fire breaks out in Malibu, the National Weather System radio on Point Doom is going to be dead. It will not be transmitting, and it will be useless. So what we need to do is work together and come up with solutions to all this. Uh, using the NWS radio like you proposed is a terrific idea. Let's get it emergency power. Let's get it part of the statewide OES plan. But you're a long way from that. Thank you so much. And, and we'll, I'll definitely, you know, take this back and we'll run it around. We've, we've run it around a few times and haven't had that kind of feedback. The emergency alert system is not the same as the non-weather emergency messages that we're talking about. It is a separate system. Um, well, yes, so but, 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 I understand what you're saying, but you're using the same EAS technology and you're using a system that has been to this up to this point exclusively used by the EAS system. You're going to be using tones. And once you put tones on the air, you're dealing with the FCC and other radio stations like KBUU and the cable system. That's a whole other issue. The Malibu cable system listens to the National Weather Service. It will put out, if you activate Point Doom, it's supposed to activate also, which will set off activations in the Conejo Valley or, or elsewhere, wherever Charter or Fios operate. I don't so, think you've thought, sure. I don't think you've thought this through. You bring up some good points and perhaps we, we can um, meet at another time with Gene and Donald and you know, other staff from OEM and see if we can work through some of these issues. Agreed. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Hans. Steve, I saw your hand raised earlier. Uh, no, I was going to make a recommendation along the same lines as uh, as Ms. Duenas. Um, so we could certainly uh, appreciate all the input uh, and excellent questions, and, and we can certainly work on these and get this back to council. So thank you very much. Okay. Bruce? It's the quick So I'm a little confused. Is this up and running now, or it's just been tested and it's it's capable of coming up sometime in the near future? The capability exists right now. So, so if, if, if we had... An event tomorrow, we could get this, this, this could be utilized, assuming people had radios to receive? Assuming that people had radios, and obviously we have a few things to uh, double check now, uh, but yes, that is, that is true. It is up and operational now. Okay, so, so this, this may sound like the same question, but assuming that we had a problem tomorrow, would we, would this be used? Not, not just could it be used, I mean, would, would, it, would it be used tomorrow if necessary? Yes, I mean before before I came on this call, I checked with my colleagues, okay. and yeah, we would use it. We would use it right away. Some so, people already have these radios, and others I've been waiting for it to come along. So, right. uh, so but the, we're trying to jump start with the radios themselves. That that's great. So, what do we need to inform our residents about in terms of what they can do if they want to jump on this and get a radio, so that if there's a problem and this is used, they'll get the notification. I mean, what, is this written somewhere? Is there a, yes. a website they can go to? What, yes, what can we get to the residents so that they know what they can do to get to get access to this? So we provided a sheet to Susan for posting on your website that shows what the radio needs to have. Uh, it's, it's not very complicated. It's your basic NOAA radio with the same technology, the specific area messaging technology. And we did talk about what you need uh, in that fact sheet, and that is available to you now. Great. And what, what are the, what's the approximate cost of the radio? They range. Uh, how complicated do you want to get? $30 is probably on the low end. Um, and if you want to get really, really super duper fancy, you can get up to $200. Great. Okay, thanks. This is, this is I, I, I can understand your excitement. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's another tool in the toolbox, as we like to say. Well, it sounds like it's a hammer. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Steve. Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Jeannie, for coming on with us. And thank you, Hans. For... Thank you for having me. And we'll follow up with Susan and get Hans's answers. All okay. right. Thank you very much. Uh, that takes us to item 1B, which is a school district separation update. Do we have someone available to give us a report? Yeah, Paul, Mikey and I are going to give that as Christine Wood is not able to be here this evening. Um, so I will try to move through this quickly. Um, 
the city had its actual, uh, as opposed to the two preliminary hearings uh, with the Laco County Committee on Wednesday, November 10th. And first of all, I wanna thank everybody who logged in and participated in that uh, hearing. The committee did not make any findings uh, at that date. They did not uh, give us a date for when they will. So kind of standard operating procedure there. We are hoping it's going to be not later than March. Uh, and I think we have every reason to believe that uh, for the next time this will be agendized. Um, I also want to thank everybody who has been working on this uh, process to date. We had a four hour meeting on a Saturday, uh, November 20th. We had about 35 community members who were asked to participate for their uh, representation of the spectrum of the demographic with the schools. Uh, and I also want to thank people who participated in some cases, the same people, in some cases, others with the visioning process. Uh, that the city has been going through. Uh, and I wanna thank the 500 plus people who responded to the city's um, uh, school district separation survey. And I also want to just make note that, um, excuse me one second. Uh, just, just to let everybody know, we're not doing this because it's uh, interesting or fun, although I do find it interesting. Um, it is one of the nine criteria of separation that we have to come up with a plan for a sound education performance. So that's a state uh, Department of Education requirement, and that's what all of this is working toward. Um, so that's all I have to say for that, Mikey. I would just add that uh, the team is working on more detailed responses regarding the nine criteria for the committee. Um, there's all sorts of other politics going on there, but I think our team's doing an amazing job at um, showing how we basically meet the nine criteria. And all of that is going to get to the committee, I believe, in January. Wonderful. Uh, Steve, I see your hand. Just a very, very quick question. The, the nine criteria will go to the, the Lake Hill Board in January, I think, sir, right, Mikey? That's, that's what was being targeted? More information, yes. It, 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 you know, I don't want to get overly into the politics, but it appears like maybe some people hadn't really read what we submitted before. So um, we are making sure and really pushing hard to get them details on how we satisfy the nine criteria. Okay. And Karen, you mentioned a meeting or some decision in March. What would that decision entail? Uh, we, we may get a finding from the county committee. In March. Oh, really? Okay. So March. We, we, might, we might get an up or down, in which case uh, we work with that or we um, go for our next move. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and I just want to clarify one thing Mikey said about getting information to the county committee. We've gotten an abundance of information to the county committee. We're trying to make sure that it has been digested. Bruce, thank you. Yeah, just, so I, I, if I understand this correctly, I, I think I do in the, in the first part of it. If we don't satisfy the criteria, we're done unless we get an opportunity to, to provide further information. If, if I'm wrong about that, say so. But the question I have is, if we do satisfy the criteria, then what? I mean, I, I, it's not automatic that we're done. What, what needs to be done after that? We go to the state. This is a long process, but it goes, long it goes to Sacramento. So, but, so this is, this is the, um, we need to cross this line to be able to get to the next step. Yes. Do we have an opportunity to cross this line beyond this, this decision or it's up or down full stop? I'm not sure how much <laughs> we want to talk about that right now. Um, no problem. <laughs> I, okay. I don't think it's over till it's over. Okay. Right. Fine. Thank you. And it, it ain't over. <laughs> And uh, I just want to take a moment to say that I, I heard that uh, we are going to be in a different assembly district than Santa, Santa Monica, or at least that's one of the maps that's out there. And Santa Monica is not happy about that. Could it be a lack of common community interest, perhaps? Possibly. Possibly. Yes. 
or okay. likely some someone jiggering to voters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's that's our report for that. So thank you. Thank you so much. And now uh, that takes us to item 1C, which is Southern California Edison update on recent public safety power shutoffs. And so if Rochelle and Rudy are available, I would like to turn over the floor to them. Hi, thank you, Mayor and Council members. My name is Rochelle Silsby, and I'm a Government Relations Manager for Southern California Edison. We appreciate you taking the time to hear from us today regarding the recent PSPS event, including some of the challenges and opportunities we're looking at here in, Mal in the Malibu area. Representing our organization to provide information about the recent event, I'd like to introduce Jill Anderson, our Executive Vice President of Operations. She was also the individual who was the officer in charge of last week's PSPS event. Can we invite Thank you, you so Heather? much, Michelle. Um, and, and so I have a few other team members with me, and if it's helpful, I can go on video, but hopefully you can at least hear me, so I'd be happy to um, be, be with you this evening. So let me just start out by saying that um, we recognize that the event that occurred last week was really terrible timing, that it is a very difficult situation and we put a tremendous hardship on all of our customers who were impacted. I just, as I heard, you know, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein talk about at the very beginning of this meeting, um, the, you know, interrupting people's holidays, the spoiling of food, the, um, the extreme inconvenience that happens whenever people lose power, for however short that duration might be. And so we absolutely recognize this. And I want to assure you that um, we have been doing our best to manage through what has been very extreme weather and being made worse by drought conditions and, and dangerous fire conditions, which we'll talk about. But we also recognize that we need to do better. We need to do better in a number of ways. And we're going to talk about that with you this evening. So. Uh, our agenda here, I'm going to share a little bit more about what happened last week, uh, what kind of upgrades that we've been making to the grid, particularly in the Malibu area. And then I'll wrap up with um, what kind of services that we have available to our customers. And then we are here to listen. Um, so as Rochelle told you earlier in the meeting, we're, we're going to stay on. We're going to listen to the comments that um, that you all have or that any members of the public might have. and. And uh, this is really our opportunity to take your feedback as, as I commit to you, you know, here being the executive vice president of operations that, that we are constantly learning and constantly improving through, through this difficult time. And so I'll start out by just a quick uh, overview of what a public safety power shutoff is for people who might not follow it that closely. So it's, it's really something that occurs not, you know, not just at, in Southern California, it's in all the utilities in California and even other utilities outside of California lately um, have been faced with during, you know, very dangerous fire conditions like the red flag warnings that we saw last week. When those combine with very strong winds, uh, all, all these utilities, we temporarily de-energize portions of our lines in order to minimize the chance of ignitions during those events. Uh, obviously, our, our number one goal is public safety, and we want to minimize the chance of any kind of a catastrophic fire. Um, you know, at a very high level, what we do with the PSPS is we look across all of the circuits in our service area. We look at where all the wind speeds are. Uh, we've made a, a significant investment in increasing our situational awareness. So we have weather stations all throughout our service area, and we try to get very granular so we can really minimize the number of circuits or number of customers that we have to temporarily turn off. And then once we're able to, we see the winds die down, we believe that it's safe now to restore power. Then the next step is we do a patrolling, and I'm sure we'll end up talking about this a little bit as we get into some of the restoration from last week. We have to do a visual inspection of our, our infrastructure to make sure that when we turn the power back on, we don't at that moment um, inadvertently ignite any kind of a fire. So that's why often we hear customers frustrated because the winds are over, but the lights aren't back on yet. And it's because we have to take that extra step to make sure that it is safe for us to re-energize. There are also cases, and there were certainly were cases last week throughout a service area and also specifically in Malibu where the winds themselves uh, have caused damage to our infrastructure. I'm sure there's damage to, to your personal property and others. And so um, in those cases, we, we might have customers who have 
an outage for a little bit longer than other customers because we need the crew to go up and put the pole back up or, or reconnect the conductor or fix whatever damage had occurred. Um, so let me get a little more detail about that specific event last week, and then I'm going to ask Terry Ohanian, uh, who is our director in distribution, to talk a little bit about the specific investments in hardening we've been making in the infrastructure that, that we all we use to service all of you. So last week, starting on Wednesday and going into Friday, uh, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, we were seeing forecasts for that period of um, of a Santa Ana wind event at the same time as a red flag warning and, and what was being projected to be conditions that could have been very conducive to a catastrophic fire. In fact, uh, so as I mentioned, we've installed a lot of these weather stations. We have a number of them in the Malibu area. Uh, we've, we've had those in place for about four years now. And this last week during Thanksgiving, we recorded the strongest winds we've ever recorded in four years was during that event. So I think what I want to get across for you is, you know, we saw wind speeds of close to 50 miles an hour, sustained gusts of over 75 miles an hour. This wasn't just a typical everyday Santa Ana wind event that, that any system should have been able to withstand. This was quite an extreme weather situation um, on, on top of very low humidity and very dry vegetation all around the foothills of Malibu, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And unfortunately, what that creates is you know, what we would we were predicting could have been a perfect storm for weather conditions that, that could have resulted in, in a major fire. And so it's because of that that we had to make the very difficult decision. I will tell you I was involved in it personally. It's not something we do at all lightly of having to de-energize customers, which is hard for us to do any day of the year, but it's particularly hard on a day like Thanksgiving or any other holiday when we know people are home, people are celebrating with their families, people have made various preparations. Um, but I can tell you it was the right decision. I know it was a hard decision, but it was the right decision. We, during those patrols that we did after the winds died down, we found damage in our system. And we know that, uh, as we've seen and we've seen um, in your area, that, that if we aren't careful about how we manage the system, that it, it can create much bigger problems than, than the missed holiday meal. So unfortunately, we had to de-energize customers. Um, over across the whole system, we, we had more than 80,000 customers who temporarily lost power. Uh, we had an impact on more than 100 of our circuits. This was a very, very big event for us. It was the largest event that we've had uh, had this year, this fire season. So it's um, something that um, we, I will say, are very happy that through it all, we were able to avoid any kind of major catastrophic fire. So that ultimately is the goal of the public safety power shutoff. Um, let me turn it over to Terry to talk a little bit more about um, particularly the grid hardening and investments we've been making in the grid. And then I'll, I'll wrap it up with customer some of the customer resources we have available, and then we'd be happy to take your questions or listen to any comments. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, and, and members of the public. Uh, my name is Terry O'Hanion. I'm going to talk a little bit about grid hardening, wildfire mitigation, and um, a little more about the Thanksgiving Day, uh, the Thanksgiving Day event. So I want to start with the forecast. It might provide some perspective. Um, you know, on Monday, you know, we 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 had our first forecast of of wind event, uh, wind event uh, weather coming in that we saw that was concerning. And, um, you know, at that time, uh, didn't look extraordinary, uh, certainly didn't look like anything that was uh, particularly different than what we, we've experienced in the past. Um, and so from a forecast perspective, we understood that we could be heading into a PSPS, uh, but, it, but it looked similar to previous events. By Wednesday, the forecast had gone up considerably. Um, so instead of looking at 40 to 50 mile an hour forecast winds, we were looking at 50 to 60 mile an hour uh, winds. And then unfortunately by Thanksgiving, really the start of the event was on Wednesday, but on into Thanksgiving, the wind speeds were actually 10 to 15 percent higher than the than the Wednesday forecast in some cases. Uh, we understood the weather would be widespread. We did not anticipate how severe the winds would be in Malibu. And this was just one of those events where the actual wind speeds turned out to be more severe than what was predicted. Um, in In normal circumstances or or maybe I'll say it, you know, in, in slightly less extreme weather than what we experienced, we have opportunities to shift power. We call it load rolling um, from one circuit to an adjacent circuit. Um, and 
and that can reduce the number of customers that are impacted. So if we have a circuit that's experiencing concerning winds uh, that, that you know, reach thresholds for de-energization, we can oftentimes uh, roll load or ship those customers to an adjacent circuit. And one of our frequently impacted circuits is the Cuthbert. Um, and, uh, and one of the mitigation plans we had developed because it was frequently impacted was in fact to roll load to, to circuits uh, to the west, which is the Galahad, and to the east, which is the Merlin. Um, but unfortunately, you know, during this event, uh, nearly all the circuits in Malibu were also impacted. So it, we just didn't have that opportunity to, to move customers to adjacent circuits. Ultimately, we had to de-energize six circuits in the Malibu area, the, the Cuthbert, the Galahad, the uh, Merlin, the McGuire, the Sarah, and the Zuma. And uh, again, you know, we, under slightly less extreme weather conditions, these, the mitigation plans we had in place could have helped us reduce the number of customers, but uh, that was not the case with the wind speeds being as extreme as they were. And, and even with the covered conductor that we've installed here um, and other plans, we had, we had put in place switching plans, segmentation. Uh, we had obtained exceptions in certain areas where fuels weren't as concerning. Uh, we, we just couldn't mitigate the risk of these damaging winds that could lead to a spark. Um, I'll say, you know, I've, I've been an incident commander. I wasn't actually the incident commander on this event, um, but this is not an easy decision. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I realize this was a tremendous and overwhelming disappointment and burden for, for those that live and, and work in these communities. Um, you know, we, it's Thanksgiving. It's a pandemic. It's, it, it doesn't go lost on us. I mean, it's, it's, it's very consequential for those involved and we don't take it lightly. Um, but our concerns over public safety and the overall threat of a potential catastrophic wildfire in Malibu, we just felt that risk was too great here. Um, that being said, I do want to say that um, we are absolutely going to continue to look at ways to improve our reliability and resiliency, you know, to reduce the need for PSPS in light of this experience. Uh, the plans we Im implemented this year were primarily for the Cuthbert because that was the circuit that was frequently impacted. Uh, last year, a couple of PSPS de-energizations um, and, and some of the years prior as well. Um, so we focused our attention on that circuit um, and had developed these mitigation plans. But like I had said, uh, the weather was beyond what we experienced last year. And, and what we did uh, for, for context is we used the, the actual 2020 experience as a model to develop plans. And what we said is if we had you know, an experience similar to 2020, what can we do on this circuit to greatly reduce or avoid a PSPS de-energizations. And we felt 2020 was a good year to use as this model because um, that was quite severe for us at the time. We had 70% more red flag days in 2020 than the year prior. It was the worst fire year on record in California um, and the persistent prolonged drought conditions that extended PSPS up until January of this year. Um, so a lot going on in terms of um, PSPS activity last year. Uh, but like I said, unfortunately, this past week's event was different than last year's and considerably more severe in terms of uh, wind speeds. But, you know, I said it, we're committed to continue to learn and continue to find opportunities to reduce the need for PSPS in the Malibu community. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Jill. Yeah, thank you. So um, I want to just spend a minute adding on to what Perry described about uh, what we did as far as customer resources, because there might have been um, an experience some of your your um, constituents here want to talk about. Uh, and so in the very beginning of the event, I think as Terry described, we we didn't see that, that that it was going to be as large as it turned out to be. And we originally didn't have any customer resources. We, we deploy mobile vans and also set up kind of pop-up customer care locations. We didn't have any of those deployed in Malibu because it, it initially didn't look like the weather that was going to hit Malibu was going to be as bad as it was. Uh, but once we started to see the wind speeds come in and we had to redeploy, you know, even just our, you know, our operation focusing in that area, we did move one of our customer crew vehicles uh, from another part of the service area over to uh, Bluffs Park. Um, and so we were able to then provide, you know, people right there in person who our customers could drive up to, could speak to. Uh, we have some services available. We provide resiliency kits. We, we gave out, because it was a holiday, we gave out 
uh, gift cards for groceries, um, recognizing that, that this had been a particularly um, disruptive event because of the timing. Uh, so, you know, one of the lessons for, for us, and I'll, I'll speak frankly, we, I wish we had had a, a location deployed there earlier than we did. Um, it, it's always, you know, you're always trying to send the resources to the location that's going to need it the most. And, and here we had, a, had that change in weather. Um, but we did course correct, but it, I, I'm sure that it created some frustration for, for the residents of Malibu. And that, that's completely understandable. Um, we have other, uh, resources that we make available to customers kind of year round so that they can help to get through one of these events or any other kind of outage. Uh, we provide backup batteries at no cost to customers who rely on medical devices and if they meet a certain income qualification. And so we're very proactive in our outreach on that. And if there's anyone listening who believes that, that, um, you qualify, you can find out all the information very easily on our website and, and we can provide that if you don't have, you know, se.com, but you just go se.com slash PSPS and you'll be able to get to uh, the information about how to get a backup battery. Um, for any customer, you can get um, a rebates towards the cost of a backup generator or, you know, backup battery for your home. Uh, one thing I thought I'd, I'd address proactively uh, because it's often something that comes up is, will we pay for food, the cost of food spoilage? And there is a claims process, but I want to be transparent that uh, we only pay for the damage caused from outages when it is a result of any kind of negligent action on our part. That's that's our standard policy and similar for, for our peer utilities. And so weather and weather events like this is, is not something that, that that is related to negligence. So uh, we will get a lot of customers who, who will put in food claims, but but we often, in these case, the case of the weather event we had last week, that we don't reimburse for food. That's why, because it was a holiday, we did, you know, this kind of one-time grocery gift cards. Um, I know that's not a very satisfying answer for people, but I'd, I'd rather address it head on, and we, we'd be happy to talk more about it as, as people want to. Um, and so just, you know, kind of wrapping up, uh, we have, as I mentioned in the very beginning, you know, we're constantly learning and improving and we're listening to customer feedback year round. We issue a report about all the details about that happens with this, which we provide up to our regulator every time we have to do a public safety power shut off. And we use that to improve. Uh, we've got, you know, we, we know this isn't going to be the last one, but with all the investments that we've been doing and some of the details that, that Terry shared, our intent is to, make them less and less likely that we're going to need to get to this kind of um, tool of last resort. Um, but we are here otherwise this evening to to listen, to take your questions. I see a number of you have questions already, so I think I'll, I'll turn it back. I'll turn it back to all of you, and uh, we'll be here to, to listen and, and help out with any other information we can share. Oh, you're on mute, I think. Thank you, Jill. Mikey? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Jill, Rochelle, and Terry for, for coming down and explaining that. Um, as an Arson Watch volunteer, I was out in the wind, and I would have to agree with your assessment that it was an extreme wind event. Um, though I don't always agree with your PSPS shutoffs or your company's PSPS shutoffs, I believe you had no choice in this one because any spark, there'd have been absolutely no way to stop that fire. It would have burned straight to the ocean. Nothing could have stopped it. But I think what's frustrating about that is, you know, it's easy from a resident perspective to view that if the equipment was more up to date and more modern and newer, like the Cuthbert circuit, we know needs upgrades we wouldn't be in this situation as much. I know you don't control that. I know you can't underground our cables, but the reality is we end up here with a system that is not designed for the environment it's in. It appears at times. Now that was an extreme event. It did damage at my house to your point. It was, it was as windy as I've seen. Um, and you answered the, you know, I got all sorts of, as you know, angry emails here that you should not be allowed by law and whatever their other reasons to do PSPS shutoffs. 
in an event like that, I, I'm going to have to side with you. If, if you don't, we're going to burn down because I, I saw cables down, lines down during this event. And of course there were. Um, so not a good situation to be in. Um, whatever upgrades you need to be, I, I have talked with, uh, Rudy and tried to help him with some permitting issues, whatever it is, whatever we can do to upgrade that system, whatever we can do to make it more resilient. Um, please also know you can turn to me and um, I think answer the question about being reimbursed for food. It certainly was a very difficult Thanksgiving for all of us. And uh, thanks again for being here. No, thank you. Karen. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, yes, I'd like to thank the three of you uh, for uh, this presentation, but I have a lot of questions. Um, and we all received a lot of emails. I know that you know that already. Um, you did mention uh, backup batteries for medical devices and the infos on the website. Um, I, I do want to just say in front of everybody here, I think we need to make sure that uh, our constituents and our community know how to access that. So I'm asking you, Steve, to um, work with Matt or Susan or whoever and get something put together on that. Um, the rebates for backup generators, that's something I was going to ask you about. I was unaware of that program. Uh, could, could one of you describe that to us? Yeah, I can. So um, we have a marketplace, we call it, on our website where customers can get access to a number of different technologies, you know, energy efficiency technology, solar, electric car chargers, and also um, backup pa power for their homes. And if you go through the site, then you can get rebates um, through Edison to help reduce the cost of the generator. It's not going to cover the full cost, um, but you there are there is discounts for all of those different technologies. So we can follow back up with you with the direct links on how to get to the backup battery program for medical devices, how to get to the rebates, and so that you can share that with your constituents. Okay, thank you. That would be very helpful. Um, I think everybody's wondering, can the grid or grids, particularly it seems to me, Cuthbert and Galahad, can they be better articulated so that they can be re-energized more efficiently and more effectively. Yeah, I'll, I'll and take, I, I know they can be better done. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll take that one. Um, so a couple things here. Um, uh, we, we have segmented these circuits into sections. Um, so part of the struggle with re-energizing, there's, there's, there's a few issues here that are going on. I mean, one is, um, the terrain that a lot of the, the circuitry traverses over and um, some of them are, you know, steep, you know, mountainous conditions and uh, a foot patrol, you know, hiking through that area, particularly at, at night uh, is, is really difficult to do and can be dangerous as well. So, you know, we, we, we do use helicopter inspections. Uh, we don't fly at night, um, you know, and so the unfortunate thing here is uh, we had to wait, you know, throughout the evening hours and, and fly, you know, at, um, in the morning. Um, I, I think there was opportunities to, to do a little better to get the helicopter up um, sooner. I will tell you that there's a process that our pilots follow, um, you know, where they go through you know, flight checks and uh, they tailboard everybody in the crew. They've got to go to a service center to pick up a, a patrolman or a troubleman and they will spend time to go through the safety protocols with them. So th there's some things that they have to go through, but but I think there's some opportunities for us to look at that uh, timing and, and probably do a little better there. Um, and then in terms of resiliency uh, and the circuitry, you know, last year we didn't de-energize these other circuits. Um, and, you know, we, we were trying to make the biggest difference we could in the, you know, eight, nine months from when the season ended last um, develop a plan and and implement as much as we could to make the biggest difference um, that, that we could see. And, and the Cuthbert was really the one that we focused on. We did install uh, almost a mile of covered conductor, uh, a switch to be able to segment. Um, we, we got an exception and a part of the circuitry was actually on the Galahad where and it would ensure that it, it would be able to stay energized longer. Um, 
you know, and uh, unfortunately, you know, and, and the load rolling on both the Galahad and the Merlin, but unfortunately, it, it just, you know, with the wind speeds the way they were, they, they, they breached our thresholds and it just didn't work this time around. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to sound like there's nothing we can do here. I mean, we're going to have to continue to look. Um, and, and we understand that's an expectation of our customers that we've, we've got to do better. Uh, and, and we'll go back and spend some time. We called it deep dive. So we'll go back and deep dive, uh, and look at what else we can do to, to renovate these circuits. Now that may be really difficult before the next PSPS event, but if there is an option, uh, you know, that, that we can consider, we'll do it. Um, otherwise we'll, we'll spend, you know, the, the time between now and next year looking at additional grid hardening. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I realize this is going to be ongoing for you all forever. Um, and I will say it was extreme. Um, I said when I first uh, logged into the meeting, the metal spot, the spine of my metal roof actually blew off and ended up in my driveway at about 9 p.m. Wednesday night. Uh, when we, when it happened, we thought it was a rain gutter and that would have been bad enough. It was actually the spine of the entire roof. So I understand this was extreme, um, but I do have some more questions. Uh, and I'm going to say this. There was no fire. We'd be having a very different conversation if there had been. Um, and I got, I know two for sure, maybe three notices of uh, of lines down, of power lines down. I know there was Canaan and Mulholland, there was PCH and Heather Cliff, and I'm trying to remember there might have been one on Malibu Road. Maybe I'm dreaming. And one on Bonsall. I, I know there were, and Bonsall, that's what it was. Yeah. So yes, we're all thankful uh, that we didn't have a fire. But now here's my biggest question. And I'm gonna ask, one of you to to make a guess. Can, can anybody guess what the Woolsey fire cost SoCal Edison or, or what it has cost to date? Um, I'm thinking I can actually look up a couple of numbers to estimate it for you if you if you'd like. Okay. I would like that. I think a lot of us okay. are wondering. Um, and a lot of things go into that, including the ongoing uh, uh, settlements. Yeah, that's what I would go to is just kind of whatever information we've shared. Um, you know, we had, there have been multiple pieces of settlements. Um, so I can I can look some up while, while we're talking and, and give you a couple of numbers. Okay, thank you. And obviously that's just a part of the cost because you have your own internal costs replacing equipment, mm -hmm. payroll, and everything else that you deal with. So here's the big question. How would you compare that Woolsey fire cost to undergrounding? And how do you compare that to return on investment of replacing equipment and doing covered conductor and, and all those things, which are great, but really in the end, there doesn't seem to be any other solution than undergrounding. Uh, if I may, um, I, I don't know the cost comparison. Um, I, I will tell you undergrounding is an option on the table. Um, I, I, I ran the expedited grid hardening portion uh, to, to, to try to, you know, um, install as much covered conductor and as, as much work as we could before the, the next season. And, uh, we did look at targeted undergrounding. The challenge there is um, we we did not think we could complete it in that seven eight month time frame. You know the permitting process is is difficult, and we were looking to make the biggest difference we could in the shortest amount of time. But but it is it is something we, we're doing. It has a longer cycle to get through, um, and certainly you know it, it it can help in these situations. So what it, it is something that you know from an engineering perspective and a construction perspective we're looking at. In a targeted way, but um, it may not be something that can be done quickly. Well, I understand that, and you know, I'll state the obvious. Look at the Roman aqueduct. 
You know, you look at the Colosseum, the Forum, the Vatican, whatever you want to look at, something that's very old and built over the course of many, many, many years, sometimes hundreds of years, with what level of technology? I mean, I don't think you guys have any, I would hope you don't have any plan other than to look at undergrounding as much as possible. And I, I think I'm speaking for the whole community. Council Member Ferry, you raise a great point. It's a little off topic. I would urge that we get. I know we have a the, long agenda. Okay. You have a long agenda. I, just, I, I feel the, like I feel like I am speaking specific, to the community. Understood. This, the topic was specific to the most recent power outages. Getting into undergrounding, while a very valid point, is a little off that topic. Okay. I've said pretty much what I wanted to say, and um, I will cede the floor here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Steve, you're next. And John, I disagree with your last comment. Undergrounding is directly in line with the thing that just happened. I mean, here's here's my perspective. The Santa Ana wind's been blown for a very, very long time. They're not new. What Southern California Edison has done is created an infrastructure that becomes dangerous when the wind blows. And some, you know, I, I was hoping today in the presentation I heard, and we, you talked a lot about band-aids. You're going to you know, put this or do that. But as far as I can tell, based on what I've heard, power shutoffs are going to be part of my future probably as long as I'm alive. All right? Because uh, I, have, I have not heard one word you guys come up with that says, here is a time frame that we're gonna, and a plan we're going to come up with. We're going to eliminate our need to do that. And that's what I was hoping to hear tonight. I mean, I would have thought after all these, you know, the, the heat you guys have gotten for these power shutoffs or the time you've been doing it, somebody on your side of the fence would be sitting down and saying, we have to fix it and start working on a plan and a time frame to get that done. So I'm just disappointed you guys couldn't come up with that tonight. All back to you. Um, if you'd like, I, I could respond. You know, I, I, I want to start out by saying, you know, we absolutely are not satisfied with the status quo. There's no one at SCE who is saying, okay, well, here we have the solution. Let's just keep doing PSPS whenever, whenever we need to. We're making investments every single day that is minimizing the need to do it. And we've, we've seen that already this year when we look at wind events that we've had and we can look point specifically to circuits that we were able to keep energized through a wind event that a year ago we would have had to de-energize because of the potential danger. So each day with each new mile of cover conductor or changes that we're making with more sectionalizing as Terry described, we are reducing the frequency and the number of customers that are gonna be impacted. I appreciate that it's not happening fast enough you know, we're doing over a thousand miles a year of, of hardening and changing out our system. And we're focusing on the areas that have been hit the hardest in the past. And I appreciate that, that, you know, there's a, there's a desire that that should, that should all happen overnight. And I wish we could, but I'll, I promise you that we have people who work on this full time, seven days a week, all year long. We're making changes to minimize the frequency and the likelihood of needing to do this. Okay. I wasn't expecting it to happen overnight. What I was hoping to hear is that you've got a plan that says over this period of time, we're going to accomplish that. I mean, let me ask you a question. Are you guys going to the federal government? They got this infrastructure bill, right? I mean, are you working with, they get money from the infrastructure bill to use that to help you solve some of these issues? And if not, why not? Yeah, we, in fact, we've got people in Washington, D.C. who work very closely with all, you know, the federal branch of government and uh, focusing on where are the opportunities where we can help make investments in the system that won't increase costs for our customers. So, yes, is a kind of short answer to your question. We are. Um, and I can, you know, I can give you a broad timeline across the system. You know, we've got plans that by the end of 2023, we'll have, you know, more than 4,500 miles of covered conductor installed. Um, so we've got, you know, the goals as far as the number of additional cameras that we install and um, sectionalizing that we're doing. So we have a plan. It's a public plan that we file with our regulator. We have a wildfire mitigation plan, and, and that has specific targets and milestones that we report on throughout the year. So 
Um, I can't rattle off any right now specific to Malibu, but we can certainly provide the Malibu view of those investments for you. And yeah, when you get a chance, that'd, that'd be good. Thank you. Got a call back to you. And I'm back to Bruce. Okay, so uh, first of all, Rochelle, Jill, Terry, I, I appreciate what you have had, to, what you've said. I, I know you've got an extremely difficult line to walk to both um, represent SCE appropriately and, and to be um, empathetic to what's going on here. And, and, I, and I feel it's genuine. And I, and I know that a lot of people way above you are making decisions that affect what's happened here. And you're the, you're the ones that are here before the carpet to um, respond. So I, I appreciate that. I do. Um, you know, we're not talking about overnight, though. I mean, this is a town that has historically burned. And this is not, and Woolsey was not the first fire that involved um, utility. So, you know, overnight would have been to expect undergrounding and other effective preventions for this kind of thing a decade ago. Over, overnight would have been to have expected it the day after the Woolsey fire, three years ago. Um, if undergrounding is something that can be done engineering-wise, and yet it has not been done for the past decade or two, you, know, you, you say that you don't reimburse people other than for your negligence. This is deliberate neglect. This is not, this is way beyond negligence. The reason that everyone in Malibu was inconvenienced by this PSPS, which was necessary because of the deliberate neglect of the infrastructure for the past two decades. Um, but we, we, we clearly, you needed to shut the power down because we basically had a rainless hurricane. But you shouldn't have had to shut the power down if for the past decade or two you'd been working on solutions to a known problem. Now, we're not asking that the entire state of California be underground. The entire state of California hasn't burned repeatedly and from utility fires. This is a town that you just, again, you know, three years ago, we suffered more than, you know, paradise, terrible event. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that they didn't suffer. They suffered worse, but they weren't SCE. They were a different power company. But, you know, we, we are the, probably the number one recipient of the um, inability of SCE to find a safe solution. And to say that you're now looking at underground, but it can't be done overnight, to me, it, it, it rings it rings somewhat hollow. So, I mean, I would encourage you all to think about reimbursing the people of Malibu for the expense that they incurred in the past week. And actually, there were two PSPSs in the past 10 days, I think. Uh, but, you know, this was an event that ought to have been avoided by work that could have been done over the past many years. It's not an event that all of a sudden you see there's a problem. Um, you mentioned gift cards. I don't know what the amounts of the gift cards were, but it seems unfair that only the people that managed to show up at your sites got a gift card at a bare minimum. I would encourage you to think about providing gift cards to everyone who suffered from this. Um, I had spoken to the people at the um, at one of the sites two PSPSs ago, you know, not the Thanksgiving one, but the one that occurred a few days before that, um, about people needing ice. And, and I was told, oh, well, we're going to have coupons at some point. We don't have them now, but we're going to have coupons to get ice. And it was, you know, like for a five-pound bag of ice or something. And I said, no, people need dry ice to keep their food from spoiling, which you clearly do. I mean, I real ice is not going to do much. So, you know, there, there are things you guys could be doing to offset the damage. There are things you guys could be doing to prevent this from happening. And I appreciate you're in a hard position, like I said, but it needs to be done. What I would like to understand, I guess, precisely what are you seeking to prevent from causing a fire by affecting the P PSPS? I mean, I, I know that there are electrical fires, but what is it that causes the fire specifically that you're concerned about in Malibu? that you need to shut the power down for? And then what are you doing to address that specific thing that you're concerned will start a fire? Because rolling, um, load rolling, I don't understand how that does anything because you still have to have the infrastructure carrying electricity. So I'm not sure why that does it, but maybe you can explain why that 
that helps reduce the fire danger. But I'd like an explanation of what exactly is it you're trying to prevent from happening, and what are you doing to prevent that exact thing from happening? I'll start. Maybe Jill will layer in. But, you know, what happens at wind speeds, you know, that get up over, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour is you have things that blow into our lines. And if there's bare wire, you know, whether it's a tree branch or palm frond or, you know, sometimes it's just debris or things from people's backyards that can blow up and into our conductors. And if it's bare, it's like it creates a short circuit, just like if in your own in-home wiring, if you were to touch the two wires together, it creates a spark. Same thing will occur here. So let's say a tree branch, you know, touches both conductors or touches one of the conductors and a wood pole. It can create a spark, and that spark, it can travel quite a distance in the wind, or the branch itself can fall to the ground while it's ignited and create a fire. With covered conductor, there's quite a bit of protection from that. Because, and we actually from this event have, you know, images of palm fronds and debris in our lines. And the interesting thing is we don't even know that occurred anymore. Typically our circuit will, you know, will de-energize itself, but unfortunately not before a spark occurs. And so that's what you're trying to prevent. It's really concerning wind speeds, even with covered conductor, when you get up into the, you know, 60 mile an hour range, you can have things fall into our lines. And that can cause the wire to separate, particularly where there's connections between, you know, two different wires. And that, even that covered conductor can fall to the ground and that end is exposed and that can also create a fire. Let me explain load rolling just really briefly. We have many weather stations on the circuits throughout the Malibu area and really throughout our territory where we're subject to PSPS. And those weather stations oftentimes are specific to segments. So we take a circuit and we break it up into pieces. And we look at the weather that's occurring at that location. And we only try to impact that, those subset of customers on the circuit where the winds are concerning. And, but sometimes what happens is that, that impact may be very close to where the power originates from, like near the substation. And if we de-energize, we're going to take, we're going to de-energize everybody downstream of that. But maybe a lot of the people downstream, the winds aren't as concerning. So if we have a circuit tie, a connection, an electrical connection to an adjacent circuit, we have automated switches. We can open them up in certain locations, isolate the concerning area from an area that's not experiencing concerning winds, and then close in a switch to make an electrical connection to the adjacent circuit. Sorry, I hope that makes sense. It did. I appreciate everything you said. And, you know, and I take you all to be very sincere in your efforts to avoid a catastrophic fire. The problem is more can be done to avoid the need to avoid the fire. And, you know, I know it's a multi-billion dollar company and they're making a value decision that it's less expensive for the company to turn the power off from time to time. And in Malibu, it's more often than it is in a lot of other places than it is to fix the problem so that the power doesn't need to be shut off. And that's unfair to our town. It's unfair to other places like us. And we're not, and because we're just, we're not that many people in relation to the entire state where the problem doesn't exist. I understand why SCE won't spend disproportionate amounts of money to truly fix the problem from occurring in the first place. The other thing I wanted to ask about, I lost my, was can you guys at least be doing something so that our cell service doesn't go down from shutting the power down? Can you provide backup electricity, backup power for telecom so that when you shut the power down, because you're going to continue to do it in less than until you underground, which I don't see happening. Certainly not happening tomorrow. We've been told that, but is there some way that you can stop our power from going down for the cell towers so that people aren't at least completely in the dark, literally and figuratively? 
Uh, I don't know if Rochelle or others could address that. I know we work with our telecom providers. Yeah, I could do that. Sorry, Terry, I was back on mute, but I'm able to talk now. So, uh, yeah, we do work very closely with our telecom providers. They're an infrastructure, critical infrastructure partner that at the beginning of any event, we start coordinating with them before power has been turned off at all so that they have an idea of the areas where we're concerned and um, so that they can start to mobilize. Telecom providers have requirements from the state regulator to provide backup power to their sites. Uh, they often don't have it installed as like a permanently connected generator, but they use mobile generators that they'll deploy to the areas where, where they are anticipating or experience shutoff. Um, and so that's, if, if Malibu experienced telecom outage at the same time, it's likely that the telecom providers didn't deploy the generators to where they needed to be, or maybe they um, didn't have enough to cover how widespread this windstorm was. It, it covered quite a large part of Southern California and all the way down into San Diego. So um, that, that's something that we work to coordinate and help with the telecom, but um, they have the requirement to provide their own on-site generation. And, and uh, just a one last question, and then I'll see the floor. Um, you know, this, this happened on a national holiday. Did you have a full staff out there getting things fixed as quickly as possible on Thanksgiving, or were we working with a holiday staff? No, we yeah. brought people in. I'm sorry, Terry was probably going to yeah. jump and say the same thing. So uh, we had people working um, across the company. We brought people in, um, off, took them off vacation or off their holiday so that we could prioritize managing the event and restoring it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Karen, I see your hand is raised. Thank you. Sorry, I meant to ask one other question, um, and that kind of came up just now. Uh, after the Woolsey fire, the city had a Colt cell on light truck parked in the city hall front parking lot for a long time. I mean, maybe a month or more. I don't know who else remembers that. Um, and I believe there was a cow cell on wheels uh, at. Um, at the Bluffs, maybe there was one at Zuma. Um, so could any of you address that? Because that really is very helpful. It seems like not a big ask. Um, and, and I don't, I, I believe that was Edison that provided those, correct me if I'm wrong. I would like to just put in a standing request for when, when we go through this again. I'm sorry, these are what kind of trucks? Bell on light light truck and the other one is called a cow cell on wheels so that people can have Wi-Fi okay. and communicate with the rest of the world when yeah, so, they when they go to those locations. Okay, we, that's something we can look into. We don't have those in our portfolio that we deploy and any kind of regular course of, of operation that I'm aware of. So it might have been something that was coordinated with the telecom providers in the area. So yeah, that might have been, I, I apologize they, they for were. asking the wrong person. They were with the uh, telecom companies. Yeah. I see Rob Bo's got his hand raised. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, all those uh, mobile telephone uh, or those cell were, were from Verizon. They provided those. I think there was Verizon, I think uh, T-Mobile had a unit out there too. So, so yeah. those were all done by those, and they were parked right in front of my office. <laughs> so yeah. I see we have several people who are not council people who've raised their hands, and I'm wondering if we can just meld seamlessly into item 2A, uh, communications from the public. Uh, if we call on these people, if they've, they've got another communications from the public thing in, we're gonna we're gonna use it up. Is that clear with everybody? So, Mayor Grisanti, would you like to start public comment by hearing from those who have their hands raised? I would. And continue with That's the other. That's what speaker. I would like to do. Okay. Then our first speaker will be Marissa. Marissa, are you available? Um, I, it's Ryan Embry. I got unmuted. No, no, Ryan, you're this. You're the second. Marissa's in front of you. Marissa, do you hear me? 
She's still muted. Marissa, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Oh, can I ask a question before you sure. get to Marissa? Uh, so to the extent that members of the public have questions, is their clock going to stop while the question's being answered, or, they, or should they just ask as many questions as they they had to ask, and then they'll all be answered after they're done speaking? I would I, I would suggest that they spend their three minutes asking questions, and then uh, we'll get answers, and then we'll go on to the next person is what I'm thinking. Makes sense. Thank you. Can we, I guess we should put Marissa back at the end of the line and take Ryan then. Okay, we'll circle back to her and hear from Ryan now. Are you there, Ryan? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure about, I guess, combining all comments. But um, I put in a comment that you had an earlier meeting this evening at 4.30. It was a special meeting, and yet for some reason you had warrant register on the agenda and approved millions of dollars worth of payments, one of which uh, I did bring to your attention was um, contractually uh, inappropriate and I guess is a gift of public funds. So I, I would hope that you would reconsider that for the public integrity purpose. And I think you know what I'm talking about. It's not worth uh, jeopardizing the public trust over that amount of money. Uh, now, second, though, is we need to address the elephant in the room here is that it has been a business practice of Edison to raise the voltage of their local distribution in Malibu from 4,000 to 16,000 volts. And that occurred starting around 2005 or 2006. And yet at the time that that was done, and it occurred uh, during the 2007 fire in January, they did Malibu Road and changed the transformers, turned off the power to the entire road, even though only one portion of the road needed to be interrupted. And nobody's got new wires except for the section that was actually undergrounded. The, the problem is that the arc of a flash of a short will be greater at 16,000 volts than 4,000 volts. And I'll direct you to uh, Dr. Robert Shannon's report from Caltech, which was his thesis on this very subject with the partnership, I believe, with Edison. So how ironic is that? And it was the DWP and Westinghouse Electric. So the the idea that there's there was no wires replaced after the up conversion from 4,000 to 16,000 volts is probably a lot to do with why we're here, is they're concerned about the local distribution. I have a big question, is there's very high voltage power coming across Malibu Canyon, not parallel to the road with the telecom transmitters on it. I'm talking about the big power that runs most of Malibu. And I'd like to know if that power was turned off during this event and Apparently, it can withstand those wind speeds. So we're talking about the local distribution thing and the hardening and replacement of wires with insulated wire is something that could have and should have occurred since the 2007 fire on Malibu Canyon. And it's been 14 years and there's been a settlement and a lot of money's been paid, a lot of grief, a lot of homes burned down in 2007 and up in Corral Canyon and the terrible Woolsey fire. So let's find out what are these weak links that um, are being shifted around and averted that need to be corrected so that these bypass and rolling changes don't need to occur. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. And the next speaker with their hand raised is Is, it, is there any of the uh, people who work for Southern California Edison who'd like to take a crack at the question about the uh, the raise in voltage from 4,000 to 16,000 watts? I, I don't know the specifics. I know we um, converted our 4,000 volt system to 16,000 volt system. The, the 16 kV system is more reliable, um, uh, but you know, it was some time ago. I, I, I don't really have much more information about it. Okay. All right. So now we're back to Tracy. Is that correct, Kelsey? Yeah, she was the next person who raised her hand. Hi, Tracy. Are you available? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. 
Thank you. I guess this is directed to Mrs. Anderson. I've just got a couple of quick questions. So number one, I just like to make sure that the corrective action plan dated February 12th of 2021, is that still the active protocol that SCE is following? Number two, did SCE follow the national incident management system and components of the standardized emergency management system? And if so, we'd like to know the name and the email of the incident commander, please. Second, we can keep going. I'd like to know who is a live field observer for both the Cuthbert and the Galahad circuits. And last, I'd just like to know the committee members of the safety and the operations committee for the SCE board. Thank you very much. Okay. Tracy. Do you want me to respond? Please do. Okay. I'm going to let me make sure I get the board members. So let me start from the beginning. Your first question. Yes, the corrective action plan that you referenced from February is current. You should also, we've also published updates to it, completing the action items that are in that plan for reference for others who might not be familiar with what we're talking about. Early next, early last year, early this year, after what was a very difficult fire season for 2020, we put together a plan with multiple areas where we were going to make improvements in how we manage these events. We made that public and we've been public about our progress against all of those. So we are still on target with that plan and we have implemented, as you can see, there are many of those improvements. So yes, that's current. The second question was the National Incident Command System. We do use that system. We use it during every emergency, not just windstorms, but if we were going to have, you know, in the event of an earthquake or if we were responding to a fire, we are trained. Almost all of the officers and executives in the company are trained and then we have hundreds of people around the company who are trained in that system. I'm a trained incident commander, so is Terry, for example. And so we operate, it's a way that we are able to more easily coordinate with fire and emergency services and others because it's like a common platform and protocol so that we can all get through emergencies as effectively as possible. You asked for the names of the incident commanders. I think that we include that in our after action report that we file with the commission, which we do after every PSPS event. And so that'll be public when we complete that report, which is usually done around 10 business days after the PSPS. The next was live field observers. There is not any one live field observer. There are many and it changes throughout the event. We might have them on one circuit during one part. And if that once that circuit is de-energized, then they're often redeployed to other places. We have over a thousand trained live field observers in the company. So I don't think that it's practical to provide you all of their names, but we are continuing, you know, we continue to deploy and use them throughout the event in a way, you know, that is as efficient as possible. And then the last question you had, I do need to look it up to make sure I get you everybody's names exactly, but this is also public. Give me one second. Your other question was the name of the board members of our safety and operations committee. Give me one second. So the chair of the safety and operations committee for us is Tim O'Toole. And I'm just looking up to bring, okay, here's the committees. So also on that committee is Jean Bellevue Dunn. I already mentioned Tim O'Toole, who's the chair, Carrie Smith, Peter Taylor, and Keith Trent. This is all on edison.com under the investor tab. You can see the name of and bios of all of our board members and all of the committees that they are members of. Thank you. Okay. Who's next, Kelsey? 
Next with a raised hand is Scott Dietrich. Hey, Scott. Are you there? I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, I'm going to suggest that Malibu go on record as opposing any PSPS protocol. It's not a public safety issue. It's become that. It's a way for Edison to avoid legal liability in the event of a fire. Um, but we're putting our citizens at even more risk. Not only was our power out for 38 hours, our cell phones were out, our landlines were out. I have a phone that is not powered a landline phone. It wouldn't work either. There is no way in a medical emergency that our citizens can call for help. They can't call the paramedics. They can't call to report a fire. And it, just so that you know, Australia banned such shutoffs, realizing how dangerous this really is for the citizens. Oh, and our Everbridge 911 that the city worked so hard to implement doesn't work either. We're sitting ducks. And as far as the wind, the wind was strong, but I don't believe that it met the California Public Utilities Commission requirement that above ground utility equipment should re re meet 91 miles an hour for three seconds. And that came from Hans, incidentally, a while back during Wolsey. We should replace SCE, uh, fire them. The idea of a for-profit company guaranteed a profit no matter how badly they screw up. And they do screw up. I'm not accusing these individuals that came here tonight of that, but the whole organization is mired in 19th century technology and it needs to change. Lastly, um, I'll spend my last minute. Um, Karen and others brought up the fact that uh, the huge cost of fighting Wolsey. But what nobody ever includes in this real cost, what about the firefighting cost? The cost is astronomical of fighting these fires. And the only solution is to underground, which SCE fights tooth and nail. I can tell you that from personal experience. They up the cost. Then after they get through um, raking you over the coals, they turn you over to the cable companies. They don't want to do it either. This has got to end fire SCE. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe there was a question in there. There was not, sir. Thank you. Who do we have next, Kelsey? Next with a raised hand is Cassandra Rira. Hi, Cassandra. Hi, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, um, I'd like to thank SCE for taking the time to come and address all of us. And I just would like to share that um, I did have, I have a backup power system and had internet access and power through the duration of the outage. I feel very fortunate for that. Uh, but I was very frustrated at the lack of information that was coming from SCE via email alerts, which I've signed up for, or through their website. And um, during the 38 hours, there were a total of four emails. And, you know, one of which was your power is going to come back on in the next few hours. And, you know, 12 hours, 14, 15 hours later, we still had no power. So I just asked that maybe that could be revisited in terms of the communication that is happening, because many neighborhoods have at least, you know, one or two people who have access to information and can share it out with their neighbors. And it was very frustrating to, to not be able to access information. And I appreciate you don't always know what the situation will be, but even updates telling us that you're working on it and you're not sure would have been helpful. And that's it. I'll cede the rest of my time. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Kelsey, do we have Hamish next? Yes, Hamish is next. Hi, Hamish. 
Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? We're spectacular. Hey, um, as, as a person whose house burned down in the 1993 fire in Las Flores, my house burned down in the Woolsey fire, and I take great exception with this, the community of Malibu not being proactive to defend their own houses and be prepared for these situations. We all knew this was coming. And if you want to talk to anyone who took the ball into their own hands, that would be Hans Letts. Hans Letts is a hero of this community because that guy single-handedly went and took care of all the overloaded power poles. He didn't wait around for the city. He didn't wait around for SCE. He didn't wait. He took actions into his own hand. And also, the city of Malibu got a $30 million payout from SCE, and they probably should have put that money into undergrounding anything. But most of Malibu is an unincorporated Los Angeles County, but we have Malibu addresses. And what I'd also like to say is this meeting was designated for a special meeting. This wasn't a complaint session for people to vet their, their inability to proactively defend their community. You have a group of parents right now who, who are proactively trying to defend their children against what they consider a lethal and dangerous mandate in the public school systems coming their way. And yet we're sitting here wasting their time with what well, they're sitting with their children. So what I think we could do is could we please move up agenda item 6A to the very next agenda item. Jefferson Wagner affidavit should not take precedent. And all the other things on the agenda item do not take precedent for these parents that are proactively showing up at City Hall for the first time, probably in their lives, to defend their children. So please... You had nine months, years and years to come down to City Hall to, to warn about the fire issues and the power shutoffs. Everybody complaining after the fact. I'm sorry. There's been plenty of time to be proactive to make sure that your turkey doesn't defrost because you didn't want to get prepared. Hans Letts got us prepared. And, and I take exception with this this complaining about spilt milk while you have a bunch of people that are trying to defend their children proactively ahead of time. So thank you, city council. I know I sound a little upset about it, but I'm getting text messages constantly net right now from people that are going, why are, why are we not being able to be heard tonight? I have children I need to put to bed. My food's burning. And so please move up agenda item 6A so that the people can be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamish. The next speaker with the raised hand is E. Barry Haldeman. Hey, Barry, are you available? You're... I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you just fine, Barry. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to make one comment. I think we should have others up here besides Southern California Edison. There is the cell phone companies. They have a duty as a public utility to to have backup batteries on the cell towers. And even though they apparently brought in something into central Malibu to help boost some signals, it certainly didn't make it up to Latigo. And I'm, I would guess it didn't make it up to Point Doom. So all of us were without cell phone protection. And I think they should be up here if they're allowed to operate in Malibu to explain themselves as Southern California has had to. And I think that the city should lean on them to work with Southern California Edison and uh, the city and remedy this issue of the cell towers going out. Because supposedly there were backup batteries that were planned for the cell towers, but nothing seemed to happen. So I would urge that the council invite, if not respectively order, the self companies that service here to come before you and explain what happened with them. Thank you very much. Thank you for the suggestion, Barry. The next speaker with a raised hand is Marissa Coughlin. Marissa, you should see a pop up asking you to unmute. Uh, we can try circling back to Marissa in a moment and hear from Craig Hill now. Okay. Craig, are you available? 
Oh, hi. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, there were strong winds elsewhere, but in Big Rock, which is segment two of the Nicholas circuit, gusts never came close to the 46 mile an hour minimum threshold for PSPS. We had max gusts, actual and forecast of 35 when the power was shut off. And within a few hours, the wind was almost zero, yet the power was off for another 37 hours, what I counted. That, that sounds to me like negligence. So one question is, can SCE better distinguish among the different circuits? We have different conditions. Um, meanwhile, on Thanksgiving, I discovered that the emergency phone numbers for both Waterworks and Edison were not answering. I waited on hold for an hour and two and a half hours, respectively, till finally hanging up. SDE's message noted that workers were off for the holidays, but emergencies don't take holidays off, and indeed holiday cooking causes more fires than usual. So the public needs utilities to be contactable within minutes at all times. Um, SCE, can this be improved? And City Council, can we share this concern with CPUC and Henry Stern? Meanwhile, I compared some notes with some deputies about PCH. There was a lot of unconscionable chaos uh, involving the lack of portable stop signs, car crashes. Hopefully that will be fixed the next time. But still what should happen is that Edison should reimburse the whole cost of the signage rollout and the signal generators since they called the PSPS. They should be liable for all anticipated costs. And more generally, the PSPS spreads out large costs among Edison customers in the form of spoiled food, generator costs, accidents, some residents needing alternate lodging, et cetera all to save on their own hypothetical liability costs. If they were made to feel more of the actual costs incurred by everyone, they'd sooner see the bargain represented by some mix of undergrounding and covered conductor wires. So can we, can we have SCE cover more of the actual costs? That would create some incentive. Um, I would urge anybody who was in an area where the wind didn't reach the peak speeds to file a damage claim, even if it's just 150 bucks for what was in your fridge. And uh, I have a few other comments on other things, but I will save them and maybe I'll get called back later. I don't know. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker with a raised hand mm -hmm. is uh, Aro Hanian. And I know Marissa is working with our media staff right now, so we'll be able to get her connected soon. Great. Ara, are you available? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, we uh, live in Malibu Park area, and uh, I don't want to go on details. Uh, we were probably the last group that the power came back to us after 24 hours that the wind had died down. Uh, Spectrum and Verizon, we called them, both told us that uh, the reason we lost all sorts of communication is because of power. Apparently, their uh, generators ran out of fuel. Uh, I think we're lacking short-term uh, short and long-term planning by our utility companies. Uh, thanks to the city of Malibu for their foresight to install temporary generators at most traffic lights. They certainly saved lives by avoiding major accidents or cars running over people in dark. Uh, what can be done short-term? Some of the, the people talked about this. I think there should be a task force made of city public safety, representatives of utility companies, including power, cellular, fiber optics, and telephone, and residents of Malibu from different areas. City can mandate cellular and fiber optic companies to have generators at the cell towers and node with capacity of at least 72 hours, or they should be refueled to last at least 72 hours. I have calculated the entire city of Malibu, there would be only 16 nodes to power up. The um, spectrum ran out about six, seven hours after the power was shut down. So that's one temporary steps that we can take. Uh, city, city can mandate Edison to have maximum one hour after winds die down to restore power. I've lived in two other Southern California cities and power was always restored within 30 minutes. Edison lacked sufficient crews to inspect the lines within 30 minutes to turn power back on. There should be a measure on what level of wind mile per hour is safe and below that triggers the one hour time limit for Edison to restore power. 
addition should deploy sufficient crew to inspect the lines within 21 miles long Malibu area in 30 minutes. That's probably three, four uh, trucks. Thereafter, they should turn power back on. There should be penalty payable to the city of Malibu if they fail to do so. Edison should provide accurate information and update, updated information. Edison customer service would put us on hold and then tell us they tried operations and maintenance and they cannot get an answer. That's short-term results. So we, we can communicate in case we need, we have an emergency situation. Undergrounding is the only solution to address all types of hazard, to avoid power shutdowns. Pacific Gas and Electric in July of 2021 announced they will take 10,000 miles of power right. lines that underground. Pardon me? Thank that, you. That was, your time. that was three minutes. Can I resume my time? Because my son has also signed up. Mayor Grisanti, would you like me to call his son next? Please call his son. Next is Armin Ohanian. May I talk on his behalf? He's trying to connect. Okay, let's go. Armin, you're unmuted as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me, uh, I'll make one here. So let me. Um... One of you needs to mute. Okay, I'm muted. Okay. So, Anybody there? Um, yes, we're here. Okay, so. Undergrounding is the only solution. Uh, and uh, Pacific Gas and Electric in July 2021 announced they will take 10,000 miles of power lines underground. Edison can ask for federal and state government help for such a task. And uh, some of you people address that. If Pacific Gas and Electric is able to take 10,000 miles of power lines underground, Edison should be able to take 21 to 50 miles of power lines underground. High winds is way of life in Mali, but we can't avoid that. We can't just have band-aids. We should think this uh, as a permanent solution. If Edison doesn't cooperate, the city, if legally warranted, can take over Edison lines and grids through condemnation. City can request for proposals from independent utility companies to provide power to the city of Mali. Simultaneously, the city can start the condemnation proceedings to take the electric lines and grids within the city of Malibu for public safety. The new utility company will acquire the Edison lines and grids through condemnation proceedings, therefore no impact to the city financially. I hope this is the last resort, however, it should be considered. Residents of Malibu must be able to dial 911 in case of emergency. I mean, medical and uh, 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 safety comes first. We all hear bandit situation. They they strengthen the lines and all that. It seems like Edison is not considering undergrounding. That's the only solution. They should think about it. All the liabilities and uh, losses that they've had that they paid for, this addresses all that. I would appreciate if they can have come back to the city and come up with a solution how they would take these lines underground. Thank you for giving me the, uh, the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Armin. Thank okay. you, Aura. And uh, the next raised hand is someone under the name Admin. Hopefully they can give us their name when they're unmuted and then we'll try to circle back to Marissa. Hi guys, it's Howard Redsky. I don't know why it comes up as Admin. Sorry about that. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi, Howard. Hey, okay, I, I'm going to be blunt because time is short. First, thanks to the people from Edison, but they're just the sacrificial lambs. Their bosses should have come that, make and, that can make the big decisions. Their bosses and they know what we want. It's not a secret. And, you know, the people that have asked questions that they've answered, it's just excuses, excuses, band-aids, double speak. You know, in they don't have the ability really to do what we all know is necessary. The only way I feel to do to deal with it is that if we band together with Calabasas, Agura, local and state representatives and our lobbyists, 
and we create a fining system <laughs> for shutoffs. That will make it not financially practical for them to occur and give them incentive to underground. SCE makes a financial decision. It's more cost effective to shut the power than fix the problem. We have to change that equation, period. You know, for us to make all these suggestions, you know, it's great. But we all know what needs to be done. And the only way they're going to do it is if it's financially feasible or practical or more advantageous for them to do it, period. They've been talking about this for 20 years, and they've done very little. And it's really nice to say that you're going to move the power here and move the power there, but this is all just a Band-Aid, and it didn't work. <laughs> the biggest thing is in a wind like we just had, it didn't work. So that's all I have to say. Thank you guys for listening. There wasn't a question for them there. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Howard. And now we'll try to circle back to Marissa. Hi, Marissa, are you there? Here's something. Marissa, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. I know she's on the phone right now with our staff trying to help her through it. Let's try to hear from the next speaker while they still sure. work on that. Uh, we have someone signed up under Joey and Evelyn. I think that might be uh, Joey Amini, but they will let us know. Hi, Joey. Hi, this is Joey Amini, and I'm very sorry to interject, but I'm a very concerned Malibu parent. And I don't know if you guys happen to hear what Hamish said, but you have about 50, 60 parents waiting for, I don't know how long to get to our really, really important issue. We have kids to put to sleep. And um, this was supposed to be a special agenda uh, for our purposes. And I know that you had a previous meeting that was um, postponed due to, I don't know what it was. Actually, I don't even think there was a power outage, but I guess there was during that time. There was. There was a power outage. In any case, you have about 50, 60 parents waiting here. So we'd really appreciate you get to our item as soon as possible because we have kids to put to bed. I know none of you have kids, but um, we need our chance to speak our voices. So please be fair to us. Thank you. I have about 15 texts going on right now and people are Curious. Thank you. The Thank next you. speaker with a hand raise, we have Lance Simmons. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I know we've got uh, uh, some discouraged parents waiting, so I'll try to be as quickly as I can. Um, evidently, and this has been happening for the years that I've been involved in Malibu uh, issues, uh, undergrounding is uh, at least a viable option for the long term. And we have an excellent opportunity right now because we're going to have somewhere between one and three trillion dollars of physical infrastructure funds coming from federal government. So we ought to secure the assistance of the lobbyists that we pay for in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C. to do everything in their power to figure out how we can access federal funds to get this done. It needs to get done, and it's not going to happen overnight, but we got to start thinking long term here. And uh, I think we've got an excellent opportunity. So. Uh, I would uh, I would implore the city council to um, do everything they can to try to uh, access some of this federal money, which is going to be available. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. Do we have any other speakers under item 2A? We do have um, approximately 18 speakers. Sorry, I don't have the count view at this moment, so I can start calling them. We'll hear from Joe Drummond next, followed by Norm Haney and then Dana Grolick. Okay. And Joe, you should see a pop-up now asking you to unmute. 
Hi there, can you hear me? We can hear you. Honorable City Council, as Fire Safety Council liaisons for our community, my husband and I are signed up to receive PSPS notifications for all our county areas. We never ever received any PSPS notifications for Malibu, only Cuthbert on Wednesday at 6.48 p.m. Why not? After going to sleep, we received an email Thursday at 12.26 a.m. that there would be a possible power shutoff for our address. Then at 2.13 a.m., we received another email telling us the power was shut off. From then until the morning, all the food being stored in both our fridges spoiled, and we contacted our electrician in the morning about installing a portable rented generator, which cost us over $1,000, as we had guests in town for Thanksgiving and needed medication refrigerated. Needless to say, Thanksgiving happened without turkey, but being able to at least run one fridge oven and the TV on the portable generator. We filed the claim with SCE for the cost as the wind died down, as people said, at 11, by 11 a.m. on Thanksgiving in Big Rock, well below the threshold of 31 miles per hour or 46 miles per hour gusts. In fact, the winds were high when the power was not shut off. They shut off the power too late and did not turn it on soon enough. And with no warning where we could have purchased a portable generator for less than the one day rental cost and be prepared for the holiday. Many, many hours were spent on Thanksgiving Day on hold with SCA to finally reach supervisors to repeatedly tell them that we were well below the wind and humidity thresholds they set for PSPS and that Big Rock's water supply depends on electricity. Why does it take so long? On Thursday evening at 9.19 p.m., I finally received an email saying our power will be restored soon. However, when we awoke in the morning, the power was still off. Apparently, the lines needed to be inspected during the day. On Twitter, SCE posted, patrolling circuits can take hours for a trouble man on foot. With the drone, it can be accomplished in minutes. Learn how our crews are equipped with drone technology to keep our community safe. Where were the drones in Malibu? I emailed and talked to David Ford, our local government relations manager for SCE, finally on Friday morning at 9 a.m. when he asked me to contact him on anything related to restoring power after emailing our SCA liaison the night before. Finally, five hours later, a little after 2 p.m., our power was restored. 24 hours, way too long. We need you to city council to ensure that power is not only is only out when it is indeed only necessary, but moreover, encourage the burying and insulating of power lines so that these needless power outages are no more. As Stephen Lance stated, the Biden infrastructure plan has allocated funds to state with wildfire issues that need undergrounding of power lines. So we need some kind of committee to deal with SCE and the government and push SCE to take care of this. Our family will not be the only ones to put a claim of over $1,000 to SCE. If 50,000 people submitted claims, that would be $50 million they would have to pay out for their negligence in not turning on the power fast enough and upgrading the grid. To pay back to every overlong power outage is a fraction of the cost of undergrounding lines. Please let us know what the city can do to end needless power shutoffs and why we could not intervene on our behalf to get the power back on when the winds died down the morning of Thanksgiving. There must be a weather station at the city monitoring these things. We need one located in Big Rock. Also, SCE needs to give a rebate to anyone who buys only a generator with, to withstand their PSP outages if they aren't refunding us for lost days of power. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And Mayor Grisanti, we do have Marissa connected now, so we'll hear from her and then go back to Norm Haney. Hi, Marissa. Hi, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Oh, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay, but I think I'm calling through Dubai. I'm not sure. Oh, only four hours it's taken me to get to speak to you. Five bullet points. Uh, the last, uh, not this immediate past one, but the last year's uh, shut off. Um, I have a, uh, someone in my family who's on medical equipment. I called. The doctor sent a letter to Edison. I got a generator. Two days later, they came and picked it up because they said they needed a back because they have a lot of people that need them. And I said, well, what was the point of a doctor letter if someone who has to be connected to power for medical reasons, 24-7, 365, doesn't have power, number one. Number two, um, the Edison, none of the – if you have no power, obviously, the brightest bulb in the lamp. If you have no power, you get none of the text messages or anything from either the city or the utility. Three, uh, the Public Utilities Commission – dictates how and when they can turn their power shut off. They work together, the lobbyists. I was up there, they already have them working. Um, if Edison wants to pay for this, and 47 years ago, Edison had the money to underground. I worked on it back then, and they spent the money elsewhere, and they didn't underground. I totally uh, agree with uh, Councilwoman Farrar about it, and Councilman uh, Silverstein, it should be done and done now. Um, for medical reasons, most we have 40 people just in the point that are on medical equipment. 
to go into, I had to go down to Pepperdine to report to doctors many times during the shutoffs. I don't care about the food and all that. Um, also, the if they want to learn how to, to do it, read about the Mackinac Bridge. In 1957, the government wouldn't give them money to build the Mackinac Bridge. They sold bonds. In 1957, 1954, excuse me, it was finished in 57. They raised, sold bonds, $98 million worth of bonds, and took them three years to do it. Have Edison use that as a model. They might learn something. Um, let me say, I think that might be it, money. Oh, and this is my 16th fire. And probably, except for <laughs> Councilman Uring, the rest of you weren't alive. But um, I, this is the 16th fire, so I don't want to hear the same stuff. The messages don't come through. One client of mine got $22 million from Edison in his settlement. So that could have probably helped a lot towards ours, but I don't know where our money is. Um, and rebate. Oh, yeah, and the generator rebates. For people that can't put um, Jerax or Generax in or anything like that, there has to be some proactive way to help people, medically older, whatever, or just because they want to cook a turkey, have power. Undergrounding, they have to go, and I would be more than happy to uh, volunteer my professional experience after 50 years of doing planning and development all over the country and outside the country to assist the city in any way I can Marissa, to effectuate time. this. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. Okay, next we'll hear from Norm Haney, followed by Dana Grolick and Susan A. Hey, Norm. Are you there? Yes, I am. Actually, uh, I concur uh, with what Marissa just said. And I also agree uh, with Karen. Uh, I think that the um, the um, electrical company should sell bonds and start undergrounding their system. The quicker they start, the quicker they'll finish. And I agree that it is the only legitimate solution uh, to Malibu's problem. We're an isolated small community um, and people need to have communication. Uh, they need to have a uh, consistent electrical uh, current that they can rely on. Having said that, that's it. There's a way to do it. They just need to do it. And, and you know, like a lot of other companies that want to make as much money as they can possibly make, they simply are going to put it off as long as they possibly can until they're forced to do it. So um, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Norm. We appreciate your brevity. Our next speaker is Dana Grolick, followed by Susan A. and Armadi May. Hey, thank you. Dana, can you hear us? Dana? I'm sorry. Um, I thought you said Dana Grolick. I'm Dana Bird. I think you got the wrong. Hello? Uh, All right, then we don't have Dana Grolick in the meeting. We just have that. Uh... Yeah, she, oh, I there's... Think she was on earlier. I want to speak on the next, on item 6A. So um, thank you. you know, we'll come back to you. I'm, I'm here, Dana, <laughs> Dana Grolick. Um, Hi, Dana. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to keep this brief and I'm not going to talk about SCE. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to share my appreciation for city staffers, Christine Wood, Steve McClary, Elizabeth Shavelson, and consultants Judy Chasen, Holly Preeb Satello, and council members Ferrer and Pearson for an engaging and stimulating brainstorming session for the Malibu, Malibu Unified School District. Um, using the themes and hopes expressed by over 500 members of our community in the city survey, we broke into smaller groups to conceptualize mission and vision statements and discuss pillars of education and how to incorporate the richness of our local resources into an aspirational picture of what our independent district should look like. We need everyone in Malibu to contribute to the success of this mission. If you can re be involved in any way, please reach out, but if you can't, um, when the time comes, please show up and vote. 
this is an arduous uphill battle, but the future of Malibu will be formed by the young minds we stimulate and challenge today. Uh, keep that in mind as we water the seeds that will help continue to grow Malibu as the vibrant community we all love. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And I don't see Susan A. in the meeting, so we'll try to circle back and hear from Armadi May now, followed by Laura St. John and Josh Alpert. Hi, Armadi, are you there? Hi, yes. I'm here, and I'm trying to get my video started, but I don't know if it's working, but can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so I'm a Malibu resident, and I'm very concerned about the proposed mandates for children to be forced to be vaccinated against COVID-19 to attend in-person school. It's already been shown to cause severe side effects, including cardiovascular issues like myocarditis, strokes, clots, and there's been a numerous VAERS reports of over 17,000 cases of, of people dying from this COVID injection, which is actually more than all of the other VAERS deaths from the past 30 years combined. So this is an extremely dangerous vaccine. And the fact that it's now being proposed to be mandated on children is extremely concerning. Children should have a right to an education without being subjected to an experimental procedure when this is a condition that is actually completely survivable by children it's got a, a survival rate of over 99.9 percent .9 for that age group there are also remedies that have been censored such as hydroxychloroquine ivermectin and many other uh, valid safe effective treatments which is documented in the documentary seeing 2020 which uh, features America's frontline doctors and many other sound medical professionals who have documented that this is an effective treatment, the hydroxychloroquine as, as one of the effective treatments. So the fact that this is uh, being proposed is very concerning. I really am urging that the mayor send a letter to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, urging an opposition uh, to the vaccine mandate for kids to be allowed to have in-person training. We should allow all children equal access to an education. Already in the last 20 months, many children have fallen behind. The suicide rate has doubled. Mental illness has skyrocketed. There's been no addressing of these concerns, yet this COVID scenario has been amplified a lot of scaremongering in the mainstream news media without actual real solutions, not to mention the fact that asymptomatic transmission is not actually how this manifests. The proposed idea that that was the case is completely erroneous, and it, it has no basis in science. Our matey, yes. I'm, I'm sorry to do this, but this is for item 2A, which is okay, items well, I, that are not on the agenda. Yeah, I, I've been waiting. And, and we will not allow anyone else to speak about this subject until we get to that that item. Okay. Okay. So if we have anybody else who wants to talk about something that is not on the agenda, this is the time to do it. But if you're going to just raise your hand and pretend that you are, we're going to cut you right off because... We have other things that we need to get done, and I'm sorry to do this, but if if we do it, we, the agenda was printed in advance. People should follow the agenda, because otherwise we don't have a hope of accomplishing anything. Do we have anyone else for item 2A? We do, um, if you give me a moment, I can, we have 13 more speakers who are signed up for 2A. Uh, the next would be Laura St. John. Okay. Um, is Hi. Hi. I, resub I resubmitted my uh, name under the appropriate number after I did 2A by mistake. Thank you very much. Can we go to the next person, please? Yes, that would be Josh Alpert. Hi, Josh. Are you in the right uh, thing? 
Josh, you should see a pop up ask you to. Yeah, unmute. got it. Thank you. Uh, I, I also uh, clicked on the wrong button, but I also clicked on 6A. Can you just confirm that you have me for 6A? I will confirm that for you, Josh. We have about 80 speakers for 6A, so it'll take me a moment, but I'll make sure you're on there. Next, it would be Troy Schmidt, but I don't see him in the meeting. Let's see if we have Nick Shapiro, and we do. We'll ask him to unmute as well. Hi, I'm supposed to be on 6A. Thank you very much. Do we Next, have anybody else? Carmen Tonarelli. Carmen, you should see a pop-up asking you to Carmen. unmute. Oh, where am I? Where am I? If, if you are we hear you, Carmen. On 2A. Oh, I'm here. You can hear me? Oh, awesome. Okay, now I'm also 6A. We're all waiting. Thank you very much. Okay, next would be Clyde Lane. And Clyde, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Hello there. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Clyde. Okay, great. Okay, I, um, do you know what? I, and I'm really sorry for this if I signed up in the wrong place. I, I thought I had signed up to speak about the vaccine mandates. Is that correct? That's item 6A, please. Okay, we'll come back sorry. To you. Yeah. So sorry. Steve, did you need to jump in before I keep calling speakers? Yeah, I apologize, Mr. Mayor, member of the council. I, I know we have a huge number of people signed up later on tonight. Um, it, it might be helpful there if perhaps, Mr. Mayor, you could suggest that all those folks uh, take down their hands and only raise back up if they are uh, for the public comment item. Uh, I also might just propose, a, again, we have a, a number of business items yet, and I know uh, large number of people signed up for item 6A. So I don't know if council wants to consider perhaps taking a short break after oral communications and moving that item up. Uh, I would also just throw out um, the council, I believe does have the option of um, you could pause on the public communications and bring that back uh, later in the meeting. I believe that's an option that you might want to consider as well. Thank you. What I'd we like have, to we go have ahead. About six more speakers on this list that haven't been called yet. If they're okay, and if they want to talk about 6A, we're going to have to shut them off. Yes, next would be Andy Lyon. Hey, Andy. Do you want to talk about yes. 2A or 6A? 2A. 2A. Okay, we're ready to hear you. <clears throat> um, first of all, I just want to say the this wasn't the first power, you know, shut off. And what what kind of responsibility is the city taking? The fact that we see uh, even one stoplight that was unmanned and out is unacceptable. So at some point, I see you guys pointing the finger at SCE, but you know this isn't. You're acting like this was the first time this happened. And wait, how did the what did who, you know, what is the city doing? Was the city on vacation too? I I I just. You know, I drove around trying to get cell service. I drove the length of Malibu. There were so many unmanned and out stoplights. The city manager, whoever, if it's temporary or, or hire Ryan Embry, because he seems to be like the man, just something has to be done where you guys are ahead of this because SE is not doing anything. So at least when it goes out, we've got to be safe. That we, I almost got rear-ended a couple of times just doing the right thing and stopping at a stop sign. So that's all I want to say. And also, please move up 6A so that all these parents... Thank you, Andy. Thank you. And I will tell you that on, on uh, the night before Thanksgiving, right after the power went out, I went up and cruised PCH. The battery backups were working. They were exhausted during the night in the morning. Uh, we we put 10, uh, 10 different uh, generators out and got them up and working again. It should be the same for the cell service too. There should be no excuse that we're out of out of cell. There should be generators for cell service, just like generators for the stop signs. This is unacceptable to not have any kind of communication. It just brings back PTSD of being hung out to dry during Woolsey. It's not fair to us. I mean, it's, I, I don't want to be left here and wondering if there's a fire coming, which direction, what what's going on. It's worse. It's like what Scott said. It's worse than 
than having having the fire start not knowing thanks thank you andy next speaker on our list is georgia goldfarb but i don't see her in the meeting so we'll hear from walter zeltman if he intends to speak on 2a hi mr zeltman i'm here uh and my wife georgia uh We'll be right in. I'll, I'll get her and you can call her in a moment. Let's, you're on the phone. Talk okay. to us. I, I'm on. I will. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time. I really want to ask uh, uh, the representatives from Edison a question. And it's this. I've rarely seen such unanimity on this council on, on the issue of undergrounding. And I think that's worthy of taking note. Um, and I really want to hear from Edison. What have they learned? out of listening to all of us for the last hour and a half? And are they willing to participate in a serious, immediate discussion about what to do about undergrounding, what it will cost, how to pay for it, how to spread that cost, whether it's them or whether it's spread over Malibu and surrounding areas or the whole state or the nation through federal government funding? I want to hear how they want to address it because I think it has to be addressed. That We all know it's the uh, only solution and I'm not going to talk about 6A, but I want to say this vaccines are the only solution. Anyway, I'm a professor of public health. I had to get that in. Anyway, here's my wife. So if, if you want to have her, she can, Georgia can go right now. We'll roll right into her. Yeah, sorry, my computer, oops, my computer connection isn't uh, working properly. Um, so, okay, oh my goodness, you already started me. Okay. Um, yeah. Edison's poorly devised PSPS plan presents a high level of risk for our community. As we have seen, high fire hazard conditions can last for several days and have become longer and more frequent by Edison's own admission with climate change. Um, so how do we address this uh, in the best way? Well, to stop wildfire in the chaparral, we must address ignition points. They are all virtually caused by human. Um, the most common cause of wildfire in the chaparral is electrical equipment. And the only measure that will eliminate this cause is undergrounding. All other measures are poorly effective mitigation. Let's compare companies' plans. PG&E has 10,000 miles of undergrounding plant. SCE has 17 miles committed over the next two to three years in their entire service area which is 50,000 square miles. San Diego Gas and Electric has several solar-backed microgrids with undergrounding already implemented and a number of others planned. I am not aware of any that SCE has planned. SCE's solution is to cut more trees than was originally planned in the first two to three years of their five-year plan. This is, in fact, a scientifically unproven measure and is a travesty in our new era of global warming and drought, where heat-related deaths are becoming more common. Trees lower temperature in the surrounding area some 15 degrees. Removing trees and shrubs obviously eliminates this protective effect. Unfortunately, looking to the solution, SCE charges exorbitant amounts to underground wires, which involves digging a trench, adding gravel, and conduit. The actual cost if residents could perform this work contracting uh, on their own might be as little as 10% of SCE charges. For example, 10,000 compared to 100,000 pole to pole. Planning departments in local government and an SCE could administer plans at no charge. And this of course would all be done to the proper specifications. Undergrounding with solar backup for microgrids is the answer that solves the problem. Please, council members, act immediately to permit residents to contract for undergrounding and support subsidies for solar-backed microgrids. I think it's in the infrastructure bill. Trench, gravel, conduit. How much can it cost? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Hans Lutz. Hey, Hans. Hi again, Mayor and Council. Georgia, it costs a lot more than $10,000 a mile, hon. It, I, I mean, I, I love your attitude, but it, you got to look for water mains. Uh, you're on the right track, but it's it's going to be very expensive. Look, um, 
Southern California Edison is under orders from the California Public Utilities Commission to improve its communication during these PSPSs. Their website was wrong for the entire duration of the event. It never once even said that the western part of Mount Galahad was out. It just had us as considered for out the outages. The communications to the public safety providers, the city of Malibu, was wrong for the entire event. The information given to the city was out of date. It didn't have any information. And then you had the nerve to send a truck to Bluffs Park with three guys who could do nothing more than consult the internet, which had wrong maps, and who said, quote, it is our company's policy not to give information on specific circuits, close quote. That is not only an insult to Malibu, it's a violation of what the CPUC told you and what you're committed to do in your, in your WMP. In 2017, I was the only person in the entire state of California who went to San Francisco to testify against PSPSs. Long story short, I upped my legal objection because the CPUC instead enacted these W. MPs, wildlife mitigation programs. One of the programs, one of the parts that Edison is committed to, you've already agreed to, is to give us accurate, up to date information about the exact status of circuits and when they will come back up. You failed miserably. One of the things you promised to do was to use local radio broadcasts to let people know in blacked out areas what the status was. Edison has never lifted a finger to help KBUU. We've been spending tens of thousands of dollars. We're currently begging right now on the internet for donations to build FM boosters so we can convey this emergency information to both sides of Malibu. This is a problem that Southern California Edison created, and they haven't followed through on their commitment to fund us a penny. Now, what should the city of Malibu do? There is an administrative solution, and this WMP is what we created to do that up at the CPUC. The city of Malibu can file an objection with the, with the CPUC uh, uh, and a request an, for an order instituting an investigation, an OII. It's what I did in 2008 on the Malibu Canyon poll situation. Ended up winning $66 million for poll improvements and fines. The city of Malibu should file formal action with the CPUC to demand an investigation into how how PSPSs are occurring, and why Southern California Edison is unable to meet its obligations under Public Utilities Code Section 451 to provide safe and reliable power. A power system that has to be turned off in predictable winds is not safe. A power system that is unsafe in those winds is not reliable. Southern California Edison has flunked, and it's up to the city to go to the CPUC and file these complaints. And I thank you for your consideration. Well, Bruce, Walter, I, I see your hand, Bruce. Yeah, Walter had a question for um, SCE, and I don't think it was a rhetorical question, so I was wondering if he could get an answer. Do we have any anyone from SCE still here? Um, yeah, Bill? SCE is, is definitely still on, and I was taking notes on the public comments, so I heard between Walter and Georgia questions about uh, what are we doing considering with climate change that it's expected that the problem is not going to go away? Um, is that that was one no. question. And then I think Walter might have asked, um, are we willing to have a conversation about undergrounding? Just you want to make sure my notes are, are accurate there. Mayor, I see you nodding your head. That sounds right. Uh, yes, that's I, I remember him saying that. Walt, Bruce, is that what you're speaking to? Yeah, well, th that is what I'm speaking to. So I thought it was a very good question about concrete action and, and, and what's going to happen, not, not what are the options that are available. Right. Well, and so I think as, as Terry mentioned in an answer earlier, um, we are looking at all of the opportunities where undergrounding can, can make the most sense where, where it's feasible or not. And so we're absolutely open to having that conversation, engaging directly with customers on, on your suggestions and, and, um, you know, I think there were some suggestions about, you know, opportunities to reduce the cost estimates that, that we've included in some of our filings. And, and you know, to the extent people have knowledge about other technologies or approaches, you know, we're, we're all ears to have that conversation. Thank you. And now we rejoin our item 2A already in progress. 
Yes, I am just checking the last few speakers. I don't see Robert M. Harris in the meeting. We do have Scott St. John uh, signed up, but his wife had indicated they were speaking on 6A. Good. So then we do have a raised hand now from someone we have not heard from for 2A so far, Joseph uh, Hanavikian. So we'll hear from him and I believe that will be our last speaker. Thank you. Joseph, are you there? I'm here. Um, I'm here, Paul. You know, I'm, I, I'm for 6A. I, I thought I had to raise my hand early. No, no, you don't. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. And with that, I don't see any of the people we missed who we believe may have intended to speak on 2A. So that concludes public comment for items not on the agenda. Okay. And I believe we, we deferred items 2B and 2C to the end of the agenda. So what I have on to you, the motion earlier was to defer item 2C and you do have a commission update. Would you like to move this to the end of the agenda or hear it now? Uh, Mayor, can I make a suggestion? Please do, Mikey. There's, there's a lot of actual tradition at city council when a lot of kids show up for an item to move it forward. And I should have caught that sooner because, but we're not live, so I can't see anybody. Um, I think some of the speakers have a point. When there's a lot of kids involved in an item, I think you should consider, we should consider moving it forward. Thank you, Mayor. All right. How many people do we have signed in for item 6A? We have approximately 88. I do still need to confirm some of those speakers earlier on the correct list. If we go to one minute each, that's still an hour and a half. And I'm, I'm wondering if they don't have some spokespersons because uh, I can't spend four and a half hours right now i think i think asking people to group their messages makes sense i mean I, I think one minute makes sense maybe there's a couple of key spokespeople but uh, I, I defer to you how to handle it but yes i i think uh you know if people can uh support other positions that makes sense other previous speakers all right uh and either way, I think we're going to have to have a, just a quick break before whatever we do next. I think you're absolutely correct. And uh, my phone says it's 9.09, .09, so let's meet back here at 9.20 or 9.19. And uh, do, we, do we have an agreement that we're going to charge into 6A and ask for people to speak for no more than one minute each. Paul, could I make a motion? Please do. Uh, I'd like to move to reorder the agenda from this point forward, put 6A next uh, after the break, and then resume the, uh, the rest of the agenda in order. Um, and, and I do think you're on the right track, one minute per speaker. Otherwise, um, we will not get through the agenda once again. We won't even get through that item. Yeah, so um, that's my suggestion, and I, I agree with you. If uh, speakers are, are planning on saying the same thing, maybe they will find a way to find each other and, um, and uh, choose spokesmen or, or raise their hands in, in uh, agreement with other speakers or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if that works technically. Well, we do have reactions. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll second reaction, that motion. Button. Okay. Do we need a vote of that, Kelsey? Yes, you do. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Well, we already had a we already have a majority, but we didn't have any discussion. Um, and I, so I just want to say that I'm I'm fine with I support reordering the agenda. I don't support cutting off the members of the public at one minute each. I think that given what we've said already, and given that we have an intelligent, responsible community, they will censor themselves to the extent that they can say something in less time than three minutes. I would like to see us start by giving people the full amount of time that they expected coming in here, 
with the understanding that they will do their best to limit their remarks. And if we're 10 or 15 people in and we see that it's not working, we can revisit it. But I, I, I don't think it's right to just arbitrarily shut everybody down to one minute. Some people are going to have more to say than others. I would say that maybe, you know, I know one of the organizers is Hamish. Maybe someone like him could come on and 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 speak a bit for the group because I know they're a bit organized. And that might be a smart way to start out. Maybe they could identify the, the the five people or so if there are that are the more are the spokespeople, so to speak, and give them all the full time at least because I'm sure it's not just Hamish. So let's take our break and come back and and uh, maybe uh, Hamish, if you're out there, maybe text if you be who who should speak for the group. And we'll go. OK. From and, and, and I would like to add, I do. Um, I'm not comfortable with the idea of giving the first, as Bruce said, 10 or 15 people a full three minutes and then the other three quarters of them cutting them off. I, I don't think that's a fair way to do it whatsoever. I agree, Karen, I agree with you. I mean, there, there's, unfortunately, there's no perfect solution Mayor, here. And I was trying to find Silverstein, we, we do still need your vote on the motion on the floor as well. Right. So, well, so I, I have a half, I vote in support of reordering it and I vote against, um, since it was combined, I vote against limiting people to one minute. So the motion as a whole, you would vote against? If it has to be voted on as a whole, then I suppose that's right. Okay. okay. Thank the motion you. carries. All right, uh, 10 minutes from right now is 9.23. We'll see you back here at 9.23. Make sure you're muted and your camera's off. Thank you.
Hey, John. Is that Bruce? Yep. How are you doing? Getting ready. <laughs> We're waiting for Karen. Okay, we are rejoining this meeting already in progress. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand is raised. Thank you, Paul. Um, so two things. First is I, it wasn't clear to me whether we were going to still have um, a report from um, Steve if he has one. And I see that um, Jim Braden has his hand up. I don't know if that's for 6A or I suspect it's not. But um, I don't know if we were going to be having those reports. And the other thing was it occurred to me seeing Walter Zellman's hand up and after hearing his small comment about 6A, Earlier, there are going to be some speakers that may be not part of the mainstream. Not, actually, that's the wrong word, but not part of the masses that we're going to be hearing from. And it seems to me unfair to be giving to be limiting them to the one minute when they're only going to be a minority of them, perhaps, uh, and have the other 70 or so who are going to have the same thing to say. And I don't mean to denigrate that because it's going to be important thing, but it's all going to be from the same standpoint. Anyway, that's my that's my comment. And we hadn't if, thought about it. We hadn't talked about the it. The pros get a minute, the antis get a minute. It's gotta be even. Well the, and, the, the, the point of the point of limiting people to a minute was we suspected everyone's gonna the, have the, the same thing to say. It just seems the wrong. The point of limiting people to a minute is there's a limited amount of time in the universe. And uh and and my universe doesn't allow for four and a half hours for this item. Okay. And the other thing is I, I have been advised, I got a text that Hamish has an idea that may speed this up. And I would love to recognize Hamish if we could do that and uh, hear what he has to say. Uh, good, good evening, Mayor Grisanti. Um, what this is my suggestion is I, I have our uh, a prepared statement, which is our letter we read with with a couple additions to your the agenda item we'd like to add it. I believe if I read that letter and we did a uh, roll call via raise of hands where people just chimed in, said their name, named their children, and then that they agreed with the letter, we could we could move through pretty quickly a majority of 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 the people which would, I think, solve a problem, if that makes sense. It does make sense, Hamish. I think that's a great idea. So why don't we give that a try? Okay. And um, I just... Have you provided so, this city with a copy of the letter? It, it's the original letter we sent you um, two weeks ago, and, and I'll read it again for the public record. And um, what, what we are asking is the, that your letter that you do send be sent not only to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, but also the, to Governor Newsom. And that's for you to decide, but we would like you to do that. And this is the statement that is our letter. We, the city of Malibu, do not support COVID-19 vaccine mandates for children as a prerequisite for attending in-person public school education. Numerous health authorities and media outlets all around the globe are revealing that vaccines are not able to stop transmission, infection, hospitalization, or death. With an undisputed 99.97 recovery rate for children, at this time there is not enough clear evidence to require that children take a medical product with no long-term scientific studies 
until more data is collected that prove long-term efficacy with little or no harmful side effects, the city of Malibu is not in favor of having a mandate enforced upon their children to attend public school at this time. And that is the, the letter we, we are advocating for from the city of Malibu. And um, I believe that the way we wanted to do it is, is as such as this is my name is Hamish Patterson. I have a son, Owl Patterson, who is six years old. And um, if he is unable to be safeguarded from these mandates, will not be attending public school. And um, maybe we could do it like that. So, Kelsey, do you want to just go through everybody in the order they originally signed up? I, and I, I want to warn everybody, the fact that you're raising your hand will not result in you being called out of order. So. Okay, so you would like me to call everyone in the order they signed up, and if they concur yeah, and, with Hamish's statement, they can just state so. Yeah, and if you could do them three at a time, I'd really appreciate it so they know to get ready. Absolutely. Would you like me to set a timer for one minute in case someone has additional comments? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, we'll hear from Brittany uh, Tag, Brian Goldberg, and then Marnie Kamen. Uh, Kamen. Brittany, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you for the time. I just want to say that I'm in agreement with the group at large. I won't take up much time. And I just would like to also say that I think the city of Malibu has always done a great job of supporting um, community members and the individuals and the individualism in our community. And I really think that's what this comes down to is the individual's right to choose what's best for themselves and for their family members. And I hope that the city can be behind that. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Next, we have Brian Goldberg. Hi, Brian. Yeah, hi, my name is Brian Goldberg. Um, I would like to just take it one step further and ask the city of Malibu to ban any mandated medical procedures within the city limits, uh, just as other states have uh, banned mandates from the federal government. I think the city can ban mandates from the uh, state and uh, county as well, um, you know, pro prohibiting, uh, requiring people to prove medical records to enter a business, building, school or area, or to receive a public service or for employment. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next, we'll hear from Marnie Kamins, followed by Andy Lyon and Ian Jameson. Marnie, are you available? Yeah, thank you. I was muted. Um, hi, thanks for, I guess, thanks for <laughs> letting us talk. I wanted to say I'm against the mandate uh, to have, especially the mandate from vaccines for children, the COVID vaccine for children. I'm against it. I'm a Malibu mom. My daughter goes to Webster. Um, I voted for... I voted for some of you guys. I voted voted for you, Bruce, and I voted for you, Karen. And I see um, Steve. I think I see Steve walking his dog a lot. Um, so I'm a community member. My daughter is in kindergarten at Webster, and if these vaccines are mandated to attend public school, basically we wouldn't be able to attend public school. Um, she had a bad reaction to a vaccine in the past. And I've been told that if if that's the case, you don't get any sort of medical uh, way out. And so I'm really against this vaccine. I'm Marnie, that's your time. Thank you, Marnie. Next, we'll hear from Andy Lyon, followed by Ian Jamison and Dana Grolick. Hi, Andy. Yep, Andy Lyon. I have a uh older kids and I have now a younger kid. And as none of you on the council have, I know you have kids, but you don't have kids that are facing this now. I have a four-year-old and the thought that it, at five years old, I would be mandated to get him a shot to go to Webster where I went to school um, is just completely, I, I we won't go. And you can do this. The, the least you can do is this letter. And you should do this letter. Um, there's much more. Like I ran for city council with my son in mind, 
and I came up, you know, with like over 2000 bows and I would be up there saying, absolutely get the press, get everybody out and stop this right now. You know, you've got a lot of people that are, are in support of like separating the schools. And if you don't show that you are behind the kids here, if you've got 80 people. You probably got twice as many of that that Andy, are against this, time. that you need to be Thank leaders, you, not follow. Our next speaker, uh, Ian Jamison, isn't in the meeting. So we'll hear from Dana Grolick, followed by Charlotte Solomon and Joey Amini. Hi, Dana. Hi, um, I actually, my position is kind of on the fence on this one, but I just wanted to make two comments. Um, I have three school-aged children who are all vaccinated because that was the right decision for my family, um, having a multi-generational household. However, um, I wanted to make two points. First, if all of the adults in our community were vaccinated, we'd reach herd immunity without having to turn to vaccinating our children. Second, a mandating vaccines in our schools would push more students into homeschooling environments, further impacting enrollment numbers and bolstering Santa Monica's case against establishing an independent school district here in Malibu. So um, good luck with this decision. I don't think it's a one size fits all. Um, thank you for, for giving me the time. Thank you, Dana. I don't see Charlotte Solomon in the meetings. So we'll try circling back and hear from Joey Amini next, followed by Evelyn Amini and LK. Hi, hey, Joey. Hi, my name is Joey Amini. I'm a resident of Malibu and I have a five-year-old daughter in kindergarten. I'm 100% anti-mandate of any kind. This morning, I was utterly appalled to see the city of Malibu's Instagram post advertising that free COVID vaccinations will be offered at Malibu High School to students. This is just complete insanity, extremely disappointing. It just shows that by holding such a clinic at a local public school that the city doesn't care about the countless proven ill effects of the COVID vaccine on children. As one of many, many concerned Mar Malibu parents, I'm strongly urging you to swiftly send a letter to the SFM USD school board stating that we're against the looming COVID vaccine mandate. There's absolutely no reason at all for mandate to even be considered for the vaccination of a demographic that is proven to be not at all affected by or at risk from COVID. For a well-respected noted authority on this issue, Dr. Anthony Fauci has referred to children as vehicles of spread for COVID. The scientists and physicians around the world have confirmed that Fauci is lying. The push to vaccinate children has nothing to do with their health and everything to do with adding billions of dollars to the bank accounts. Thank you, Joey. Ah. Evelyn Amini is next, followed by LK and Linda Kovex. Evelyn, are you available? I believe she's also on Joey's account. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I strongly believe that um, vaccination decisions are up to parents to make. They know their children's health. They're responsible for them as well as they're responsible for themselves. Um, we are the ones raising them. We know their bodies and we know what's right for them. We pay their medical bills. We deal with the consequences. So it is not the government that's raising our kids. It's the parents. So please let us make um, our choices by ourselves. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Evelyn. I don't see anyone in the meeting under the initials LK or the name Linda Kovacs. So we'll hear from Heather Alfano next, followed by Marlene Suzuki and uh, Barbara Stoy. I'm sorry, Marlene Suzuki. Hi, Heather. Are you available? I'm available. I'd like to request to do my full three minutes because I prepared something for that tonight. Heather, you were kind enough to send us about 75 pages of material. So I'm, I'm confident that you have thought long and hard about what you wanted to say and probably practice it. I, I don't know how to justify it unless we can get two other people to say they won't do it. They won't speak. Does well, my hus yeah, my husband, John Alfano, doesn't need to speak I then. Said. Or uh, Scott St. John will give me his other minute. Okay. Let's do that. Okay. Um, hi, Heather Alfano. I'm a mother of three school-aged children, current nurse at, um, in the ICU at UCLA, and I'm also vaccinated against COVID-19. I'd like to voice my support of our city council sending a letter to the SMMUSD school board in opposition of a vaccine mandate for our children. Rather, we should encourage everyone to follow current individual provider and public health recommendations on their own accord. My job as a bedside nurse in the ICU is to be a patient advocate. 
I am responsible for ensuring that informed consent is upheld for every procedure. It is the duty of public health officials to provide education about the risks and benefits of medical treatments, and it is up to the individual to assess their own need for any medical treatment. I'd like to share some facts. There are 28 million kids in the 5 to 11 age group in the U.S. According to the CDC, there have been 66 COVID-associated deaths in this age group in the past year. Findings from a Lancet study show that fully vaccinated people who came down with COVID infected others in their household at the same rate as unvaccinated people, about 25 percent versus 23 percent. The vaccinated had just as much of a viral load in their upper respiratory tract, making them just as contagious. Children don't need the government's protection from a virus that is less severe to them than existing circulating viruses. They need their childhood back. My son came to me last week and told me that he wants the vaccine so he doesn't have to leave school. This is wrong. Never has my nine-year-old ever stressed about his life or medical choices in the way that he is being forced to right now. No one should agree to a medical treatment as a ticket to live their life. It should be based on data, risk assessment, and a desire to be vaccinated for protection against COVID, period. People must be allowed to self-determine their risk of exposure. Honest leaders should be communicating a few things to their constituents. One, severe cases and hospitalizations appear to be flat. Two, we believe that immunity helps attenuate the spread, but we have a lot of confounding data on that. Three, we want to encourage vaccination, but we need to factor in that some parents have concerns and that must be worked into our models without shame or discrimination. No one should be coerced into taking a vaccine that is not fully approved to attend school. This vaccine functions very similar to the influenza shot, which has never been mandated, only encouraged. This is not to equate COVID with the flu, but it is undeniable that the COVID vaccine does not prevent transmission or infection. It does, however, prevent severe disease and death, much like the flu shot. The vaccines that are on the current mandatory list are such that once a child receives them, they are most likely not going to even contract that disease. Hence why it is not appropriate to lump the COVID shot in with the rest of the mandatory shots. Based on my convictions regarding informed consent and medical freedom, our family would be exiting the public school system if this passes. Please support our community by sending our school board a letter that demands public process be followed. And lastly, let me remind you that no one loves my children more than I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Who's next? I'm trying to identify the next speaker who is present in the meeting. One second. Okay, I don't see uh, Marlene Suzuki or Barbara Stoy, but we can hear from Rowan Storm next. Hi, Rowan, are you available? Rowan, are you available? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes. Um, I would like to say that um, um, I don't have children myself. I don't even live in Malibu. I'm a community person, however, and I very care very much about this mandate. I believe that the children's mandate is absolutely horrific. And I also believe that the mandate for every other human being on this planet is also horrific. And it is leading to uh, more devious and egregious uh, situations on our planet. And therefore, this needs to be stopped immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. Our next speaker would be Consuelo M., but I don't see her in the meeting. So we'll hear from Carla Luna, followed by Aliyah Bonetti and Nick Green. Thank you very much. Carla, are you available? Yes. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I'm very concerned about the vaccine because it has put in my daughter into so much stress. Like she don't, she doesn't. When she goes to school, she was pulled out five times from from her classroom, um, asking her if she wanted to get the vaccine. I mean, at the, I'm just like freaking out already because I feel like kids are being um harassed to get the vaccine, five times being pulled from her classroom. I get phone calls. Uh, um, I don't know from someone from from the school like asking me all the time if she's gonna get the vaccine. Like, I don't, I don't feel like this the vaccine is safe at this point for my for my kids. And um, that's all I can say. Like, it's putting so much pressure on the on the kids already, and 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 they shouldn't be uh, frustrated, like or crying like my daughter is. Carla, that's your time. Thank you very much. 
Our next speaker is Leah Bonetti, followed by Mick Green and Catherine Strange. Hi, Leah, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, everybody. My name is Alea Bonetti, and I'm a Malibu local born and raised. I went to preschool here at the Malibu Jewish Synagogue, Webster Elementary School, and Malibu High School. And I am now a mother to two beautiful girls, and I'm strongly, strongly against this vaccine mandate. It's plain and simple. Our children are our children, not the government's. We have the right to choose what medical procedures we place on our child. That choice should not disrupt their education and socialization. Most importantly, where there's risk, there must be choice. I am here to tell the Malibu City Council that we are awake. The parents are awake, educated, and extremely informed. We choose not to take part in risking our children's life and health on a liability-free experimental vaccine for a virus with a 99% survival rate. We will not comply. Listen to real science, stop the vaccine mandate, and also unmask our children. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you very much, Arlene. I don't see Mick Green in the meeting, so we'll try circling back and hearing from Catherine Strange next, followed by Kathleen Halal and Armiata. I'm sorry, I think we already heard from Armiata. I'm sorry, I'll confirm that before we get there. Thank you, Catherine. Are you available? Trying to unmute. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I just want to remind you all that we do not consent, we the people. You, you actually exist because we pay your salaries and we, all of us, do not comply to this mandate. This is an emergency use authorization. This vaccine, this so-called vaccine is not a vaccine. It's a gene therapy. It has not been properly trialed and we do not comply. We employ you. So please, please listen to our words and stop this nonsense. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I don't see Kathleen Halal in the meeting, but we will hear from Armadi May next, followed by Laura St. John and Jenny Rosinko. Hi, Armadi. Hi. I spoke earlier, but I was, uh, again, on the, the wrong item. But I wanted to emphasize that children have a high rate of recovery from this illness. There's no reason why this should be mandated. I'm strongly opposed to an experimental procedure being imposed on anyone, uh, but particularly children. We don't know what the long-term effects will be on their fertility on their long-term health, on potential for cancer. Already there've been reports of small children falling ill, having seizures, heart problems, collapsing even. Um, young teenagers have fallen on tracks and been deemed to have myocarditis as a result of receiving this injection. So we need to pay attention to what's happening, support parental choice and not allow our blessed city of Malibu to fall to this horrible tyranny. So thank you. Thank you, Arnold Mati. Our next speaker is Laura St. John, followed by Jenny Rosinko and Diana uh, Kinecki. I'm sorry. Hi, Laura, are you available? Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a Malibu mom. My three sons go to Malibu Middle and High School. I believe there's too much information in regards to natural immunity and that mandate ignores this fact as well as other unknown factors that would need to be considered before forcing our children to undergo the vaccine and, uh, you know, that it precludes them from being able to take in-person private school. I'm in support of medical freedom. Uh, we are already looking at out-of-state options because, you know, my students will be withdrawn from Malibu schools if this mandate takes effect. I did just talk to my friend, a good friend of mine that I went to high school with. She lives in Australia. She is beside herself. Her 12-year-old daughter got myocarditis, even as a girl, which is, you know, unusual. And just from the first shot, there's so much stress within her and her family. I look at my sons and we speak at dinner and it's just unbelievable the amount of stress that 
has been, you know, through this entire process, not just the mandate to our children in this community, even being precluded from in-person education here Laura, in California. Oh, Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jenny Rosinko, fo uh, followed by Diana Hinek and Catherine, Kath Katharina uh, Sutter. Are you available, Jenny? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Thank you so much for putting this very important issue on your meeting agenda. I'm a Malibu resident and a parent of three school-aged children. I currently choose to homeschool my children, and even though their education is not under threat at this time, I strongly oppose the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for children as a prerequisite for attending in-person public or private school. I support the letter presented to you by Hamish. Every parent has the right to make independent medical decisions for their children free of coercion, threats, and discrimination. On a more personal level, I know that none of you have school-aged children and thus are not directly affected by this issue, but I ask you, do you value your personal medical freedom? The right to choose medical procedures for yourself as you deem beneficial? If we allow our state to mandate a medical procedure for children by threatening to take away their right to an in-person education, what will be next? Will the next mandate affect you and your freedoms? I would like to see the Malibu City Council stand up for the rights of parents, the rights of Jenny, children. That's your time. Citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. Next, we'll hear from Diana uh, Hinnick, followed by Katharina Sutter and Jessica Caforio. Hi, Diana. Are you available? Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm here to share my concern for the vaccine mandate and the current testing and masking mandate. This has become a state of full-on child abuse where, when children have had a very difficult um, learning year last year and now spend seven hours masked in the school environment. And for what? Uh, in addition, the well-being has been threatened by the vaccine mandate, a vaccine that is serving only the pharmaceutical companies, our corrupt government, and nobody else. So where is the accountability? There are more than 400 studies on the failure of COVID, COVID measures. Uh, we will be taking our four children out of the school district if the mandate gets passed. So I urge you to take a stand for our children and uh, stand on the right side of history. I'm in favor of sending a letter to the uh, SMMUSD Board of Education in opposition of the mandate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Diana. Next, we'll hear from Katharina Sutter, followed by Jessica Caporio and Yelena Pal uh, Palant. Katharina, are you available? Yes, I'm here. Um, to introduce myself, I have an eight-year-old daughter. And um, before I start talking about the, um, the letter, I just want to remind you not to chart the for or against or no um, position boxes that we ticked because most of us misunderstood what means for or what means to be against. Um, so regarding the mandate and the um, letter uh, to be sent to the um, governor, I would like to second everything Heather Alfano said earlier and especially the point on that the va vaccine does not stop the spread of COVID. There has been too much misinformation on that point. Uh, it really does not stop the spread. So I'm in favor of you sending the letter to the governor and the district or board. Thank you, Katharina. Our next speaker is Jessica Caporio, followed by Yelena Blount and Josh Alpert. Hey, Jessica, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for letting me speak. I'm a health and wellness professional myself. I am obviously against the mandate and forcing anything on someone's own body, especially a young child that cannot give their own consent. Anything unnatural you put in your body has side effects. Just turn on your TV. And we don't know the long-term effects of this one yet. And vaccines are definitely not the answer. People that died of COVID died because their immune system failed them. This is the root of the problem. This is not the first virus and it won't be the last. There's already about 70 vaccines. We need to make health a priority. And no one is talking about this, especially as a state that cares, claims to care about health. I was shocked when I saw what the students were eating as a health 
professional myself. Nothing organic, all factory farm food, not even plant-based options. I'll end with a study from Mass General Hospital concluding that those with a healthy plant-based diet were linked to lower risk of COVID as well as severe sy symptoms. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Ne our next speaker is Yelena Pallant, followed by Josh Alpert and Scott Dietrich. Hi, Yelena, are you available? Yes. Why I does she have three minutes? I don't know, but I'll gladly take it. I'm sorry. We have to keep Edison for three hours. The timer is correct on my end. I'll keep track of it and we'll work, we'll work on that. All right, I'll take a minute then. All right, so our children are facing discrimination based on their vaccination status in the time of this push for inclusion, equity, and other talking points. This isn't very inclusive after all, is it? So um, we were also told over and over that the way to get back to normal is through compliance. But as we see over and over again, the most compliant areas are not getting back to normal. So we will put our kids, pull our kids out and we'll be faced with even more already declining student enrollment numbers. I understand that you do not make these guidelines, but you do not have to follow them blindly. As we learned, approximately 44,000 LAUSD students did not meet the deadline to be vaccinated to attend school. And we also know that every child is entitled by law to a free appropriate public education. Many, many lawsuits later, we will tell if those children will be getting what they're supposed to under the Ed Code. But this does not have to be the case. There has been 22 school districts in California alone that voted to rescind Newsom's vaccine mandate. So we're not asking Malibu to do something out of the norm or reinvent the wheel. Yelena, so I'm, I'm sorry, that was a minute. Thank you, Yelena. Our next speaker is Josh Alpert, followed by Scott Dietrich and Christina Adderlini. Hi, Josh. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Josh Alpert, and I'm the parent of three young children who will never be vaccinated uh, for COVID-19. I am very concerned about the experimental COVID vaccine being injected into my children, and I'm also afraid of them being discriminated against for not being vaccinated by uh, their peers in school and around the neighborhood. To be clear, I am not anti-vaccine. I am pro-choice, and I do not believe that the government should be involved in the medical decisions for my children or for anyone else's children, uh, for that matter. There is going to come a day when Gavin Newsom sends down the message that everyone in school needs to have the COVID, the COVID vaccine. But when that day comes, please do not, please do not enforce any COVID uh, vaccine mandates on our kids. If you do, you will leave us with no choice but to leave the public school system. And I'm sure there will be plenty of other parents to follow suit. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Our next speaker is Scott Dietrich, followed by Christina Adderlini and Marianne Bima. Hi, Scott. Are you available? I am unmuted. I am unmuted. And I'm also very tired of all the lies by those pushing this uh, experimental drug. The Pfizer vaccine I took does not prevent me from catching or transmitting COVID-19. The promised 95 percent percent protection dwindles after 140 days. Herd immunity will never happen because I can catch and transmit the virus. The CDC denies the stronger and longer lasting efficacy of those with natural immunity, but now insist we get another vaccine because of the Omicron variant. The South Africans say it's mild. And just look, of the 24 million kids in the United States, 5 to 11, only 0.00005% died with COVID, all with co serious comorbidity. Oh, and if you're a concerned parent wondering if you should have your child vaccinated, just ask, what could go wrong with this experiment? Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next speaker is Christina Adderlini, followed by Marianne Bima and Stella Rowe. Christina, are you available? Yes, I am. Perfect. Hi, um, my name is Christina Anderlini. I am a resident of Malibu and the mother of a six-year-old son. Um, I'm here to say I adamantly oppose any kind of mandate, uh, especially a vaccine mandate for my son to go to school. It is my choice what to decide what his medical decisions are. It's not up to the school or the state. And I strongly support the letter going to the school board and Governor Newsom to stop this madness. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christina. Our next speaker is Marianne Bima, followed by Stella Rowe and Nellie Fay. Hi, Marianne, are you available? Uh, available, yes, I am available. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, I sent a PowerPoint um, presentation earlier. Do you get it? You have it? I see a picture right now. It's on display now. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I would like to tell my story. Uh, I have a 12 years old boy. He was born very healthy. Morgan is a, is an, is an intelligent boy, athlete, athletic, and uh, he has been second in, in, in the mathematics in the United States. So, uh, on November 5th, our life changed because Morgan went to, uh, to, to his pediatrician to, to got the T, the T DAP vaccine, Sanofi. So, because his, uh, his uh, school was pressuring me to update his vaccination. Eight days after, Morgan got into seizure. Thanks to our firefighter, they were here within eight minutes. So we went to the West Hills Hospital. He was diagnosed with... Um, Marianne, that was a minute. Oh, uh, why did I have three minutes? No, only one. I'm oh, sorry. My. Oh, my. I don't see Stella Rowe in the meeting, so we'll hear from Nellie Fay next, followed by Ula Jones and Elizabeth Benichow. Nellie, are you available? Yes, I am. Hi. Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I am a resident of Malibu. I have two kids, uh, six and eight, who attend Malibu Elementary. Um, I oppose the vaccine mandate for kids. Uh, I am vaccinated against COVID. I'm not anti-vax. I just don't believe this is the right decision at this point for our kids. And I therefore strongly oppose it. Um, I hope you will um, support the letter being sent and um, stop this um, attack on our children. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. I don't see Ula Jones or Elizabeth Benichow in the meeting, so we'll try circling back to them and hear from Samantha Bina, followed by David Olson and Melissa Solano. Hi, Samantha, are you available? Yes, hi, good evening. Um, thank you. I spoke on this issue at the last meeting, so I'll make it really brief. Um, please, I beg of you, please um, email this letter, send this letter to the school board and the governor and where there's a risk, there must be a choice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is David Olson, followed by Melissa Solano and Alicia Peak. Hi, David, are you available? Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, uh, I am not an anti-vaxxer in general. I am an attorney, I deal in facts, and I deal in logic. And in light of that, to me, that we're even having a discussion this far into the pandemic about forcing children to take this vaccine is insane. Number one, this demographic is the least vulnerable to COVID. More children drown every year than have died from COVID. Number two, it's not safe. And number three, the whole premise for forcing kids to take a vaccine is to protect other people. We now know that is just not true. Vaccinated can get it and they can spread it. To require parents to take on the risk of death, heart problems, neurological impacts for their kids is appalling. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Our next speaker is Melissa Solano, followed by Alicia Peak and Nicole Garcia. Hi, Melissa. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. Oh, okay. Good evening, City Council and my beloved Malibu community. My name is Melissa Solano, and I'm vaccinated against COVID-19. 
I'm also a proud mama to a preschooler and a grade schooler. I'm an active member of the community, a stakeholder, and a Malibu Elementary School PTA board member. I'm in this for the long haul, put it that way. Um, I support what Hamish and other has to say, and I oppose the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. We should review our factual data and see as a community the great job everyone has been doing to mitigate the risk. Again, I am vaccinated, and two weeks ago I traveled out of state of, for work, and within 48 hours I infected my entire family with COVID. We conquered COVID and only experienced mild symptoms. We did our part, quarantined, and ensure our schools and community remain safe. I understand this is not your jurisdiction, but I plead you to please support us in this effort and make sure that our voices are heard. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Melissa. Our next speaker is Alicia Peak, followed by Nicole Garcia and Robin Dunbar. Hi, Alicia. Are you ready to go? Yeah, hi. Thank you. I just want to say, first of all, it's so nice to be on a meeting where we're actually treated like human beings. So thank you. Um, and thank you for all you do for our community. I'm a fully vaccinated teacher and parent of three school-aged children. I was the first in line to get the vaccine when I could. I'm not here to speak against the vaccine, but to advocate for parents and their children. Children are not suffering at the same rate from this virus and should not have their access to in-person education taken away from them. I, am, I have a fully developed adult, but I'm not comfortable with my five and seven-year-old children receiving the vaccine at this time. I am their mom, and my job is to protect them and keep them safe. This vaccine just came out under emergency authorization. As a critical thinker, I need more time and more research before I will give this to my children. Public education is a right, and kids should, have this, should not have this taken away because their parents want to protect them. I urge you to send the letter to SMMUSD and support a parent's right to protect their children. If this mandate moves forward, I will take my students out of public school and homeschool them without even a question. I also would urge Alicia, this council. Oh, okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Garcia, followed by Robin Dunbar and Jean Peretti. Are you ready, Nicole? Yes, I am. And I wanted to also thank you all for being so respectful and hearing everybody out. I appreciate it. And I have a high, a high school and a middle school, um, two kids in the uh, Malibu School District. And the testing that is going on weekly um, reflects the sheer, just there's no, num there's no COVID. Like the, the numbers of positivity in the school have been so low. And the testing is actually more effective than a mandate that um, requires the vaccine that you can't guarantee will not spread COVID still. I, I think the testing is working and um, we should continue with that is my position. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Kelsey, I was just received a message that Liz Benichu was uh, called earlier and then she was skipped. I don't have anyone under the name of Elizabeth or Benichu. L-I-Z, um, I think, is where you might find her. Okay, then we can call her as Liz now. I'll circle back. All right. Thank you. There you are. Uh, you, she's got three minutes showing there. That's not correct. Parker, please refresh the screen. I'll totally take the three minutes, though. We won't give it to you because I'm a mean person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Elizabeth. It's okay. All right, we're ready. Let's go. Okay, my name is Liz Benishu. I do not have any children yet, um, but I'm working on it. But I do have many friends who do have children in Malibu schools, and I am completely against the vaccine mandate. I'm against mandates of any kind, and I do believe that our children should also be unmasked in schools. The FDA is refusing to bring out any of the information about the um, Pfizer vaccine for another 55 years, which says a lot. I believe that it is up to our parents to choose what they want to do for their children. If you look at states like Florida that have zero mandates and the lowest COVID rates in the nation, that says something huge. Also, I have many friends who have been vaccinated, have gotten COVID worse than anybody else, and as well as problems with their menstrual cycles and infertility. So please consider this. 
for our children because I do believe that there are high, high risks with this vaccine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. And our next speaker is Robin Dunbar, followed by Jean Frett and Charles uh, Cotlier. Uh, hello, can you hear me all right? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, well, my 12 year old son's been enrolled in uh, Santa Monica. My Alba Unified School District his whole life. Uh, COVID-19 and its related mandates, restrictions closed his karate dojo. He was just about to get his black belt after years of dedication. We can no longer enjoy the library we used to go to. We can no longer go to his favorite restaurant. We can no longer go to his favorite movie theater. We can no longer play at his favorite pool and enjoy the diving board. The list goes on. These may seem like small things, but are part of his daily life. Now we cannot go to school without getting a safe pass, daily random testing mandated and a mandated vaccine against COVID-19. As a result of the state, state's uh, COVID uh, response lockdowns and mandates, my mother lost her life. I lost my job of 13 years, and my son's about to uh, uh, basically be forced to be vaccinated. So here's what I got to say. My family, for many generations since the inception of this government, swore an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America and protect our freedoms, citizens, and liberty. I'm here to do that and hold SMMUSD, LA Public Health, and you all accountable for your actions, decisions that directly affect our lives. And I do not like having to wait four time. hours and one minute to speak. Thank you, Robin. We have Jean Frett followed by Charles Cotlier and Troy Schmidt. Hey, Jean, are you available? I'm here. Let's, we're ready for you. Well, I live here in Malibu and I do work with a lot of kids. I don't have kids myself, but I speak on behalf of people that can't speak. And for me, I have to say, liability is a one big thing. And if this thing was so good, then how come on earth nobody, if you get a vaccine, you have, if something happens, you cannot, it's done. You're done for. So the point is this is you have to speak on the behalf of Malibu. That is your job to speak on the behalf of us. Because the point is this is if something happens, it's not on you. It's on the families. We have to live with it. My nephew has autism. He was fine. 23 years ago, he went in and got a vaccine. And I'm for vaccines. But he didn't come out the same. He came out with autism. And we're living with that. That's what I live with because I'm his uncle. And I live with him. Every, I work with him every day. So I just say to you guys, please, please speak on behalf of the community of Malibu. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Jane. Our next speaker is Charles Cotlier, followed by Troy Schmidt and Nick Shapiro. Hi, Charles. Are you ready? Hello? Yes, Charles. Yes, I'm Charles Cotlier. I have a son who's six. Uh, Hamish, you're doing excellent work, man. Please keep it up. Uh, the kids aren't at risk for this, you know? And on what planet? Are we going to use our kids as guinea pigs to protect adults? I'm hearing all this concern about fire and wires going down. Are we going to send our five-year-olds in to fight that fire? Are we going to do that? Would you do that? I don't think we would do that. So enough of this madness. No mandate. No vaccines. Enough. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Who do we have next? Our next speaker is Troy Schmidt, followed by Nick Shapiro. Hi, Troy. Are you available? Yes. Hi, my name is Troy Schmidt. My wife, uh, Lisa, and I have an eight-year-old daughter enrolled in Malibu uh, third grade. Um, I'm here today to voice my strong opposition to taking away our constitutional innate parental rights to choose which vaccines our child, our children will receive unless those vaccines have gone through the proper channels. There are several reasons are, are for our opposition I'd like to outline. First, the legal requirement to implement this mandate has not been met. The California Health and Safety Code clearly lays out that only vaccines that have met, that have been, that have been set out in the California Department of Health's immunization schedule can be a prerequisite for attending in-person school. 
Neither the governor nor the Santa Monica School District nor any other entity has the legal right to unilaterally mandate a vaccine without first having it gone through the Department of Public Health process for a vaccine mandate. The thing I find most frustrating about the push for the mandate is the whole premise made by those who support these mandates. The premise is that the unvaccinated are unnecessarily putting others at risk, and the solution to that risk is the vaccine. However, if the people who are making this argument have followed their own advice and received the COVID-19 vaccine... Roy, that's your time. Sad we get that short cut off. Next Thank is you, Troy. Nick, Shapiro, Nick Shapiro, followed by Car- Carmen Tonarelli and Denise O'Connor. Hi, Nick. Are you available? Uh, yes, I'm available. We're, we can hear you. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to say that I stand with Hamish and everybody here that is against the mandates. I am not a resident of Malibu, but I'm here to speak. For everybody that can't speak, I'm local. I live in Topanga Canyon. I've been deeply affected by these mandates. And I do not believe that our government and in turn our school board should have the authority to mandate what we are or our children put into our bodies. Um, Through our democracy and our right to free speech, we have had the foundation in this country for free discourse and the free and unbounded dissemination of information and for rigorous scientific inquiry. As free adults and citizens of the United States of America, we can arrive at our own conclusions and do what we choose best serve the well-being of ourselves and our children as we see fit, not as the government or the school board sees fit, but as we the people see fit. Giving the government and school boards the authority to mandate what goes into our bodies is a complete assault on our freedoms and our right to sovereignty over our own bodies. Do we really want to surrender our bodily autonomy to the state? Where does this end? Once that is given up, can't it be used for anything to mandate ADD meds okay. and depression meds and any number of procedures and Nick, protocols? Please consider this. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Next is Carmen Tonarelli, followed by Denise O'Connor and Rena uh, Nader. Hi, Carmen. Are you ready? Carmen, are you available? Oh, there we go. Here I am. Can you hear me, guys? We can hear you. Okay, awesome. All right, this is going to sound crazy to you guys, maybe, but I'm actually really excited. And I'm excited and I'm grateful because Malibu has the opportunity to once again stand up and make a statement that will land us on the right side of history. Just like Malibu did in 2017 when we declared ourselves a sanctuary city, we again have the opportunity to be a beacon of light and hope, but not only for our like state or country, but for the world this time. We can be a reminder that bodily autonomy and medical freedom are fundamental rights. We have the opportunity as a city to say that we do not tolerate discrimination. Our public statement as a city is the opportunity to support parents' rights to choose what's best for their children and to show that all people can operate freely in society. So to be clear, we're asking you, our elected officials, to send a letter to the governor and to the school board to support our opposition to the medical vaccine. We're also asking you to declare Malibu a sanctuary city where COVID vaccine is a choice and not a mandate. I really have faith in you guys and thank you for making a stand. Thank you, Carmen. Our next speaker is Denise O'Connor followed by Rena Nadar and Clyde Lane. Hi, Denise. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. My name is Denise O'Connor, and I'm a Malibu parent with boys at Malibu Elementary and Webster Elementary. I am in favor of sending a letter to the school board, the governor, against uh, mandating the vaccine for children in school. I'm not anti-vaccine, and I'm not anti-COVID vaccine. What I'm looking for is the right to choose whether or not to vaccinate our children for COVID-19. I personally will not give my young children a vaccine that we do not yet know the long-term effects of for a virus that we do know does not affect healthy children. If the vaccine mandate does go into effect for schools, I will be pulling my children from the Malibu schools. I ask the city council to please support our Malibu families by sending this letter to the school board and the governor against mandating the vaccine in schools. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Our next speaker is Rena Nadar, followed by Clyde Lane and Mike Moss. Hi, Rena, are you available? Rena? Yes, okay, there it goes. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. released a book this month <laughs> called The Real Anthony Fauci. 
It's a book the entire world should know about and would if there wasn't so much censorship happening in a country based on the principle of free speech. Kennedy has nothing to gain from writing this book and wrote it because, as you know, he values truth and justice. Kennedy includes thousands of scientists in the book who are sounding the alarm about current medical mandates and trying to give real information to the new starved people around the world. Their numbers include Nobel Prize winning immunology researchers and the very inventor of the mRNA and DNA vaccination technologies. I urge you to buy this book while it's still available and read just the first part of it before you make your decision. Personally, I urge you to oppose mandating the COVID vaccine to our children and send Hamish's letter to the school board and the governor. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Our next speaker is Clyde Lane, followed by Mike Moss and Julie Tobias. Hi, Clyde. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for hanging in there. I know it's been a long day for many of you. Uh, I am in 100% complete support uh, with everyone who has spoken from our beautiful, beloved community. Please send this letter to the governor and the school board in support of our collective opposition to a vaccine mandate. Um, I would love to get into a more personal story, but with one minute, that's impossible. And I would like you just to consider that, whether we can bring this up again, because some of people's personal stories, I really wanted to hear, because I feel that's actually where we really learn. Um, I also would humbly beseech you to declare Malibu once again as a sanctuary city. Medical freedom, freedom of choice, parental rights, we are the only ones who can make these choices for our children. They are not slaves of the state. Clyde, and we cannot send them to war. Thank you, Clyde. Our next speaker is Mike Moss, followed by Julie Tobias and Tara uh, Hagiao. Hi, Mike. Are you available? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. Thank you so much for the call. and Thank you, Hamish. Uh, I'm against mandates. I have two children, five and one. I will definitely not vaccinate them, and I'll pull them through school. If the mandate comes, support the letter to Newsom. Let's not forget that pharma assured us that oxycotton was safe and effective, and the FDA labeled it as safe and effective based on pharma studies. Over 600,000 people died from that. Um, now we're supposed to believe that they're suddenly honest and ethical. Now that they have billions of dollars of guaranteed profits with zero liability, I don't think so. These are criminal companies. They're, they're indicted felons. Um, Malibu has an opportunity to protect children, to push back against fascism, and to be a leader on the world stage. And I hope that you do what's right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Our next speaker is Julie Tobias, followed by Tara Hagiog and Marie Claro. Hi, hey, Julie, are you available? Julie, if you're in the meeting under the name Julie, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Okay, we'll try to circle back to Julie at the end and we'll hear from Tara next. Hi Tara, are you available? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I, hi, everyone. I'm so moved by all the parents who are staying up so late to protect their children. Nobody will stand up for and protect our children the way we will. This is about a mother and father's choice regarding what is right for their children. It is our birthright to be truly free in terms of our choice for ourselves and our children. I have a close friend whose beautiful, vibrant 12-year-old has been irreversibly injured by the COVID-19 vaccine. Once able to run and play, she is now bedridden and can no longer walk without aid. 86% of children in vaccine clinical trials were injured by the Pfizer COVID vaccine. One in nine of those children suffered a reaction so severe they were unable to perform daily activities. Given this information, something is terribly wrong with this situation. We must stop this madness immediately and protect our children. Please help us to do this. Thank you so much. And I have one more thing to say. That is your time. This, 
Okay, this is a human rights issue. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Please, please support us parents. Thank you. I don't see Marie Claroux in the meetings. We'll try to circle back and we'll hear from uh, Natalie Lykovec, followed by Drojka Monti and John Alfano. I'm sorry, actually John Alfano uh, deferred his time. So it would be Jake Lingo after that. Thank you. And Natalie, are you ready? I'm ready, yeah. Here, go. All right, I've got three children, elementary, middle, and high school. They have gone through hell and are facing hell every day that they know that this map, this vaccine mandate is up against them. Um, I am strongly against the vaccine mandate for our students to attend in-person learning. I will be pulling them out should the mandates come in effect. I agree with sending the letter as proposed to the school board and the governor, I, I mean, um, and to the governor. So I just ask you all to be brave and stand for our kids. They are our future and they're counting on us to make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Our next speaker is Droj Kamanti, followed by Jake Lingo and Jennifer Alcorn. Droj, are you there? You should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Your hand is raised. Hi, this is Droj Kamanti. Can you hear me? We can hear you. And hear you. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two kids, one at Malibu High School and one at Malibu Middle School, and I am 100% against all mandates. If the vaccine is mandated, my kids will not be attending our public schools. Health decisions for children should be made by parents, not schools, and not government. It should be our right to have a public school education, and this mandate would stop us from having that. Mayor Grisanti, I urge you to send SMM USD a letter opposing the vaccine mandates and also send a letter to Governor Newsom saying the same. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jake Lingo, followed by Jennifer Alarcorn and Katie Day. Hi, Jake. Are you available now? Yes, I am, and thank you for your time, council members. I have a seven-year-old daughter who attends Malibu Elementary and a five-year-old son who I hope to send there next year. I do not support a COVID vaccine mandate for school-aged children. I believe this decision should be live up to the parents and their physicians, not elected officials. Councilmen and women, this isn't a question of whether you or your children should get the COVID-19 vaccine. This is your prerogative, and you have the right to make your decision based on your personal situation and beliefs. The question I believe you should ask yourself is should those that do not want their children vaccinated for COVID-19, for whatever the reason, be mandated to do so in order to attend school? Legally, this question has not been answered and fundamentally, I do not believe in taking away the rights and freedoms of parents' choice. I wanna believe I live in a city that will stand up for its people. I would like to see the Malibu City Council stand up for the rights of parents, the rights of children and the rights of freedom of choice. Please send a clear message to the governor of California by signing a letter stating we will not support mandatory vaccination for COVID-19 for our children. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lingo. Our next speaker is Jennifer Alarcon, followed by Katie Day and Amy Lingo. Jennifer, are you ready? Hello? Yeah, hello. Hi, I have a ninth grader in Santa Monica High School, and I don't support and I'm against the experimental gene therapy mandates for, for our children to attend public school. I ask that you authorize the mayor to send a letter to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education in support of or opposition to a vaccine mandate for students in SMUSD local public schools. As Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wisely says, we have to love our freedom more than we fear a germ. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Day, followed by Amy Lingo and Jessica Isles. Hey, Katie, are you available? Katie, you should see a pop-up. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I'm actually calling and I've been on here for the entire time, four hours from Sacramento. And lots of us got your call and got your message, Hamish. I just want you to know that this is an issue of freedom. There are parents all over the state on this call watching what you're doing tonight. 
We are asking you to be true leaders. You may not want to, when you took this job, I get it, but you have been called. Be on the side of your constituents there in Malibu, please. And if you're still in fear of COVID, there are thousands of us who can point you in the direction of top scientists and doctors who are reporting the uncensored research that there's early treatment for COVID. These kids are not at risk. And guess what? You're not at risk either. They can't pass it to you or the teachers or anybody. They don't get Katie, sick thank enough. Thank you, Katie. Our next speaker is Amy Lingo, followed by Jessica Isles and Jill Hawkins. Hi, Amy. Are you ready? Amy is going to uh, go ahead and pass her time. Thank you again for listening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Lingo family. Thank you. Okay, I'm just confirming the next speaker in the meeting. I think Jessica Isles might be under Steve Isles' account, so we'll try unmuting that. Jessica, are you on the – are you there? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so I'm very much in favor of you sending a letter to the school board and Governor Newsom um, saying that me and all these other people and the rest of Malibu are in are against mandates for a COVID vaccine for children to attend school. Um, also, we are against, well, I am against all forms of mandates for medical procedures. Watch the movie No Mas Bebes, where in the 70s, can you believe it? Um, uh, people of, of color were, um, they, they were actually made sterile by doctors, all done under the cover of, well, it's best for the society, it's best for our community. California has a terrible history of eugenics. Um, I think 29,000 people were um, sterilized because, well, that was in the best interest. Um, we know best. The state knows best. So to deny children access to schools on something you think you know best is wrong. Please don't. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Our next speaker is Jill Hawkins, followed by Christian Shubin and Joy Wilcox. Jill, you should see a pop-up, ask me to unmute. Are you there, Jill? Can we circle back to her, maybe? Hi, Hi. Jill Is Hawkins. Yeah, sorry. Um, um, I'm in favor of you guys uh, riding to Santa Monica Mall School District and stand up for the children. Um, they're using, um, well, the product really needs to work for the person um, using the product. And we know that they don't um, stop transmission. They have the same viral load. They're also using this testing to um, segregate and discriminate against children. Um, their people are testing positive. And it's usually a vaccinated person. They're sending all the unvaccinated kids home the healthy unvaccinated kids home and they're not getting the right to an education. They're sitting home um, doing Google classrooms. Um, please support our children to right to an education and the right to freedom of choice. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. I don't see Christian Shubin in the meeting, so we'll try to circle back and we'll hear from Joy Wilcox next, followed by Heather Neville and Melina Krauss. Hi, Joy. Are you ready? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, hi, city council members. My name is Joy Wilcox. I'm the proud mom of three boys in Malibu schools. Two go to Webster, one goes to Malibu Middle School. I unfortunately will be forced to pull my three kids from the Malibu Public Schools if this mandate goes through. Um, all three of my kids had vaccine reactions and I'm just not going to give them this vaccine. I called Pfizer. They just started testing on five to 11 year olds this past March. I repeat this past March, they just started testing. That is not enough data for me to give them, um, this medical treatment. Um, we're asking, uh, just like Hamish said for, um, Malibu mayor, 
to send a letter to the governor and the school board in support of our opposition to the vaccine mandate. And additionally, I would love for Malibu to become a sanctuary city like they did in 2017, where the COVID vaccine is a choice and not a mandate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joy. Our next speaker is Heather Neville, followed by Melina Krauss and Jessica Tagak. Hi, Heather, are you ready? You've got to adjust the time on her. Parker, please refresh the screen. And Heather, we're trying to unmute you. I believe you're under the name David Neville. You should see a pop-up. Okay, if Heather is not available at the moment, we can try circling back. Yes. Wait, yeah. Hi, sorry. I was actually under Screeching Owl. Should I well, get my own? You have too many things on there. Are you getting feedback, please? Can you try speaking again, Heather? Hello? Hi, can you hear me now? We can. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I am not a Malibu resident. I actually am a Santa Monica resident. And I want to tell you that I appreciate the respect it appears you give your residents. As a Santa Monica resident, the parents who send their children to Santa Monica schools live in absolute terror and fear of retaliation, discrimination, and segregation because of the school administrators there that have imposed um, these draconian rules over us. They won't let us set foot on campus. They retaliate against the parents. They retaliate against the kids. Um, I'm speaking specifically of Superintendent Drotty, Lori Lieberman, John Keene, Principal Fuhrer, and the principal at um, Roosevelt Holiva. Um, if if there's a mandate that goes down, we will be moving hopefully to Malibu. I believe Heather, in the city Heather, of Malibu. Heather. Thank you. I don't see Melina Krauss or Jessica Taggart uh, in the meeting right now. So we'll try to circle back. We'll hear from um, Kim Ford. We just heard from Screeching Owl, which was Heather. So we'll skip that. And then uh, Sally Mislon. Kim, are you available? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Kim Ford. I'm vaccinated and a Malibu resident for the last 12 years and parent of two children ages 7 and 10 attending Malibu Elementary School. I'm speaking tonight to show my support of having the City Council send letters to SMMUSD and Governor Newsom opposing the vaccine mandate. Nearly 100% of children recover from COVID without serious complications. There is not enough research to substantiate giving our children this vaccine. There are several questions concerning possible myocarditis and pericarditis. These are serious concerns. It's nearly certain our children will survive COVID with natural immunity. What's not certain is the short and long-term effects of administering this vaccine to our children. Also worth mentioning is the short-term effectiveness of the vaccine. How many boosters are our children going to get? There really isn't enough data to support this mandate. In conclusion, I strongly support issuing letters of opposition to the vaccine mandate to Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District and Governor Newsom. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thank you, Kim. Our next speaker is Sally Meslon, followed by Claude uh, Nafo and Melissa Chuman. Hi, Sally. Are you available? Hi. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you so much. I'm actually not a resident of, of Malibu or Santa Monica. Um, I have a six-year-old granddaughter at LAUSD. So I'm just here as a member of the community, larger community in, in support of everybody against the mandates. Children are not um, threatened by this illness and this virus. And furthermore, they're not a threat to to others for it. So, you know, the, the emotional abuse that is going on with children in schools is horrible regarding um, what was just spoken about Santa Monica, same things going on in LAUSD and elsewhere. So I, I'm, I'm just supporting everyone and I hope that you will send the letter. Thanks. Thank you, Sally. Our next speaker is Claude uh, Knafo, followed by Melissa Tuman and Alexandra uh, Ellis. Hi, Claude, are you ready? 
Yeah, excellent. You pronounced my name right. Hello, Mayor. Um, I just want to start by saying I support Hamish's letter, and uh, I also support getting rid of the mandates for kids for masks and also the weekly testing. Uh, we have two kids that we pulled out of uh, Webster. I was attacked by Principal Dorati there, and uh, our kids are out of school. We're homeschooling. I also um, want you to send the letter to directly to Superintendent Gerardi, who is uh, a criminal and very crooked, and he's a paid off politician in his uh, post there. Also, Newsom is the most paid off politician that ever hit the planet. Read Robert F. Kennedy's book. And I can tell you this, this is all about big business, pharma, big pharma. Everyone has to open their eyes. It's about money. It has nothing to do about the fake branded COVID flu they call COVID. Nothing at all. Children to vaccinate them. Thank you, critical. Claude. They're all okay, I'm having uh, issues identifying the next several speakers. So at this time, I can't find Melissa Tuman, Alexandra Ellis, uh, Luby, Luba Harris, uh, or Hobby Beeman. So we'll hear from Kimberly Prescott and see who we can circle back to later. Right. Time is wrong. Kimberly, are you ready? Oh, yes. Hi. I'm so sorry. I have two children who attend Malibu Middle School. I'm against vaccine mandates for children. I have had this vaccine. My children have had all of their vaccines except this one. I have genetic pericarditis and myocarditis. This means that my children could also have it from me. Even though our pediatrician and my cardiologist do not recommend for the, my children to have this vaccine, their hands are tied and they cannot give me an exemption for my kids. My choices are to take a risk and give them a lifelong painful heart problem in order for them to go to school or move away from here and go to another state away from their lives, their friends, their family, their father who needs to stay here for his job. And by the way, all of this information is my and my children's private medical information. And it's none of your business. And it should be none of your business. But I'm forced to talk about our private medical conditions to Kimberly, get you. That's your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Tu, followed by Craig Hill and Juliana Reese. Hi, Nancy. Are you available? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I didn't mean to. Okay, sorry. Um, yes, um, I love everything that's been said. I totally please send the letter. Um, I mean, you guys really, anyone that could help us, it's helping yourself. I mean, because we're, I mean, we can't take a chance with the hearts of our and minds of our kids. We're normalizing segregation. We're normalizing abuse. We're normalizing that they don't have a choice. I mean, I, do we want to produce the next generation that, uh, and these are our generation. These are our kids. This is going to not just affect them. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect me. We need as many heroes as we can um, muster up. This is obviously tyranny. If anyone thinks this is anything else, I mean, I don't know what to say. This should have a 10 year, um, 10 years of research. They give it nine months. Um, you know, it's like they said, oh yeah, if everything's going to be back to normal, two weeks to flatten. Come on. I mean, God, it walks like a duck. It's a duck. I mean, we, we don't have to look that far. Follow the science. Yeah, I follow the science. It isn't Fauci. It's Dr. McCalla. It's Dr. You know, so Nancy, many doctors. Yes. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Nancy. Please help us. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Juliana Reese and Amber B. Hi, Craig. Are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, with so much misinformation on all sides, council, please ask your constituents when they're referring to issues of biology, epidemiology, or other sciences to provide verifiable citations like Heather did. Otherwise, heartfelt exhortations mean little when there are others who would assert exactly the opposite. Citations would help focus the debate. As an example, as reported on September 14th, 2021, in the online version of the journal Nature, in the article, The Tangled History of mRNA Vaccines, quote, 
Scientists have been working towards the vaccine since the mid-1960s, with the first clinical trials taking place in 1993, unquote. So they're less experimental than is Facebook. Meanwhile, much debate has shifted to rights, freedoms, etc. Missing from that individual rights perspective is an acknowledgement of the concept of public health. Since the Reagan era, there's been increasingly more talk of individual liberties and less about our respective responsibilities to the public good, or what used to be called the social contract. Our rights are inalienable, but they're also not absolute. One Thank way or the Craig. other, kids... Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Juliana Reese, followed by Amber B., followed by uh, Human Hamadi. Hi, uh, Juliana, are you ready? Hi, I'm ready. I have a 12-year-old son, and we live in Malibu. I am vaccinated. However, I am uh, strongly against the mandates for children. And uh, please help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana. Our next speaker is Amber B., followed by Human Hamadi and uh, Julia Merkel. Hey, Amber, are you prepared? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi. Um, there's so much to be said about this, but really just what I want to say is that uh, my husband and I, we have a 10-year-old daughter who goes to um, a Malibu school, and we are obviously against the mandates, um, and we would pull her if, if they mandated her to get the vaccination shot. Just the two things that I wanted to say, um, my mother is extremely healthy. She is used to working out like three hours a day, and she got her vaccination and she is about 99% immobile. She can't walk. She can't do anything. She sends me pictures of opening a whole water bottle with a uh, pliers. And um, and our cousin just got her first shot, and she hasn't had her menstrual cy- cycle for about five months now. So to tell me that my daughter you know, is at risk if she got the vaccination is just simply untrue. So um, that's really what, uh, what's all I want to say about that. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Amber. Our next speaker is uh, Human Hamadi, followed by Julie Merkel and David Nepple. Hi, Human, are you available? Hi, thanks for unmuting me. Hi, um, happy Hanukkah, by the way, to all of uh, those here who also celebrate. Uh, my name is Human Hamadi. I'm a board certified uh, licensed MD. I'm a PhD research scientist as well with a federal COVID research grant. Uh, I earned my MD at UCLA, my PhD at Caltech. I trained in internal medicine at Stanford, did a surgical residency at Johns Hopkins, a clinical fellowship at Harvard Medical School, a postdoctoral fellowship at MIT, uh, in the research group that cr- uh, created Moderna's technology. Um, I've been on the faculty at USC Medical School. I'm also a founder of two pharmaceutical companies, deal with the FDA weekly. And more importantly, I'm a resident of Santa Monica Midweek and a tax bank property owner uh, at La Costa Beach Club in Malibu, where I'm on the board of as well, and I'm a father of an SMMUSD kindergarten student and very pro-vaccine. Uh, I've been speaking on national TV a few times a week for the last couple of months regarding COVID management, particularly pediatric vaccines. And I want to point, you, point out to you that the FDA's advisory committee, whose meeting minutes are publicly available on the FDA website, I'm happy to send you a link, admitted that because there were only 2,000 kids who received the vaccine, our next speaker is Julie Merkel, followed by David Neville. Uh, and then I believe you actually heard from Amber B. So it'll, and yeah, then we're going to start circling back to people, I think. Let me work that out. And Parker, please refresh the screen. Hi, Julie. Are you available? Julie, if you're in the meeting under the name Julie, you should see a pop up asking you to unmute. We can move on to David Neville and then see if we're able to circle back. Great. Is Mr. Is David Neville available? I am. Hi, everybody. Um, I know you guys have heard all this before, but for some reason, some people just are choosing not to listen. I'm not sure why. Everybody's singing the same tune here. I haven't heard one um, other opposing voice, so I'm not really sure. What else to even say or do? Um, Clearly, children aren't dying from this virus. Why are we putting them at risk with an experimental vaccine? None of this makes any sense. There's so much propaganda and fear and mistrust that we're uh, imposing on our kids. 
I thought that uh, the school district was supposed to be educators. Why aren't we um, teaching them to um, to trust each other and to help each other as opposed to bullying each other? Um, also, if we're really concerned about their health, why aren't we teaching them good eating habits and exercise and getting out and doing things, not being locked in a room and having a mask uh, put on? Thank None you, of this David. makes any sense. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, the last speaker on the list is Melissa Bowden, and then I know we'll be able to circle back to a few people, and we do have some raised hands to hear. Uh, Parker, please refresh the screen. We have raised hands from people who've spoken already, and they have to take their, they have to lower their hands. We'll work on that. There are some raised hands from people we haven't heard from before and who may also be on the speaker list under a different name. Melissa, are you there? can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, it's at 56. Can you do to one minute? <laughs> I haven't started yet. I can only adjust it in 15 second increments. Uh, there. Okay. okay. Start. Okay. So last summer, after months of shutdown, there was a mask mandate for children to play sports. Shane Thomas, a 17 year old at Pally High, wore his mask to play soccer as mandated by both the city and his team. Shane died immediately after practice. Can you imagine the anguish his coach lives with over deciding to hold practice wearing masks in the heat that day? I'm against the vaccine mandates. It's crystal clear the vaccine is not working and it's dangerous. Pharmaceutical companies have a liability shield for the vaccine. They're not liable if someone dies or gets injured after getting it. According to VAERS, there's about 19,000 deaths, 30,000 permanently disabled, 200,000 urgent care visits and hospitalizations, and so on. My question to you all is this. Do you want to accept liability for the thousands of children in Malibu if you vote for this mandate? Can you live with yourselves if even one of them dies or becomes injured? Please ask yourselves that. It's in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, looking for people I know we can circle back to. We have found Lucy Harris in the meeting, so we can hear from her next. Elsie, I think uh, JT iPhone is Julie Tobias. Who... Okay, uh, we'll circle back to that uh, that person next. Gotcha. There's a couple JT that could be. Hi, this is Luba Harris. Hi, can Luba. We can Hi. hear you. <clears throat> oh, good. So I think the governor of California should be really accountable. Um, this is, uh, I understand uh, some people are not agree, but this is coming from uh, um, uh, the governor. And uh, um, I, my heart is aching when I see kids wearing a uh, little five, six, seven years old, walking around Palisade, Santa Monica, and some in Malibu wearing masks and um, they can't even talk, they can't hear each other, and they're frustrated, they take masks. And, and I'm not even uh, talking about, uh, <clears throat> you know, my son is in college, it affected everyone, not just, uh, uh, you know, Malibu schools, but my son went through all the schools here in Malibu. And now, um, so many kids are suffering uh, mentally, and we know all of that um, depressions and suicides, even Luba, no one time. is talking. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then we said we'd hear from JT iPhone next, that may be Julie Tobias or Jessica Ta uh, Taggart. We will see. Hi, it's Julie Tobias. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, I just want to say, um, gosh, thanks for this meeting. I really miss these meetings. I wish they were in person. Um, secondly, I don't have kids currently in any school district. Mine are old and grown up. I really want to stand in support with all these young families. And uh, I feel so sorry that this, these children have had to bear the brunt of this uh, pandemic. Um, and I just really encourage the city council to write this letter to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District and the governor. I've been fighting this school district since 1995. They haven't gotten any better. Um, I just hope they listen to you 
And for everybody who with kids, please take those masks off and um, and please see council write this letter and do the right thing for these parents. Oh. And also, oh, for this is for Craig Hill, um, who said nobody's like citing anything. There's a great article that just came out in The Lancet um, supporting this position of not vaccinating children, it's sort of uh, by Gunter Kaufman from the Robert Koch Institute. So if he wants to look that up, The Lancet was published November 19th. Um, Gunter Kaufman, Robert Koch Institute. So have at it. Okay. And when, you, when, when did this country? Okay, and looking to work through other people who have raised their hands who have not spoken yet. We have Dana not raised her hand back when uh, uh, 2A was on, and we didn't let her speak because it was the wrong time. Would you like to hear from Dana next? Sure, let's hear from Dana. And we've already heard from Clyde, so why is her hand still raised? Uh Hi, I did have um, something to say, but then I wanted to save the time. Um, I'm a Malibu resident and parent of a son in Malibu Middle School. Um, we are not anti-vaxxers. My son has received all the current vaccinations to attend the public school. He has had COVID and has natural immunity, which I guess is not recognized. My mother has verified vax injuries uh, in there. She had a heart attack. She couldn't walk. Um, many families will leave the public schools, including us. It should be the parental choice. We will go back to private schools where the archdiocese and many private schools <clears throat> um, say that it's parents' choice. So please, city council, we ask that you do support us in sending this letter to the school board and the governor and stand up for our children. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. And I know we didn't have Clayton Smith on the list, so we have not heard uh, his comment yet. We must not forget that this virus was created in a bioweapons lab in Wuhan, China. It was financed illegally by Tony Fauci. Its purpose was to engineer sufficient fear to initiate the narrative of the pandemic. The pandemic was intended to frighten us into lining up for the va vaccine, the so-called vaccine. Given this criminal maliciousness, if there has ever been a time to question authority, it is now. If ever there was a time for our local elected officials to show some backbone and stand up for their constituents, that time is now. What we have done to the children of California during this period of time is nothing less than shameful, masking, social distancing, and all the rubbish that went with it. History will judge. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. And the next raised hand, uh, I believe is Hobart's iPhone that made the uh, Hobie Beeman we had on the list. It was. Thank you for the time. Um, I just wanted to say I'm in support of sending the letter to the school district and the governor. Um, I have a young daughter who I would not be sending to public school if there was a vaccine mandate. Um, and I just, it, it's, it's just really difficult for me to understand when our kids are clearly not at risk why we as parents would take steps to put them at risk by putting um, a vaccine in them that is un unproven and, you know, not really tested for any amount of time that I think, you, you know, is, is sufficient. So um, I would appreciate, uh, you know, the, this, this group standing up for our kids and for our community um, for freedom of choice with, with our children. Thank you. Thank you, Hobie. And next is Sandra Lubin. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Obi. Hello, Mayor. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I think at this point in the game, it's kind of late to start imposing mandates for vaccines. The families who are going to get vaccinated and uh, vaccinate their children are already vaccinated. Um, they have the choice now to vaccinate their younger children. The ones that are left are the ones that are either going to, they're going to fight or flight. They're either going to sue the school or they're going to leave. And parents just don't need to be under this stress. And I'm really sorry if any way you're being pressured by other 
uh, politicians to support these mandates, but I know that you were put in this position to do with what your heart says, and I really hope that you stand the ground for all of us. And it's really our only hope. We're all pleading and hoping that Thank you will you, help Sandra. us out. Thank you. Thank you. Next, with a raised hand, is Jennifer Posey. Hi, Jennifer, are you available? Hi, yes, I am. Um, good evening. My name is Jennifer Posey. I have three children, ages 15, 7, and 5. We are not an anti-vax family. My children are fully vaccinated with all vaccines other than COVID, as am I. We are not comfortable with the COVID vaccine. I implore you to send our letter to the governor and the school board in support of our opposition to the vaccine mandate. I am 100% for choice and medical freedom. Anybody who would like to receive the vaccine should be able to, and anybody who would like to not receive the vaccine should not have to. There are so many people who are unable to speak up that they are against this vaccine, and we need you to be the voice for the voiceless. In addition, as Carmen said, would you consider making Malibu a sanctuary city, one that's for choice and that's anti-vaccine mandate? Thank you. I'd also like to say that there's someone that's been waiting to speak for a long time, Joseph Hanov Nikki, and I just want to make sure you see his hand raised. And there were two people that said they would give them his minutes, and that's Charlotte Solomon and Barbara Adler. But neither one of them has their hand raised, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Uh, Joseph is the next raised hand, so we'll hear from him next. Joseph, are you there? Hey, how are you? Uh, thanks for giving me the time. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Joe Hanovnikian. Um, I was trained in internal medicine at LA County, uh, USC, and uh, it was this meeting was brought to my attention by uh, you know a dear friend of mine who has kids in the in the Malibu School District. And, um, you know, I just wanted to come on here and, and, and say that, you know, I've been dealing with SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, for the past couple of years. Uh, we all have. We've all been affected in some way or another with a relative or a friend who's, who's dealt with the virus. Uh, we've all uh, kind of encountered, um, you, you know, the, the, uh, the consequences as a result of that. And uh, as far as where we're at right now, it's, it's pretty clear from, from everyone who's, who's spoken uh, about this, um, the efficacy of this uh this uh, uh therapeutic you know and and um the the role that it's playing for for the children uh, at hand and i mean there's no one who's on the uh you know the wrong side of history who who's given the freedom to parents to to do uh, what they know best uh, with their kids so and forgive me if you have any kind of coercion this culture of coercion's got to end at every echelon society with whether it's the par parents the politicians or, or who who yes, has it that's your time you know, that, that co coercion's got to end thank you joseph our next speaker, who we haven't heard from yet with a raised hand, is Marcelo. Hey, how are you doing? Good evening. Hang in there, Paul. Good evening. Good evening. I'm a parent of a 12-year-old son. He went to OLM for six years. He'll soon be going to Malibu High School. And I just want to say I opposed the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for children as a prerequisite for attending in-person public or private school. And I'm in solidarity with all the other parents. thought they were very eloquent in their statements and I support the statements read by Hamish as well. Every parent has the right to make independent medical decisions for their ch children free from coercion, threats and discrimination. And I'd really appreciate it if you could all stand up for our children and protect them from experimental vaccines. If you get a chance, look up the criminal history of uh, Merck, Bayer, GlaxoKleinSmith, Pfizer, Moderna, and the rest. It's quite impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Merkel. Julie, you've got Hi. two. Hi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear? Oh, hello, Paul. Thank you very much, everyone. I really, really appreciate it. Um, you must be tired. I mean, I know we all are. I have uh, four children. Um, three adult children, one 10 year old, 11 soon in Malibu school. Uh, we moved here seven years ago. We love Malibu, we love our community. Um, I had a child with pericarditis and um, it's devastating on the children and on a family. And we were told when my child had it, that it was extremely rare. It's not something that you usually get. Um, but yeah, I've seen so many 
children coming down with this after having this vaccine and adults. Um, I do believe adults need to make the best choices for themselves medically, what's right for them. I also think we need to make the right choices for our children. I'm not anti-vax, I'm not anti anything. My children have been vaccinated, but I am anti-mandate and I'd love you to send really? this letter That's for okay. us and support us as a community. And I appreciate everybody on the call and the girl that horribly has to keep telling everyone to be quiet. Thank, Thank you so you much. Too. I appreciate Our next speaker is Carrie Swanson. Hi, my name is Carrie, and I'm here just in solidarity with the other parents, um, all fighting for the rights of their children to stay safe. Um, I am in complete agreement with everybody in the uh, not forcing of a vaccine mandate. Uh, my two boys um, do go to school presently and have been affected as many kids were when they were forced to be home and uh, away from in-person learning. We've seen many, many psychological issues with my younger son due to that. And I, I just implore you as our elected officials, the people that we've put in place to keep our kids safe, to, to continue to do that and to listen to the many parents who are speaking out in opposition of this. You've heard it from many of us tonight and I'm one of the last ones to speak, and I just ask that you be an advocate for each one of us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marie Claro. Our last speaker is Marie Claro. I'm trying to identify if there's anyone we can circle back to. We had a few people with unmuting issues. All right. Marie, are you available? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Marika and I'm a Malibu resident and a mother of a four-year-old daughter. I'm against the vaccine mandate. And all I have to say is not one healthy child has died from COVID-19. It's kids who had four to five risk factors, morbid obesity, diabetes, weakened immune systems, kids on chemo, therapy and things like that. There are more studies proving how kids have 0.1% 0, 0 chance of spreading the virus to adults. There's just not enough time and research on the benefits versus harm of the vaccine, especially on kids and the long-term effects. Why do we want to do that to our kids and use them as guinea pigs? We believe where there is risk, there needs to be freedom of choice until there is more proof of benefits versus harm. At this point, it seems like my child is more likely Marie, to be that's your time. vaccine than by COVID. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mariki. I see two hands raised, but they're both people who've spoken. They are, and if you give me just one more moment here, Mayor. I don't think Joe Drummond spoke on this item. I think Joe spoke on a different item, if I'm not mistaken. I can confirm that for you in a moment. I've written down every name. I don't Joe see Joe spoke under 2A, so we have not heard her for this item. We can hear her now. Okay. Hi, sorry, I just wanted to say, given all the public support and support of the opposition to a vaccine mandate for students in SMMUSD, you should send the letters on behalf of residents. As a sanctuary city, we would likely gain rather than lose all these students for our potential separated MUSD. So I send my support on this. And I did personally have a reaction to the vaccine, but it was my choice. And these kids not having a choice is not right. That's all. Thank Thanks. You, Thank you. And Mayor Grisanti, I did search for all of the people that we missed earlier and confirmed that I still can't find them in the meeting under their first or last name. So that concludes public comment for this item. Terrific. Does anyone want to make a motion? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm glad to make a motion to support and send the letter. 
but I definitely want to, I definitely want to talk about it a little bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, me too. Uh, Mikey, I guess you've got the floor. I, I, I what I did want to ask, uh, was for the city manager to have the opportunity to give his report. What do you mean? Well, oh, you mean on this issue? On this issue. Okay. I didn't know there was a report. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I know there's been a, a lot of uh, time taken here, so so I'll be brief. I don't have too much more to add uh, beyond the staff report. Um, you know, certainly the city council can take a position of advocacy here. Um, you can certainly uh, send letters, uh, you know, taking a position. Um, you can send those to the school district, uh, to the state, governor, California Department, California Department, of public health, if you wanted to, I just want to make it clear. I, I think I think the council members know this. I think most speakers know this, but just for the record, just to be clear, that the um, city does not have any any direct role here in um, in either um, uh, causing these mandates to to come into place for the schools, uh, nor do we have any direct ability to to stop it. But but again, council can certainly take an advocacy position. Uh, to support or oppose, um, and um, be happy to answer any any questions. I, I know the school district is is still uh, working uh, through this um, on on their side, um, and uh, I I think they are trying to line themselves up to um, uh, to uh, to mirror the requirements as they're coming down from the state of California. Um, and again, I just put that out there simply as factual information. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Steve. Mikey, I see your hand raised. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Steve, for your comments, too. I, I just want to thank all the speakers, first of all. 97 people still here. Well, I know some are staff and council. But uh, I know the time was short. I know that was really frustrating for some of you. But take, you know, solace in knowing that if we had everyone go three minutes, we would not have finished. We would not be done. So this item would have been pushed again. Could have had another PSPS and been pushed again for all we know. So I, you know, I appreciate everyone's understanding that we really wanted to get through this issue as, and uh, it was important. Um, I definitely have a few comments. I, I am vaccinated. I've gotten my booster. My whole family has. Um, I supported and brought forward the mask ordinance to Malibu at the time. I think masks do prevent spreading of COVID. Our family's been super careful. I know either directly are closely connected to 10 people that have died from COVID, including an in-law. So I take it really seriously. I take public safety really, really seriously. Actually, when you get elected, you discover just how seriously you take public safety because it's what you deal with every single day. And at the same time, I want to, besides thanking the speakers, I want to thank them for for speaking up. I personally, I don't have any staff. The city has staff, but none of those are my staff. So my group, my staff is the residents of Malibu. And I learn from you. And I've learned a lot from you on this issue. And I, I, I thank you for your advocacy and for your standing up for what you believe in. And that's why I asked to bring this forward because it seemed like even though we have no direct, you know, ability to decide on this issue as far as the state goes or even the district, it's something it seemed it was very warranted we talked about and that we talk about tonight, and I'm glad we are. Um, my numbers show 74 people supporting this tonight and one person potentially against. Math in my head means that's somewhere in the neighborhood of as much as 15% of our student body being represented here tonight. And that's amazing. A lot of family. I didn't count every kid, 
but there was it was a big number. So really, really impressive. Um, a couple of comments. What is a mandate? A mandate is basically a law, but there's a difference. A mandate is brought forward by a governor. A governor. Laws are brought forward by legislators, the Senate, etc. So basically, a mandate is a law, and we we have mandates everywhere. So to think we don't have mandates or that you're anti-mandate, you probably aren't if you looked into mandates more. So much of what we do in our our society with all of our freedoms or not is mandated, like seatbelts, et cetera. And some of those are great. Some of them make sense. Excuse me, my, my notes are so extensive. It's just taking me a minute to parse through them. Mikey. Yes. I think we all want to go the same place. Let's I'll go get there. there. I'll get it. I'll get there. Yeah, I have tons of quotes from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the CDC, showing their own reluctance in supporting mandates for children. Um, even my wife, very afraid of COVID. She's like, I don't think we would mandate our children if they were young. And the people who said, you don't have children, so you don't understand, I, I disagree with that. We're on the city council here. Our responsibility is the entire city. And I think all of us take that very seriously, whether that issue directly impacts us or not. So um, with the help of the mayor wanting me to move forward, I am going to skip over a lot of comments I would normally make. Um, I think there is definitely enough evidence. I spent hours looking at scientific reports on, on this issue. And uh, I would make a motion I know we're going to have a discussion, a motion to support the letter to the district and to the governor. Um, I worry about one thing. I'm almost reluctant to say it. Our district's at war with us so much, it wouldn't surprise me if they would push forward a mandate knowing it would get rid of kids that would drop out of the system in Malibu. I worry about that because they still get paid. So with that, that's my motion. Um, I have a copy of the letter, the latest version. Uh, Kelsey, you have in your inbox right now. And um, it's the mo It's the one that was brought forward. I, thought, I guess it was a little typo, the one that we all have, but I think everyone in the city council has been emailed that. And um, with that, I'll let the other counselors talk. Thank you very much. I have a motion. Is there a second? Does anybody just want to talk? Um, I'm reading the letter right now that was emailed to us. I, I assume others are trying to do the same. <clears throat> Steve, you have a yellow box around you. Steve McCoy or myself? Steve. Okay. Steve Uring. I saw I, him. Yeah, I just, I have a question. I mean, who has the final say in this thing? Is it the, it's the governor, right? I mean, the school district, does that have any, do they have any option? The school district was actually ahead of the governor on this. I know, I know, but when the governor passes the mandate, does the school district have any option? A lot of districts in the country have gone against <laughs> their governor. <laughs> both ways so that i don't think there's a, a, anything established there but the quite a few articles on that so can they do they yes do they what have, have an option well i know in florida they sued districts that wanted like a mask mandate and uh <laughs> so <laughs> the governor's orders and yeah, it's a great question. I know that districts have gone both ways, no matter what the governor has said. And I don't know about mandates. That's more about mask ordinances. Bruce, okay. you've been waiting patiently. I apologize for not seeing you earlier. 
No, no problem. Was was, was Steve Ewing finished? Yeah, for now, Bruce, I am. Thank you. All right. Well, first of all, I want to compliment Kelsey for managing this process. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could not have been easy. Uh, and I also want to note my connection has been unstable from time to time where I've been listening. So if, if I freeze up, I apologize. Uh, you know, public engagement by our electorate uh, and w- with each other and with us, it's a touchstone of democracy. And it, it's incredibly heartening to see our residents so engaged, especially in a civil and elevated manner, as, as occurred tonight. Um, I've said this before, and I am sure I will continue to say it again in the future. I couldn't be more impressed with the quality of the comments from our friends, neighbors, and community members who speak at our city council meetings. And and it was for that reason I voted against the last-minute decision to reduce the already limited time for people to speak to one minute per person. Um, I'm just going to digress for one moment. Mikey will remember this. There was a listening session after the Woolsey fire conducted by the county, and um, to, to our great surprise, when we showed up, they were limiting people to three minutes to tell their stories from the fire. And I, I, I got up and I said to Sheila Kuehl, this is ridiculous. Um, we, a lot of people showed up here. They have heartfelt um, issues to discuss, and you need to let them speak. And, and they changed the rule and let, and let them speak. Um, I had confidence that, that our residents would have self-regulated their comments if they were saying the same things. But some had more to say than others, and I, I did think it was wrong to cut them off. Some were were very poignant and and they were cut off in mid-sentence. As a general matter, I am very troubled by the divisiveness of our society today. It's particularly disheartening that a deadly virus that threatens all of us has become a further polarizing force and not a catalyst for bringing us closer together. Now tonight, dozens of residents expressed opposition to a vaccine mandate for public school students. On the other hand, I have to say I've heard privately from multiple residents who favor a vaccine mandate. They've said they're concerned about expressing that view publicly because of what they perceive, rightly or wrongly, to be the fervor of some who oppose a mandate. And, and I'm not talking about people who spoke tonight. But because of that, I'm not surprised by the fact that we didn't hear from the, that voice. I, again, I don't mean to suggest that anyone who spoke tonight poses a danger to anyone who expresses a contrary view. but There are extremists out there, and this is a public forum. And across the country, public officials who've spoken in support of vaccine mandates have been threatened with bodily injury, and some have received death threats. Um, By publicly speaking in support of a vaccine mandate, members of the public put a target on themselves, and that's a powerful incentive to remain silent. Now, I lack the personal knowledge of the efficacy and the dangers of the COVID-19 vaccines to have an informed position respecting the issue of mandating that children be vaccinated as a condition to attending public school, much less elementary school. I've heard multiple arguments in support of contradictory conclusions. They all, a lot of them sound reasonable. Some sound crazy in both directions, but a lot of them sound very reasonable in both directions. I lack the scientific or medical expertise to assess the underlying data. As much as I'd prefer to find a way to plow common ground, and I've told a number of people this, I wonder whether a solution to the societal divide and the divide here would not be to have students who are vaccinated for COVID-19 and students who are not vaccinated for COVID-19 attend school in physically separated classrooms. That way, parents of students who believe that the risk associated with contracting COVID-19 are greater than the risks associated with the vaccination can choose to not vaccinate their, their children. And the parents who believe the risks associated with being, with not being vaccinated and being with other children who aren't vaccinated is greater. They can choose to have their children vaccinated and go to, go to school confident that their position is being honored. As a general matter, I'm opposed to the notion of separate but equal schooling. I'm not suggesting we go back to de jure seg- racial segregation or anything like that that we rejected a long time ago as unconstitutional. But I have, and I also have concerns that physically separating students based on COVID-19 vaccination status could lead to further political and social polarization because it would tend Bruce, to. Diminish- Paul, I'd like to remind you that the agendized item is, shall we send a letter? I know that, Paul, and I will get there, and I am speaking as why why I take the position I take. And I, I don't appreciate being interrupted. And I don't appreciate listening to pre-written things instead of concentrating on doing what we're supposed to be doing here. 
Okay. Are you finished your, your statement? I'm finished. Okay. I, I have concerns that that will further polarize people because kids tend to express the views of their parents and to separate them will put them in even more so polarized ways. But on the other hand, we live in an extraordinary time. Physical separation of students based on COVID-19 status, vaccination status would be a relatively temporary condition, as was remote learning, which was even more isolating. And we currently lack the empirical evidence to form a determination to a medical or scientific certainty whether concerns about the risks associated with the virus or the vaccination are better founded. Now, we heard tonight, Heather Alfano said, I, I wrote this quote down, self, people should have the right to self-determine the risk of exposure. Others talked about bodily autonomy, medical freedom, individual rights, and parental choice. And, and I have to also compliment Dana Grelick, who noted that it would be less of an issue if more adults did the right thing and got vaccinated for the common good. But without separating students based on COVID-19 vaccination status, one group or the other of students is going to have to be exposed to a risk that their parents are unwilling to accept. They, like it or not, the parents are divided. Some think it's worse to have their kids vaccinated. We heard from a number of them tonight. Some think it's worse to send their kids to school with others that aren't vaccinated. We didn't hear from them tonight, but I, but they're out there. And in the absence of physical separation, the concerns of one group are going to have to give rise to the concerns of another group. So based on everything I've read, and I'm sorry if I had I said this in advance, Paul, based on everything I've read and heard, if I had, if I had school age children, I would have them vaccinated. And I would have concerns about my children attending school with other children who aren't vaccinated. But I, I also respect the contrary view. So, for all those reasons, I don't support sending a letter opposing a vaccine mandate. I do support sending a letter that says that you need to find a way to compromise so that all parents' choices for their children can be honored. And if there are other ways it can be done than the one I've expressed, that would be great. But this is just too polarizing. We know too little in both directions. We don't know whether it's dangerous to send kids to school who aren't vaccinated. So I would favor sending a letter expressing a view that there ought to be some compromise that preserves the choice of all parents. I think we've heard that. Parental choice. People said they're not anti-vaccination. They're pro-choice. I get that and I agree with that. I'm finished, Paul. Thank you. Karen? Thank you, Paul. Um, there's a spectrum of opinion, even in the group tonight, where almost everyone who spoke concurs uh, with the letter that was provided to us. Um, we have heard everything from uh, parents who've said that, they're, that they are vaccinated, that their children are vaccinated against other childhood diseases, but not against COVID. And they fear for their children, especially, and I understand, the very young children, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, uh, having this requirement or, or being kept out of school. And I feel for you guys. Um, I may not have a five or six year old, but I have two grandchildren and some of you know them. So this is, this is an issue that's close to home for me. Um, I think everybody knows, and maybe you don't, that the city has followed the county orders from day one. Uh, take that back. We were a bit late on the mask uh, mandate, like Mikey said, but we followed county orders from day one. And this is not an easy one. This is one of the harder things we've dealt with. Um, and I'm sorry about the wait. You know, we didn't know we were going to have this whole Edison PSPS issue taking up two hours. Um, probably surprised some people. I agree with Bruce. Okay. You know, I, I don't, I, and one more reminder, we don't have jurisdiction. We don't have jurisdiction. And if and when we get our own school district, it is still a separate elected body from the city. Of course, we'd be dealing with the same set of constituents and you can vote either body out 
And I, you know, it is Santa Monica has proven again and again and again. Santa Monica is in it for Santa Monica, period. They're not in it for Malibu, no matter what we think. So I, I think we are going to have to draft our own letter. And that's what I have to say. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm, I'm vaccinated. My wife's vaccinated. My adult children are all vaccinated. The older grandchildren are vaccinated. The younger ones are not vaccinated yet. And I think that part of that reason that they haven't been vaccinated yet is that the epidemiology doesn't suggest they're at any risk. Uh, and as far as that goes, I don't really, it doesn't bother me to be around people who are unvaccinated because I'm vaccinated and I've had the, the booster and everything else. And, and I wear a mask when I'm dealing with the public because that's what I'm required to do by the rules of, of my employment. And it's, it's not, I'm not in any danger from children. And let's face the facts. If, if you have the number, there are infections for adults, for uh, people who've been vaccinated. The average age of people who've been vaccinated who get admitted to the hospital is somewhere around 65 years old. The average age of people who get admitted to the hospital who have not been vaccinated, and this is the average, is 52 years old. There's a, there's a big difference as a result of being vaccinated. There's a big benefit for older people. I don't know that there's any benefit for kids. I don't have any problems signing the letter, but if we don't have three votes, we don't have three votes. Steve? Yeah, this, this, and I think Karen's right. This is the time. I'm the only person here that does not have children. I mean, I, uh, so trying to put myself in everybody else's shoes, uh, I, I understand, I believe I understand the difficult decisions you're trying to make. My problem is, I'm not a doctor, right? I mean, I, you know, we get this, there's this new virus, this Omicron or whatever the heck it is. I have no idea what the impact of that's going to be. I don't know. I mean, you got countries that are closing their, their borders. You've got the United States has changed the testing rules for people that are coming into the country. So there's some level of concern that says this thing could be more transmittable than the ones that we currently have. I, I don't know. I, you know, and, and the, the question is, do you, my question is, do I make a decision about something that could harm somebody when I don't know anything about it? And, you know, I just, that to me is a very difficult decision for me to try and make. Uh, you know, the, the question is, I, you know, I don't want to be responsible for having some child get sick and die or whatever heck but the, by the same token i don't want to see an adult get sick and die and i don't want to be responsible and you if i don't have to be responsible for either one of those cases to occur and i don't know what all this where this virus this virus is not going away it's you know i mean i look it's just not going away it's going to be around with us for a very long time uh, it, it's, so I'm just, I'm still struggling and I waited to the end because I wanted to hear from other people speak, but I have a real difficult time making a decision about a medical situation that I'm just not qualified to do. Paul. Thank you, Steve. So. Remind me, do we have a motion? Uh, yes, I made a motion. Okay. But it doesn't have a second yet. Okay, I'll second it so we can discuss it as if we haven't just done that. Well, 
I'd, I'd like to just say this, this letter isn't about the overall science of viruses or COVID. It simply states until more data is collected that prove long-term efficacy with little or no harmful side effects, the city of Malibu is not in favor of enforcement of this mandate upon children at this time. Doesn't say we won't change our mind. It just saying that we don't want our kids not to be able to go to school if their parents don't feel comfortable with this. They're children. I don't know the cutoff age, but if they're young children, you know, they don't feel comfortable with them being vaccinated. We know that, and if you're in a mixed family, that would change things for me. Yeah, I'd be a lot more worried if I had grandparents at home, et cetera. But young children, I think the evidence is pretty clear on all sides. They are not dying from this. So the letter isn't about that. It's about this. Mikey, what do you think of the concept that Bruce brought up that said, guys, you got a problem, and you, and you people who are in charge of the school districts, you're the ones that have to figure it out. You got to treat every, you, you got to take care of both sides of your equation. You got to take care of the folks who want to keep their kids vaccinated and want to do that. And the same token, you got to have some solution for those people who say, I, you know, I'm, I'm afraid. They're not, they're not wrong. They're afraid. I'm afraid of doing this to my child because I don't know what the impact is going to be. I mean, why not go back to the school district or to the governor and say, guys, you know, you can't take care of one side without taking care of the other and let them try and figure out a better answer. You know, one of the things I've learned from being on the you know school ad hoc committee is just the degree which, I, which with our district is unable to provide a fair and equitable educational experience for the kids in two different towns. I have absolutely, I struggle to have faith that they can figure out how separate but equal is going to work in a school district. I I don't think the school district is going to have a choice. I think it's the governor we got to get to. I think that's where the message has to be delivered that says, look, you do have a constituency that consists of people on both sides of the aisle. And you and you know you, you got to take care of you got to find a way to accommodate both of them. You can't make them all happy all the time, but you I think you got to you got to think about both groups and try and do something that takes care of them. You know I, I don't know if that's a, even a viable answer, but boy, you, it seems to be a better path to go down versus doing stuff that I don't know anything about. I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to jump in. I, could I make one note about the letter? Um, I'm, I'm reading do. it again. Um, there's a quote in there that, that's not cited. I am not comfortable sending out a letter uh, with a quote about 99.97% recovery rate for children. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know where it came from. It might be true. It might not. I'm not going to put my name to something that I don't that I can't verify. I would agree with that. Thank you, Karen. Bruce? Yeah, um, I, I, I also agree with that. I mean, you know, you can, there, there, there are statistics for everything to support whatever you want to say. So I don't know whether that's an accurate statistic. I don't know if there's such a thing as an accurate statistic here, unfortunately. I want to come back to, you know, I'm persuaded by listening to others that I, I guess basically the things I said is I am opposed to a mandate, to a vaccine mandate at this time based on the information that is available to us. But I'm not simply opposed to it as the beginning and end of the analysis. That's that's been my problem is I, I, I think the school district and the governor need to find a way while not mandating the vaccination for all students to accommodate the students and the parents of the students who do, who not only prefer to be vaccinated, but who are concerned about attending school with those who aren't vaccinated. And this letter, it doesn't say don't do that, but it doesn't encourage finding that solution that accommodates everyone's freedom of choice here. 
and, you know, and, and Mikey said earlier, I agree with that. I mean, we, have, we, we live with plenty of mandates in our, in our lives. And, and, and I think of almost everyone that spoke, not everyone, there's, there were some people who are against vaccinations, period. But most people that spoke recognize polio vaccines are appropriate, smallpox vaccines are appropriate, whatever they are that the children have these days. Those other ones, they're not opposing them. Those are mandates also. Those are the law. But this one is not tried and tested yet. At least, at least I don't understand how well tested it is. And I, so I can't support the mandate for children, but I also can't support then requiring that the, that the parents who are concerned about sending their kids to school with unvaccinated children, they have only the choice of then pull them out of school or send them into what they're concerned as a COVID stew. So I think the letter needs to address both issues if it's going to address anything at all. Karen? There currently exists in the structure of the school district an option for home instruction. And I'm not saying that that's a great choice. It might be a correct choice, as we heard from some people tonight, uh, for them. I'm not sure how one qualifies, particularly these days, um, for home instruction. Uh, if, if there's some medical threshold, if it's purely choice, is it related to uh, some other factor? Uh, I think we might need to do some more homework here. I really am not sure what the criteria is for home instruction, but we have uh, uh, credentialed teachers employed by SMMUSD who only do home instruction. So, I, you know, I hate to drag this out, but I think we need to get some more answers before we're prepared to write a letter. Okay. Bruce? Yeah, just a very brief comment on this issue of home instruction. I, I, I think that that's not, that's not the issue here. Um, I mean, we've agreed on a lot of things, Karen, tonight. Um, I, I think the parents who are, who've spoken tonight, they don't want to have to choose home instruction. It, they're not, they're not, they're, they wouldn't be satisfied with that. And I don't blame them. They want their children to be able to go to school and they don't want to be forced to vaccinate them. And I, and I get that and I respect their view. Um, and I'm sure that the parents who have had their children vaccinated or intend to have them vaccinated and are concerned about them attending school with unvaccinated children also don't want to have to homeschool them or home instruction as an option. So everyone wants to be able to send their kids to school and they want to be able to send them to school based on the medical choice they've made. And, and that's the situation we're in. And, and there's, there's no way to accommodate them all with a mandate in either direction, unfortunately. There just isn't. And there's a lot of times in our law when we have to just say, well, that's tough. Some people are going to have to be dissatisfied. But this is a this is a really, really difficult one. And we don't have enough evidence, I don't think, to make a competent decision in either direction. Thank you, Bruce. Steve McClary, do you know of a path out of this swamp? Oh, I wish I did, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, and uh, I, I guess I just wanted to pick up a little bit on, on one of the, the earlier comments from uh, Councilmember Fair. Um, you know, this isn't going to be decided tomorrow, uh, and I'm certainly not recommending or suggesting that we, you know, bring this back and make all the public speakers go through all this again. I think that that part has been uh, we've we've already exhausted that. But um, you know, there are there are going to be a number of steps, and and I just want to make it clear here: I'm not suggesting for a moment that you know that this would eliminate the concerns of the public um, who are concerned about a mandate coming down. But there are a number of steps before the state would actually implement this, um, including the California Department of Public Health will consider recommendations from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Academy of Family Physicians prior to implementing a requirement. Um, and then I don't know if this helps at all, but right now what they're looking at is they're looking at doing full approval of ages 12 plus, which would be grades seven through 12. Uh, I think everybody thinks that there's, you know, very likely that they're going to reach down into the younger age groups, you know, probably subsequent to that. Um, but you know, the trigger for the California Department of Public Health to move forward on this is 
is when FDA approval has has given you know approval of for the vaccine for for even those age groups. So, I guess my point here is um, this has not been you know completely decided. Uh, the city certainly could um, weigh into the state, to the California Department of Public Health, and ask them to um, do a little bit more research or maybe to consider some other alternatives, uh, perhaps along the lines of some of the other suggestions that from the council tonight, um, and maybe suggest that the state try to work that uh, into into their into the requirements before they actually you know bring this down. So. Uh, I realize for a lot of people, and I wouldn't would not disagree that you know uh, that you know that the uh, you know cows already out of the barn on this one. I think to a large degree, and I, I think people have pretty you know feel that this is likely to, to come down, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. But but just to be clear, there are still a number of state, uh, steps that the state does need to take and and does need to contemplate before they would would. Uh, uh, would implement this requirement uh, for the vaccinations for for school, uh, and again, right now they're looking at the um, seven through twelve grades, uh, and then we would expect subsequently they would look at the the younger groups after that. But right now they're looking at seven through twelve. So I don't know if that helps, but um, have an answer to questions. So is it accurate to say that the school district is is quite a bit ahead of the state government at this point in what they're asking people to do? Um, I, I don't know if I would completely agree with that. Um, and I haven't checked on their latest actions, but my understanding uh, was that they were trying to line themselves up so that they could uh, mirror and be ready to implement whatever the, the state requirements came down at the time that those would be implemented. I don't believe uh, that the district has contemplated, and I'm sure if I'm wrong, someone will correct me on this. Um, I know that but the, the state was encouraging districts to, con to consider implementing the mandates ahead of the uh, ruling by the California Department of Public Health. I don't believe that the SMMUSD is, is contemplating that. Of course, they, they could change their mind going forward. So, but... Um, I think they were again looking to line themselves up so that they were, uh, you know, in line with with whatever was coming down from the state. Uh, I realize it doesn't satisfy uh, the people who are concerned about the vaccination for a uh, requirement for their for their students for their children. I'd like to call a question, and I'm perfectly happy to be voted down voted up and or have it be a dead heat. So Can you please have the motion restated. I'm I think that's an excellent idea. Kelsey, do you have the motion for us, please? Mike, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but it was to authorize the mayor to send a letter to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education and Governor Newsom in opposition to a vaccine mandate for students in SMM USB local public schools. Uh, I would say right up till the end, it was to send the letter um, in opposition. If that's what you said, I missed it. In opposition to a vaccine mandate for students? Yeah, you have the letter there. So it's it, the actually the motion is to send that letter. Is it for all students or for the younger students? I have an important question. Are it's, we talking about the letter that was provided to us or a letter that we will draft? My motion was the letter provided to us. Of course, there was no motion on drafting another letter at that, as far as I know yet. Mayor Grisanti, we could display the letter that was submitted by Hamish Patterson, if that would help. I think most of us. And I do, I do want to point out that the 99 point wherever it is, percent, 99.97 is, is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. So it is a researched, if not cited in the letter number. American Academy of Pediatrics actually says some states are zero. It's the range, the low end of the range is 99.97. Karen is... I would say if we're gonna if we're going to get specific like that, I want the sources cited 
in our letter. I would agree to that. Reasonable. So, so if I may make an amendment, uh, I, I cannot in good conscience agree to send this particular letter. It does not cite sources. And, and I personally um, am not comfortable taking anybody's word for it. I'd like to see that myself. So I, I think we need an amended letter. How would you go about that? You know, this is this is a research item. This is a staff research item. So we would, are you saying we would ask staff to bring back a letter with the appropriate uh, citation? Or, yes, or leave that out. Okay. Or leave that sentence out. Sorry, sorry, the way it's on the screen right now, I couldn't read that if you paid me. It's like a size zero font. <laughs> no. I'll just read it from my email. All right. I see Bruce's hand is raised. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Well, look, look, as a matter of drafting, although, again, I'm opposed to this unless there's the other side of the coin as well, you just don't need that sentence at all. It, it, it's just that sentence is just advocacy. So you could you could just eliminate that sentence and still make the point. So would you take out the whole sentence or just the first uh, uh, to the first comma? Yeah, you could do that. I would take out that sentence. Do that, sir. <sighs> I mean, you know, you could write a book on the reasons why you support one position or the other. The, the point is this would be the position we're taking. You don't need to give the reasons because then you get into a big debate. Yeah. You guys, your hand is raised. I'm just, you know, and and I go back to the, the discussion Steve McClary provided in terms of the organizations that have to sign off on this thing before it can become a mandate. And I'm wondering if, you know, some communication back to those groups that sort of said, you know, that, that sort of talked about what we had here today. You have a number of our residents come up and are, you know, are opposed to this mandate. It's going to cause a huge problem inside the school system. And, you know, we request request that you guys, as opposed to just coming out with a, a flat mandate, consider some, op, some options that, again, take care of both sides of the group. I don't know if that gives has any more impact than writing to the governor. But if those are the folks that are making the decision, maybe trying to get to them gives us a better chance of getting a solution that accommodates both sides. I have a, can I suggest a compromise to this? Please. Which is, and this, this, this may not be satisfactory to the many people who spoke tonight, but maybe it would. I mean, why don't we just factually state what we just went through, which is, you know, we, we held a city council meeting and 80, 90, whatever the number was of our residents spoke against a mandate uh, and not a single one spoke in favor of it. And that's important information that we are passing on to the school board and the state that that we haven't heard from a single person in our um, at the meeting. I, I, I have heard privately, but we have not. We didn't hear publicly from a single person who favored a mandate. They all uniformly opposed it. And we feel it's important to pass that information on. If that's a motion, I'm seconding it. Thank you, Karen. I'll make that a motion. Okay, we have a previous motion, but I guess we could withdraw that, Mikey. I think we should vote on it. That your original motion? Sure. Okay. Okay. Let's call that question. We'll vote on it, and then we'll vote on Bruce's motion. Is that how that works, or am I supposed to do Bruce's motion first and then go back? No. If Mikey's motion passes, then there's there is no other motion. All right. Okay. Kelsey, can you call the roll? 
Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Well, I wish I could wait. Uh, I'm going to say yes, and I'm guessing I'm going to hear three no's, or two no's and a maybe. Councilmember Fair? No. Councilmember Yearing? No. Mayor Proton Silverstein? No, not maybe. Motion, motion fails. Uh, go to the second motion uh, from Bruce uh, uh, proposed and was seconded by Karen. Could I hear the motion again, please? Okay. Sure we can. Kelsey, do you have uh, it? I have some of it. Uh, mayor Proton Silverstein might want to correct me, but we are authorizing the mayor to send a letter describing the public hearing and the public input received by the city council. Yes, and I, tr I trust the staff to accurately reflect what occurred. Who will we send that letter to? Do we have to figure that out now or we'll do that later? I think it's a good idea to send it to the school board, send it to the governor, send it to the people who are deciding, making the decision. I mean, I, I agree. Larry gave us a list of people who were talking about this. And so we should inform them of what people think. I think that's a good idea. I'll take that as a, um, a friendly amendment, I assume, Paul. Yes, please. Any, any more discussion? Bruce, I see your hand is still raised. Oh, that, that was an accident. But, but yeah, I, I will say one more thing, which is perhaps um, there could be two members of council, and I don't want to be one of them, who would review the letter before it goes out. Okay. I would like to be one of them. I Karen, will. How about, well, how about sure. you be the other one? Yeah. Yeah, Karen, right. Great. Can we, uh, can we call the roll, Kelsey? Just one second, please. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? No, because I haven't seen the letter. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. It's, uh, it's about seven minutes to midnight. You think we could knock out the consent calendar? Yes. We already did the consent calendar. We already did. No, it's the second yep. consent calendar. Huh? 3A1. 3A1 and 3B1. 3A1 is a second re reading oh. of Ordinance 494, which has to do with landscape water conservation. I think we got to do 4A also, Paul, because there's, there's a time frame in. I'm glad to do as yes, many as you want to do, but we have to do the consent calendar sure. ones. We can do the consent sure. calendar ones together. Sure. May, anyone... may I state for the record, I plan on sitting here till we finish the agenda, period. Okay. I'm willing to do Me that too. as well. Sorry, everybody. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Has any member of the public opposed it? No, the item has not been pulled. Okay. Also moving the motion. If needed. We got a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. I'd like to take the roll, please. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uri? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that moves us to item 4A. Uh, staff contact is planning director Malika. But I think that this is the same thing we've approved before. Is there any changes we should be worried about, Richard? Good evening, Mayor. No, this item is brought back to you um, as was initiated by the City Council on the 27th of September 
Uh, the Planning Commission recommended it uh, go forward with no changes. I can show you the the item again if you like. I don't want to see it again. I'm comfortable. So do we have a motion to approve item 4A? Mayor Grisanti, I just wanted to note for those watching at home, we don't have any public speakers for this item. Thank you. I imagine we probably have very few people watching who are actually awake. You got it. Quick question, Paul, if I may. Sure, please. Richard, I, I got a call be between our meetings from Deborah Bianco that somebody called her from the city and said she can't use the parking lot for the first two weeks in January. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And it's because this ordinance will not become effective until around the 12th, 13th of January, uh, because it will be effective 30 days after the second reading. So if she were to be using the lot during those two periods, uh, the, the two Sundays that fall in there, uh, it would be done, it would be inconsistent with the code as, as it written in there, our municipal ordinances. That's so we have to do the best we can do right now. We can't change that. Okay, uh, I move uh, that we um, extend the temporary parking in the city's chili cook-off site for the farmer's market and find the action exempt from CEQA. And I guess this means um, just, just move staff recommendation. I'll second that motion. Steve, your hand's still raised. Oh, sorry. Mistake. Okay. Kelsey, we have a motion and a second. Will you read the roll, please? John, could you read the title of the ordinance? Yes, I can. One second. This is an ordinance of the City of Malibu amending Malibu Municipal Code Section 17.68.040, temporary uses requiring a permit to extend temporary parking in the city's chili cook-off site for the farmer's market and finding the action exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. And can we make sure that going forward that's from the California Environmental Quality Act? Yes. Uh, are you ready for the roll call? Mayor? We are ready for the roll call. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Yearing? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, that takes us to item 5A. Uh, I imagine that uh, that's the Wagner Affidavit investigation and Interim City Attorney Cotty will lead us through this, I think. Oops, there's anything to lead it. Mayor, members of the council, good morning. It's been almost a year since the city was made aware of an affidavit from outgoing council member Jefferson Wagner that contained allegations of wrongdoing and corruption in city government. On, uh, on April 26th, 2021, the council retained attorneys Evan Janess and George Newhouse to conduct an investigation into the allegations contained in the affidavit, and they have now finished their report. Our office, upon reviewing the report, has advised that the Wagner Affidavit Report is protected by the attorney-client privilege and work product doctrine. The question before the council tonight is whether it wants to waive the application of the attorney-client privilege and work product doctrine and release all or a portion of the report and related documents. In a confidential memo and in the staff report, we've addressed the options available to the council, I have no doubt that there are others, and the pros and cons of each. Ultimately, the decision is a policy one for you all to decide tonight. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein and Council Member Ferrer served as the client representatives throughout this process and assisted in the request for uh, proposals for the investigators, interviews, and so on. Uh, before I turn it over to them, I would note that I believe both Evan and Jeunesse and George Newhouse, the investigators, are here as well. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, 
Do we ask you the questions or? Mayor Grisanti, would you also like to hear a public comment on this item? Yes, do we have any public comment? We do have 14 speakers signed up. I know a few of them have left the meeting, but we'll see who we can still find. The first few speakers would be Norm Haney, Josh Siegel, and Drew Leonard. I don't see Norm in the meeting, so we'll hear from Josh Siegel first. Hi, Josh. Are you awake? I'm awake. <laughs> Thanks for staying up late with us. Um, thank you, City Council and staff, for this wonderful meeting. Um, I'll make it very quick. Um, I think that this should be uh, released unredacted. I'd be very shocked if it wasn't a unanimous vote to do that. Um, I'd also like to see uh, Jefferson release some of the underlying documents of the warrant that was served at his house. I think that there's a lot of people out in the community um, that believe that this was the previous city manager's doing, and I think that there's a lot of uh, conspiracy theorists, um, I like to call them boo anon, but, um, you know, I think that, that Jefferson owes it to the community to really be transparent. He's the one who should be transparent here. So thank you. That's all I have. Appreciate your brevity, Josh. Our next speaker is Drew Leonard, followed by Dean Grawlick and E. Barry Haldeman. Hi, Drew. Are you available? Yep. Good evening, everyone. Um, Basically, I want to say the same thing as Josh. I'm asking you guys to release the report and all the notes associated with it. And it's late. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Drew. Our next speaker is Dean Grawlick. Hi, Dean. Are you are you there? I'm thinking Dean is under Dana's account, so we're trying to unmute that. Hey, everybody. Dean is asleep, and I can tell you that um, we all want to hear what's in this report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is E. Barry Haldeman, followed by Lloyd Ahern and Chris Frost. Hi, Barry. Hello. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, you know, there's been a cloud that has hung over Malibu since the last election, and that is the alleged lack of transparency of the city. And uh, questions were raised uh, intimating that uh, that there had been corruption, sweetheart deals, uh, payoffs, and there was, you know, kind of all kinds of misconduct allegations. And they became part of the, the campaign and were amplified by people on social media. Um, and so the personification of that became the Wagner affidavit. So the cities did what the city should do, which was hire an independent law firm, investigate the allegations based on the Wagner affidavit. And um, and so the study was done. It's now completed. It needs to be released. We all need to know whether further action needs to be taken or whether there was any truth to the allegations and accusations and rumors. And um, I would not understand any council member who would not allow that. As far as the attorney-client privilege is concerned, you've all been advised that that can be waived, and it doesn't mean you waive all attorney-client privilege. It means for this particular issue, and I. Um, uh, so we, as the citizens, have the right to know what the report turned up, because the very issue was transparency. So I urge you to vote in favor of releasing the report unredacted, so we finally get to the bottom of everything and know whether we need to act or not act and and put these rumors to bed. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Chris Frost and John Mazza. Hi, Lloyd. Are you available? Yeah, Paul, how are you, buddy? I'm good. Good. Um, uh, in December of 2020, when Bruce got elected, he did a 50-page um, theses on transparency and ethics. He then, and then everyone, everything went sideways because of his, the way he handled the whole situation with Reva, were drumming her out of the, you know, her dream job. And, and, you know, then he said, you can, you could, you, she'll say, she said, oh, I'll leave. And he says, yeah, but we don't want to pay you. And, 
you know, that went on forever. And, and, and he's from Delaware, so he doesn't know. Malibu is a, a motion picture town where it's pay or play. And I actually talked to the council is if she's going to leave and she's got a contract, you pay her, you know, otherwise she'll sue you for a fortune. Anyway, that was all solved. Then we got this finally done where you guys have got the, the lawyers and uh, stuff. I cannot see any way that you can re let this out without showing every word. Don't redact, recheck anything. It would be just, it would cause more, more problems than it would solve. And when you go back and you look at this, Bruce writes more than he talks. That's that's the, the, the beauty. And he started, this was in December 20th. That was his first act. It's a 50-page thing on transparency, okay? 50 pages on transparency. So Bruce should be the leader tonight to say, look, I wrote about transparency and ethics. I want every, every sentence, every dotted I, every period, everything. So please do that for me tonight and the rest of the staff, because I know how everybody feels. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. I don't see Chris Frost or John Moss in the meeting, but we can hear from Marissa Coughlin next, followed by Howard Rudsky and Doug Stewart. Hi, Marissa. Are you able to? Hi. Me? You're unmuted. Hi. I know I did it to the phone in Saudi Arabia again. Anyway, um, thank you for being late. I appreciate it. And I'm going to be at City Hall at 8. I would like to have the whole report unredacted and made public. I think it's important with all the gossip, innuendo, uh, mean spiritedness that's come out since the beginning of this. This community needs to heal from all of this. Um, as you all know, I deal with staff daily. If there's an issue, I'm going to know what the issue is and with whom. And if there's not, it needs to be put to bed and we need to get over it and grow up because uh, none of us are perfect ever. If mistakes are made, they can be corrected. If it's intentional, it's already ended. Um, but I also hope too in the future from all of us that serve either as volunteers or elected people, treat each other with a bit more respect and dignity. I find it very disheartening. As I said, I've lived here 50 years and I've never experienced anything like this. It is so disheartening and publicly embarrassing. People all over the country know what's going on and I'm embarrassed. I travel with my job and I, it's really embarrassing. So um, let's take care of it as soon as possible and, um, and move on and take the care of the business in shorter meetings in a timely way. <laughs> So we can keep moving forward with our with the agendas that the council put forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marissa. Our next speaker is Howard Redsky, followed by Doug Stewart and Bradley Burma. Hey, Howard. Are you there? Mr. Redsky, are you awake? Howard, you should see a pop up asking you to unmute. Maybe we can try coming back to Howard in a moment. We do have Doug Stewart here. Hi, Doug. Good morning, everybody. I didn't expect uh, this to be a, a short meeting, and we've lived, we've lived up to it. Uh, just to remind everybody, I've been a resident of this city for over 20 years. And a year ago, I have to say I was very disappointed and surprised when this affidavit was presented. Uh, it didn't have any documented evidence. It was basically uh, just rumors and innuendos. And it really even contradicted facts that were known to the public. And we had two two attorneys, two professionals that I'm aware of. The city attorney and one of the district attorneys had looked at it and passed on it. So there wasn't anything here really to talk about. And yet this became a burning issue for the city council and the city. And all this, in spite of all this, we actually have a city icon who, I want to say, sullied his, his reputation with this. And he was encouraged by Mayor Pro Tem uh, Silverstein to write this. And uh, I believe Bruce even admitted that uh, he had assisted in writing it. 
But now we have a report that the council needs to waive privilege on, and I'd encourage you to do so. I think option number four with uh, limited redactions, it might be recommended by the city uh, attorney for personal information only, is the way to go. Full transparency, anything less than that is going to appear to be a cover-up. And I think if this re- releasing this report embarrasses or makes uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein look like a pl- political opportunity from New Jersey or Delaware or wherever he's from, then so be it. Such stunts are not the way I think Malibu operates, but he's a Johnny come lately to our city. And he only voted in his first uh, Malibu election at the same time as the Woolsey fire. Maybe the norm where he came from, but not the way we do things here in Malibu, in my opinion. And one last thing, I, I want to remind everyone that we have another investigation underway that probably does have merit. That's a, the ra- an harassment claim by the former city manager. This is supposed to be under supervision of the city HR department. And it'd be interesting to see where the status of that is uh, after we get through reviewing this uh, uh, report. That's my comments. Uh, wish you the best luck on it. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Doug. I don't see Bradley Vermont in the meeting, but we can hear from Ann Donine next, followed by Ryan. Hi, Ann. Are you available? Hello. Hello, Ann. Hi. Do you, so you hear me now? We do hear you now. Oh, great. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I agree with everybody, of course, um, maybe for different reasons, but um, I think you guys really do need to um, make this completely transparent. We paid for the report. We own it. We deserve to see everything that's in it. Um, what's the secret? Um, I think not to do that undermines the confidence that we as Malibu residents should have in our government. And as long as it remains redacted or will, will be as long as it would I'm a little sleepy, so sorry, as long as it would be redacted, it would smack of a cover up. Um, no one knows exactly what happened and yes, it needs to be clarified So, um, as again, I said, I come at this from a different direction than the rest of you, but, um, I'm glad that everybody does seem to be going in that direction, except for just one person. And, um, so that's my statement and, uh, I will look forward to, to seeing the whole report. So thank you for the opportunity for being able to speak. Thank you very much, Anne. Our next speaker is Ryan, and then we'll just see if Howard Rudsky is available. Hi, Ryan. Are you available? Uh, Yes, I'm here. I just wanted to say for the record, none of these people ever contacted me, so I don't know what kind of report you guys got or are talking about disclosing, but I wonder if it's all in there. Do you, are you saying you know something that should have been disclosed? I'm not obligated to disclose. I knew about the allegations of what happened when it was happening in 2013 and 14. But, you know, this was kind of a test to see how complete this report was going to be. And I'm probably disappointing Silverstein and the other people who very much wanted this report. But, you know, I, I just ponder how complete it is. You may get what you want. If, um, as a lot of the speakers alluded to, they, you know, would like to brush it under the rug, um, and, you know, clear and, and say it was all for nothing. But, uh, just having gone through the motions of spending some money and getting a report, of course, I've never, I haven't seen the report. I don't know what it says. I just want to say for the record, nobody ever bothered to contact me. I think I've been to 90% of the council meetings of this city since it was incorporated. I pretty much have my ear to the ground and I don't know why nobody bothered or maybe it was by design. I don't, I cannot fathom why I never got a phone call or an email, but anyway, thank you. I'll call it. Good night. Good night. <clears throat> and that was the last speaker. So we'll just see if Howard is able to unmute himself now. Okay. 
Howard, you should have a pop-up asking you to unmute. Mayor Grisanti, I think Howard may have stepped away from his computer and no longer be available, so that would conclude public comment. Great. Now we can return to the council to discuss what we think ought to happen. I don't know who wants to speak first, but uh, I will. Mikey, you're up. Oh, sorry. Somehow I'm not shy tonight. I don't know why I keep going first. That way I tee everyone else up to figure out what they can say. Um, I mean, whatever the report says, we have to release it all. I mean, I can't. Warts and all, whatever, you know, anything like this, of course we do. I mean, I can't just imagine any other way to go. So my, I would vote for, I guess it's option four. Um, of course, always. Thank you. Steve, I see your hand is raised. And then Karen? <laughs> yes, I'm going to vote to release it all. Okay. Karen? Uh, well, I was going to second the motion. Maybe Steve's comments count as a second. Uh, but yes, I also agree. Option four, release everything. Okay. Bruce? Or should we yeah. just take, take a vote? Do you want to talk no. or we'll take a vote? Yeah. No, I, I agree as well. Okay. Well, uh, Kelsey, does any of that count as a motion or do we need to actually make him say it? it's a motion? Unless John disagrees, I think we have a motion in there. John, did you need to get any clarification about redacting personal information? I would. So the uh, mayor members of the council, I, I, issue number four deals with redacting personal information. Uh, I, don't, I understand your motion to include the release of the entire report, but allowing us to sanitize the report for, I don't know that there's any in there, but social security numbers, addresses, and things of that nature, any other personal identifying information that, that might um, be considered confidential. Uh, take that the motion included that, inf that authority. I agree with that. I, I yes. If, if somebody's social security number is in there, yeah, I don't think we should be releasing that. Okay, and if we have the name of a, a, a an employee in there, are we taking that out, or is that something that we leave in, or? We'll be leaving in the employee's names. Um, to the extent there's any personal identifying information that would come out. Um, okay. To the extent there's any employees, uh, perhaps you can allow us to look to see if there's any, um, I don't believe there is, but any reference to former employees who might have been terminated uh, pursuant to which um, there's some something that would prevent the release of their names. I'm not referring to former city manager Rita Feldman. I'm referring to other employees who might be named in the report supporting documents. But other than that, no, there would be no other names redacted. Okay. Bruce, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I just want to say, I, I, I think the redaction issue is a slippery slope. Either either the only thing that's redacted is information from which one would contact a person, you know, an email address or social security number or things like that, um, or you need to start redacting. If you redact names of former employees, you got to redact names of other non-public figures who are, who are witnesses. So you, you can't, you, you got to go one way or the other. Either there's no redactions other than purely identification information that one would contact somebody through or which would damage their, you know, social security. There's no social security numbers. I mean, everyone knows. No, that. I don't think there is. But I, no. And I, I understand your point and I agree with it. I won't be taking out any names. I just want to make sure there's nothing in there that might require us to come back to you and say, whoa, wait a second, I missed something. I don't believe that's there, um, but should there be there, we would come back to you. Um, I mean, I think the only some... thing that's going to be redacted is personal identifying information, as you noted, addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, yeah. things of that nature. Okay. So, so that that is the motion. Uh, I think, as I understood it, to approve option number four. Okay. I have not heard a second yet. Though. I'll second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Kelsey, will you take the roll, please? 
Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And Mayor Grisanti, members of the council, one final point. We will go through that document one last time to, again, remove personal identifying information. Um, it will then be up to Mr. Meyerhoff and Mr. McClary to get that report out to the public, probably on the website and probably through uh, other avenues that the city uses to put that report out. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. upon request. But it, it'll take a couple of days to go through that document. I believe, I believe that's, is there one more item on this agenda somewhere? Hi, there is there is Westwood Beach. Let's be. I screwed up when I put it in my book here. So uh, you're right. Okay. We also have council member reports and city manager reports if if council so wishes to hear that. All right, let's let's try six B and see if we make any progress on it. Okay. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Karen said earlier she's prepared to stay till the end, and I agreed with that. But the more it, it is now twelve, it's almost twelve thirty. Um, is anything going to happen with the Westward Beach proposed project? in the next month? I mean, it, it's sitting at Coastal, right? Uh, um, yes. Uh, can I make a quick a suggestion? I mean, the, the reason I ask that is because, you know, if, if nothing's going to happen between now and the next meeting, why should we do this at 1230 when people are not going to be able to participate, really, that, that probably want to? Right. And, and, and I would just make a quick suggestion, maybe something we can do real quick and kind of um, – Move us along pretty quick. I, I, I know there's some there's some issues um, about the design and the beach erosion. Uh, um, the public works commissioners, myself, and a lot of the public safety commissioners have come up with different ideas uh, on how we can modify the project and kind of um, satisfy some of those concerns. W one of the things I was recommending was maybe doing a joint meeting with the Public Course Commission and the Public Safety Commission, kind of get their feedback and ideas and get alternatives what we can do to kind of bring back to council. And, and with those recommendations, I can come back to council and kind of present those options to you, um, either have a, a series of, of alternatives you can do or not do the project at all. And so, uh, um, that's an option that we could kind of move forward on doing with um, council's consent. Would you like us to instruct you to do that? Mayor Grisanti, there are six speakers signed right. up for this item right. before the council can take action. Okay. Let's see how many are still here. The huh? first three are Joe Drummond, Josh Siegel, and Suzanne Gildeman. We do have Joe Drummond in the meeting. Very good. Okay, so we're going to go forward with this? tonight i'm i'm willing to go forward with it or i'm willing to call it a day well maybe maybe this will fail but i'm, I'm going to move that we pass this one to the next meeting unless something's going to happen within the next couple of weeks which i my understanding is nothing can happen it stayed pending the appeal to coastal i see the uh scott dietrich has his hand up josh has his hand up I think I, we'll have a better discussion when we're not right. quite as worn out as we are right now. Okay. Is is there any time frame to withdraw it from coastal? I mean, I, I think just just um, I, there isn't really. I, I mean, there's the issue about the funding is more critical than kind of the coastal issue. If um, if we modify the project in a way that kind of satisfies some of the concerns of of the appeal, maybe that can appeal go away. Um, I, I think realistically, we missed the window of getting the project completed before the summer. So even if we modify the project, um, we're looking probably the fall to start the project so we don't run the situation of having construction during the summer. So. So but we have if, some time. But a time frame to pull it from Coastal. I mean, Coastal oh. 
I, I'm just trying to figure out, do we do that right away and get that out of the way and then come back and figure out what we do with the rest of the project? Uh, I, well, uh, uh, maybe Richard can can kind of chime in on, on the coastal kind of part of it too. But I mean, that I, I don't think that would preclude us sort of kind of looking at alternatives now and kind of see what we can do that if we want to modify and move forward with that. No, but my concern with coastal is Coastal is going to want a, ups, a, a wave up our study and a sea rise study. And none of those are included in this project. And I just don't want to look any more stupid in front of Coastal than we have to. The Coastal Commission, um, the first step would be to see if there is an issue, a substantial issue. And they are not going to hold that hearing until probably February or March which means that we have at least a month before they start putting together a staff report. Okay. So this were to be heard uh, roughly two weeks, I want to say, uh, the 13th, 13 days from now, I believe. Uh, by then, they would not have published anything or, or moved forward on their report. Cool. That's all I need to know. So do we need a motion to continue this to the next meeting? Well, that, is, that is my motion. I'll, I'll second, second that. that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Continue this to the next meeting, which I believe is December 13th. Is that correct? That yeah. is correct. All right. I'll say this. Um, it's going to be a king tide Saturday morning and Sunday morning. It's going to be a seven point something down there. Let's gonna, all go out and look at it. I'll be, be there, there. Be there a little, about, a little before nine o'clock. All right. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. I'm going to adjourn the meeting. I don't believe we have anybody we're going to adjourn it in the memory of. So, Can I ask one question? Are, are we bypassing uh, city manager and any other council reports? Mayor Grisanti, in case it should influence your decision, you did have a commission update from Scott Dietrich. I'm more than willing to wait. Let's let's hear let's hear him. Okay, Scott, we'll unmute you now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that in regards to 6B that I was here to answer questions. Um, what I didn't want you guys to do is to start going over the project that we approved in 2017, because that was the beach was completely different. And, you know, as Rob said, there's all kinds of ideas now to that make that initial project that I didn't, you know, that, that would be silly to review because I think it's off the table. Everybody agrees it's got to go. Um, but with all the new input, I, I think that would be a great starting point. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anyone else? See Lance's hand up. He's the chair of the Public Works Commission, I believe. So we're going to hear it after all. We're not. We're not delaying it. I thought. That oh, we I don't know if he was part of the commission report or, or not. I have no idea. Scott Dietrich was the only commissioner who had signed up to give a report. Um, if you'd like me to unmute Lance Simmons and see if he also had a commissioner report, I certainly can. That's up to the mayor. Sure. What do you got, Lance? Hi, everybody. Uh, I've got an hour long presentation. Uh, let me uh, put it up on the screen. Here. Wait a minute. Let me uh, get my pillow. <laughs> Listen, uh, as uh, chair of the uh, Public Works Commission, uh, we've had numerous discussions, all of us. Every one of the commissioners has been out to Westward Beach and has taken a look. And uh, I just wanted to weigh in that I think I fully support the idea of um, giving us an opportunity to come back with maybe a couple options, hopefully in coordination with the uh, Public Safety Commission. So, um, so I think, and it looks like that's the way that we're going. So, 
um, that's all I wanted to uh, weigh in on. Try to have it done by the meeting on the 13th. Steve McClary and then Bruce. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was hoping uh, if I could just uh, give my city manager report. I know it's late, but um, we'd love to hear it. I think there's a few things. If I don't get it out tonight, I don't think it will, will quite have the impact if I were to wait a couple of weeks. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. I just want to provide a report on the what, what the city had done in terms of the response to the uh, public safety power shut off. Um, I know the council is aware of this. I don't remember the public are, but, you know, we city started sending out alerts and we put out message message boards, um, you know, as we had the run up into the event uh, that that started, you know, the week prior to the holiday. Uh, and then during the event, um, uh, we had um, public works crews that were out. Public works crews were uh, on standby for Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, at 2 a.m. on Thursday morning, the Public Works Department dis dispatched their maintenance crews to assist with cleaning debris uh, on the streets and the right-of-ways, and they were also um, used to connect the emergency generators to the traffic signals that had lost power. Uh, the traffic signals on PCH did operate under the backup battery power. Uh, one of them lasted for a long time, uh, but once, once that battery power was exhausted, uh, the city crews moved in and they hooked up the temporary generators. Uh, so we had we had 10 generators that were up and the pub, public works crews uh, kept those operating. Uh, so they, they basically went for the next 42 hours to clean up debris, remove rocks and and refill with the emergency generators. Um, we did have a lot of wind debris and large trees blocking streets, partial lane closures due to branches, rocks and other debris. Uh, several of our signs and traffic signal lights were damaged. Uh, no power poles were damaged. Um, some communication uh, utility lines were found to be damaged. We did not receive any reports of any power lines that had come down, but, but utility lines that had been damaged and down. Um, we also had our scoreboard at uh, Bluffs Park almost blown over and damaged by the wind, so it was very extreme. Um, so we're working on cleaning up everything from that. Um, but I want to let you know that um, you know, throughout the event, um, Myself, our public safety manager, uh, we were in constant uh, communication uh, with police, fire, uh, SCE, and other agencies. Uh, that went throughout uh, Thursday and uh, into Friday morning and, until the event concluded. Um, and we continued to send information out to the public until the event was over. I realized not everybody received that because of the cell towers that were down. Uh, I just want to take a moment just to, to thank the staff who, um, you know, uh, gave up their holiday and uh, did their jobs as they were supposed to. Uh, so staff did not, the city did not go on holiday during the break and uh, and we were here uh, doing what we could to ensure that the city was being well taken care of. Um, I do wanna note that um, uh, we are working on an after action plan, uh, following up some, some things that uh, both the city could do better and also identifying some areas uh, where we'd like to see improvement by, uh, you know, some of our agency partners. Uh, one of the areas that did that was brought up tonight was the concern about the loss of the cell towers and the need for backup power on that. We completely agree, and that is on our list of things to to address uh, and to reach out to the cell providers to try to work with them to get that figured out. Some sites do have backup battery power, but of course that is is limited and usually does not uh, is not sufficient to last through an extended event. Um, I'm probably forgetting a few other things here, um, but um, oh, I, I just want, oh, I also wanted to uh, thank all the members of the public um, who did reach out, uh, emailed me throughout the event. And, um, and so I, I did appreciate that communication uh, with, with the residents um, and that was very helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm probably forgetting to thank somebody or acknowledge something or to report on something else that we did. Uh, but I just wanted to, to uh, for the council and community to be aware of the actions that we had taken. Um, moving on from that, and I'm happy to take any questions, but just a couple other things to quickly re report on. Um, on the 13th of December, I have asked for our building official, Yolanda Bundy, to make a presentation regarding uh, the rebuilding effort of uh, from the Woolsey Fire. Uh, she's going to give a, a breakdown on... Um, you know, where everything stands right now. And I think that will be a, a, a very uh, illuminating uh, presentation for the public and for council to, to understand exactly where we are in the process uh, and, and uh, where, you know, where a number of those homes are and 
uh, and you know perhaps where we could could adjust going forward. But I uh, so that'll be coming on the 13th of December. Uh, last, I just wanted to note that um, we're trying to address some of the current uh, bottlenecks that we have right now uh, in in planning and building the safety. And the staff is working there really hard. So we are working on bringing in on contract staff both for inspectors because uh, we know that that is a concern right now. Uh, we've also brought on some additional contract staff to help with uh, uh, with the with the planning and the building and safety counter, uh, and we're working on getting some additional help uh, for the planning and building department. Um, we're we're doing that with with contract labor. Of course, that allows us to adjust uh, as the workflow um, you know goes up and down. But right now, this is necessary uh, in order to meet the current workload. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I see um, Bruce's hand is lit, raised. There's a comment and a quick question. Quick comment and a quick question. Um, the comment is, um, it sounded from some of the comments that were made before Steve that some people think that we've kind of made a decision to send that project back. All we did was decide to not make a decision of any sort until our next meeting. I just want to make that clear. Um, the question I have is, do we need to have a motion and a vote on passing on our comments, or do we just go to adjournment? I don't understand what you're saying. The council, we, we put council comments till the end of the meeting. Oh. Do we need a vote technically to pass that, or can we just ignore it and adjourn? Excellent question. I, I have a, I guess, a question or a statement. I mean, I don't think we all need to opine on everything that's happened tonight. We've been doing that for the last, whatever it is now, six hours. Um, if you want a, a report on council member activity, uh, I would be in favor of having that, assuming that everybody's got about, you know, one minute's worth okay. of things to talk about that they haven't already said tonight, which is the case for me. All right. So, Bruce, would you like to give us your, your council member activity report? Sure. That would be really easy. My activity has been discussing with many people all the things we discussed tonight plus the thing we passed on. <laughs> okay. That's it. <laughs> Mikey? Um, you know what? My, I've done a... I've been busy every day. It's, it's a fairly long list. I'm just going to email if you want it. I do have a question though, Steve. Do you know or can you find out why during the power outage did, at least for a bunch of us, and maybe this isn't everyone else's experience, did T-Mobile work throughout most of the city with one or two bars? It came on at about one in the morning. It wasn't working at all. And woke, actually woke my family up because we were Sprint and T-Mobile took us over. And then it worked for the next three days and oh. was kind of, I have no idea why, where they got that power from and how that worked. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll add that to our, our list and um, of uh, follow-up. Thank you. It was notable to me. A bunch of people commented on it that it must have, were probably ex-Sprint people because it used to be the best one. So all right. We'll email yeah. you for some details. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, uh, I spent most of my time as people calling me up asking me to do public service announcements. So let me do two quick, very quick ones. The Adamson uh, House, um, the, the foundation is having a fundraising program going on through December. Um, and, and they need the money to do, to up, do the upkeep and do some repairs to that piece of property. Uh, so they're ha they're running uh, visits. They run from December 1st to the 31st, uh, Wednesday through Saturdays, except for Christmas Day. Uh, the first tour is 11 a.m. The last tour is at 2.30 in the afternoon, and each tour lasts about 30 minutes. Cost is 25 bucks for adults, or for 25 for adults, 10 for children, uh, and children under five are free. The refreshments are served with each visitor gets a small gift. Uh, so if you get a chance over the ho Christmas holidays to go to the Edison house, you, you'll enjoy it. Take that opportunity because it's one heck of a place. The other public service announcement on December 3rd, the library is having a sale on cookbooks. Apparently somebody dropped off like 700 cookbooks to the library. 
Uh, and they're, they've got a big sale going on on, on this third. So if you like to cook, this is a sale for you. If you know somebody that likes to cook, this is a sale for you. If you know somebody that, you know, you get want to buy some Christmas gifts, this is a sale for you. If you don't have any friends, you know, you don't have to need to buy any Christmas gifts, buy some books, hand them out to people. How, how bad can it be? Uh, so those are my public service announcements. Thank you. Thank you for the shopping ideas, Steve. Karen? Thanks, Paul. Uh, activity. I attended the COG meeting. I attended a library, county library commission meeting. I attended the SoCal Edison government advisory panel meeting. And I think it would have been a very different meeting had it happened after Thanksgiving as opposed to a week before. Uh, and we had, as I said, the school district separation stakeholders meeting for four hours on a Saturday. And if it hasn't been evident, uh, the school district separation ad hoc committee uh, of Mikey and myself and the whole team has been putting in many, many, many hours. And that's it. Along with fielding all the calls, all the emails and all the questions that everybody got about the power being off and everything related to that. I, uh, I was like Mikey, I was out on uh doing arson watch. I went out uh, again after the power went out and drove around in the hills and managed to scare myself nearly to death when a tree fell over on Ensenal and I almost hit it. And it's uh, it was not a good time to be out driving around. And I, I was on... Like Mikey, I was uh, awakened in the early hours. I actually got a, a call at 7 in the morning uh, when I hadn't been able to do anything on, on a T-Mobile phone uh, in the previous 10 hours. And uh, it was, you know, there wasn't much power, but if you stood in the right place, you could get out. So that was that was a good thing. It would be lovely if, if we all had some sort of permanent phone lines, maybe made of copper that are self-energizing that would work through an emergency like this, but I guess we scrapped all of those. So uh, I also talked to all my friends about why the hell they aren't getting any notices from the city during this. And, uh, and then I also had my own conversations with Southern California Edison about why after the power had been off in my neighborhood for over 24 hours, their maps still showed that it was subject to a PSPS, but it hadn't been disconnected. So it, it's been a, a frustrating uh, couple weeks. So I really appreciate you all. I appreciate your time. Steve, I see your hand is still raised. Did, uh, is there oh, some? Nope. Mistake. Okay. And I also uh, received an email today telling me that of about a young man who was hit on Civic Center Way by a car. And he's, he lived, but he is covered with road rash and bruises. And I will forward that email on to you all. I, I hadn't heard of the accident and it's a, uh, it's a pretty, unpleasant thing for somebody to end up getting hurt like that. I'm just glad he didn't die. Bruce? I can't hear you. Muted. Sorry, I just want to encourage you, Paul, to adjourn us so we don't need to do a vote. And with no further ado, I will adjourn you. Good, Good night. night guys. <laughs> the other team. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Can't even get out.